Serena decapitated the male witch before slicing a second in half after bringing her weapon back around. Blood splattered the snow. Come. I grabbed Alistair's arm and advanced toward the set of doors. More screaming sounded behind us as we burst through them and entered the castle. A damp muskiness lingered in the air as we traveled down a corridor, our steps echoing off the stone walls. I could feel the life force of those around us, some of them angelic, others demonic. We would undoubtedly cross paths with them before reaching Lucifer. As we turned a corner into a larger room, a dozen upper-level demons appeared. They stood in front of us, some human in appearance like Phoenix, with the exception of tails and horns. Others looked reptilian, some like a saber-toothed tiger, and the last two stood at least ten feet tall with grayish flesh and bald heads. Still a traitor, I see, one of the human-like ones told Phoenix. Is the Nephilim's dick really that good that you'd abandon your own kind? Phoenix smirked. You give me too much credit. It wouldn't have taken much for me to abandon all of you, good dick or not. Which is amazing, by the way. We don't have time for this, Galen growled and bolted toward them. He ripped one apart, then used a severed arm to hit another in the face. More demons flooded into the room. Galen tore through them like they were made of paper. Castor and Keo fought by his side, while Callius, Damon, and Warren took on the two giants. Titan used his metal arm to punch one so hard it crushed the demon's skull with a single blow. Once the room was smeared with blood and littered with body parts, the latter thanks to Wrath, we continued through the castle. It's like a video game, Gray said, jogging beside Mason. Gotta kill all the ads before we reach the final boss. This way. I motioned to a corridor to the left. Lucifer's life force grew stronger as we neared a set of closed doors. Orange flickering light seeped from under the entryway. He's waiting beyond that door. Two demons teleported in front of us before we reached it, one bald and a reptilian species, and the other leopard-like with spiky green hair. When the bald one blinked, his eyes reminded me of a crocodile. Who are y'all supposed to be? Castor asked. Tweedle D and Tweedle Fuck? Good that you have a sense of humor, Nephilim, the leopard demon said. It'll serve you well in hell once I send you there. The air stirred as something flew past me. A blur of wild blonde hair was all I saw before the two demons dropped to their knees, their throats slit from ear to ear. Gray stood in front of the door and wiped off his blade. That was hot, Mason muttered to himself. Smalls the assassin strikes again, Raiden grinned. Alistair stepped over the dead demons and pushed open the two doors. Light from the room bled out into the darkened corridor. He waited for me to step up behind him before walking across the threshold. His brothers and their mates weren't far behind us. Lucifer stood in front of a large window, his back to us. Snow continued to fall outside, and frost snaked along the outer edges of the glass. The soft, pale light contrasted with the golden flickers coming from the fireplace. Ornate woodwork decorated the room, and the tapestries on the walls were somewhat tattered but mostly intact. Books lined dusty shelves along one wall, and there was a writing desk and chairs with worn cushions. Fitting he would hole up in a place that had once been a private drawing room for the lord of the castle. Quite bold of you to come here. Lucifer turned from the window, black hair falling over one shoulder. Lightbringer was sheathed at his side. Still, I expected as much. With me on the surface, I knew you'd track my location. You're associating with witches now, Alistair asked. Why? Even insects can serve a purpose. Lucifer eased forward, casual, confident. The forest holds great power, an endless source of intense arcane energy. The witches specialize in the magic I seek, and require the river of magic flowing within the nexus. Magic for what? I asked. Lucifer's head tilted a bit as his gaze fell on me. Something's different about you, Lazarus. He then glanced at Alistair and a slow smile spread across his face. Faded mates. 
Now, that is interesting. And highly unexpected. Though if anyone were to manage to tempt Lazarus, I suppose only Pride himself could do it. Enough talking. Alistair tightened the grip on his sword. Your reason for being here doesn't matter. You'll be dead before dawn. Is that so? Lucifer's calculating blue eyes flickered amongst the brothers and their mates. You truly think you can kill me, Alistair? No. Alistair shook his head. I alone can't kill you. I accept that limitation. But with my brothers by my side, you'll draw your final breath tonight. He was keeping pride in check. But before I could be grateful for his restraint, my skin tingled. My head snapped toward the doorway as five fallen angels entered the room. Belphegor was in front, followed by the rest. Enepsigos, a female fallen angel. Floros, who had feline-like features. Halpus and Amun were the last to enter. Dad, Gray said with a tremble in his voice. Belphegor didn't look at him, but I saw the slight tensing of his shoulders. He walked over to Lucifer. You'd stand against your own son for me, Lucifer asked, running his lips along Belphegor's earlobe. I'll stand against anyone who calls you an enemy. Gray made a strangled little sound. Despite all the wrong Belphegor had done, a part of Gray still held on to hope he would change. Much like Belphegor hoped his son would eventually join his side, both were wrong. A fact made all too clear as we stood with a clear line drawn between us. Floros flashed to Alistair's side, and a swell of panic bubbled in my chest as I caught sight of the celestial dagger placed at his throat. This is the son of Azazel. Pathetic. I could snuff him out with one slice. I summoned my whip, and he dug the blade a bit into Alistair's skin. Lower your weapon, Lazarus, or I'll cut his pretty little neck. I obeyed. My heart lay at the tip of his dagger. Lucifer's gaze hardened as he watched them. Was he nervous too? Or was he merely curious about what would happen next? Alistair meant something to him. Even if that something only came from what Alistair could do for him, his power and influence. The cursed sons tensed. A guttural growl came from Galen, whose eyes were completely black now, like a male possessed. Trust me, lass, Alistair said telepathically. I'm not dying here. I then noted his body language. His muscles relaxed, and a peaceful yet unsettling gleam shone in his eyes. Eyes that now had sparks of purple swirling in the blue depths. He was going to use pride's power, a power he despised and once swore to never use again. Alistair made eye contact with the fallen angel. You're so strong that nothing can harm you. The richness of his voice was soothing, hypnotic. Not even that dagger in your hand. If you thrust it into your chest, it won't even break the skin. Floros blinked as purple sparked in his eyes, and then he gave a slight shake of his head. His gaze fell to his dagger. Nothing can harm me, he said under his breath, before withdrawing the blade from Alistair's neck. He then placed that blade to his chest. What the fuck are you doing, Floros? Amon asked. Show us how invincible you are, Alistair said. Floros shoved the dagger into his own heart and twisted it. He dropped to his knees as he pulled the blade free, gasping as blood pooled from the gaping wound. A loud crack pierced the air as his soul exited his body. Amun staggered backward, eyes wide. The other fallen angels gaped. None of them approached. Seeing Pride's power firsthand stopped any attempts to attack. Lucifer smirked. You've grown stronger. Not that it will do you any good. Alistair wiped the trickle of blood from his neck. I'll never join you. Such a waste. Lucifer tapped a finger against Lightbringer's hilt. I could help nurture that gift, and give you more power than you knew what to do with. But alas, I see that's where you differ from your father. 
He was obsessed with proving himself and besting those around him, while you're content living a monotonous life where you never reach your full potential. Better than being a cold-hearted bastard hell-bent on destroying the world. Alistair tipped his chin up in that defiant way that often drove me mad. Destroying the world? Lucifer shook his head. No. I wish to purify it. Cut the bullshit, Alistair snapped. Purification is what you tell these idiots so they'll help you. He nodded to the fallen angels, who on impulse took a step back once his gaze landed on him. You're jealous of humankind. You're nothing but a child lashing out because your daddy gave attention to someone else. How dare you speak to me like this? All traces of humor washed from Lucifer's face. I raised you like my own son. I loved you like one too. Alistair recoiled, losing some of his fire. Those were words he had long wished to hear, that Lucifer loved him. He regained his composure, but the pain still lingered in his eyes. You love no one but yourself. You always have. Hold your tongue, boy, Belphegor said, summoning his blazing sword. Flames danced along the shining steel. Lucifer held out a hand to him. No, Belph, let him speak. My father was your pawn, Alistair said. So was Beelzebub and the other generals. Pieces for you to move across the board at your leisure, doing whatever you wanted. You know so much, yet also so very little. I cherished Azazel and mourned his death. A death you gave him. I grieved for Beel, Asmodeus, and came. All of my beautiful princes. I wanted a life with all all of them by my side. Lucifer's eyes narrowed into thin slits as they moved to me. You, Michael, Uriel, and every bastard on the council took that life from me. You turned these boys against me and forced them to do your bidding. And don't think I've forgotten how you slaughtered my own flesh and blood. A pang of guilt slammed into me. Before we'd caged Lucifer, the council ordered me and my unit to track down all of Lucifer's children and kill them. Tainted blood, Uriel had said, and the majority ruled in favor. They feared the children would grow up and be just as wicked as their father. I had carried out the order, ignoring the voice in my head that screamed for me to stop, that yelled they were innocent. Their blood was on my hands. Nothing I did would ever right that wrong. Perhaps that was one reason why I'd wanted Michael to spare Aza. It wouldn't absolve me of my shame, but it was a start. Lucifer focused on Alistair. You want greatness, do you not? You wish to prove yourself to the world, to me? Maybe once. But now... Alistair moved closer to me, and his proximity took away some of the coldness that had seeped into my bones of the bitter memories. I just want a simple life with my mate. I want to spend my days with my family, tackling my massive to be read pile of books and relaxing with tea, never having to fight in another war. Being happy. That's what I want. With my mate, my heart knocked around in my chest. He wanted a future with me. As we braced ourselves for a fight we might not walk away from, I knew I wanted one with him, too. Whether I deserved it was another story. A simple life will never make you happy. Deep down you know this. Pride will always want more. Lucifer breathed out a sigh. Shall we get to it, then? The human realm is nearly in my grasp, and there's much to be done. I'll even be nice and let you make the first move. A choice you'll soon regret, Alistair said. And then, all eight of the cursed sons lunge forward, swords at the ready and the fires of battle blazing in their eyes. Chapter 15 Alistair 
My sword skated across Lucifer's bare chest as though the blade were made of rubber, leaving no mark whatsoever. That didn't stop me. I struck him again, then again, and dodged as he swung Lightbringer at my head. The blade whirred above me, cutting so close to my hair that several strands were grazed. Pride growled at that. Appearance meant a lot to him. Hair grows back, I told him, before dashing to the side to avoid another blow. Not losing our head is what you should be worried about. Another grumble that transitioned to a hard sigh. Only Pride would concern himself with such superficial matters while in the midst of a fight. Galen barreled into Lucifer, his beefy arms going around Lucifer's waist before he body-slammed him. Well, almost body-slammed him. Lucifer teleported right before they hit the ground. You feral beast, he spat at my brother. Lightbringer gleamed as he lifted it into the air, the backdrop of the frosted window pane and falling snow bringing out the lighter swirls of silver and the celestial steel. Callius slammed into Lucifer and knocked him off balance, giving Galen time to move. He then jabbed his Xiphos into Lucifer's gut. The blade, like mine, didn't break the skin. You should have stayed dead. Lucifer backhanded Callius, putting magic behind the hit so it sent him flying across the room. That drew my attention to Lazarus. He fought Belphegor and another fallen angel. My soul ached, twisted. Lazarus was fighting well, but he was outnumbered. Don't worry about me, Lazarus said using our connection. Focus on Lucifer. Who said I was worried about you? Even with the distance between us, I saw a trace of a smile on his mouth. Fire ran along the blade of Belphegor's sword as he sent it hurling toward Lazarus' side. Fear churned inside me. A dark blur buzzed around the room before Phoenix materialized right in front of Lazarus and blocked him from being hit. His sword clashed with Belphegor's. Get out of my way, demon, Belphegor growled. Make me. Phoenix smirked before teleporting behind him and sweeping out a leg to trip him. Bellamy peered over at his mate, checking on him. Lucifer then regained both of our attentions as he sent out a blast of energy, sending me and my brothers flying toward the window. Galen burst through the window first, and shards of glass protruded from his skin as he landed in the snow. With a roar, he leapt to his feet, the glass falling around him as the wound sealed. He dove toward Lucifer, missing him by a fraction of a second. Sounds of battle echoed from the woods to the right of us, where Michael and our allies fought zombies, Nephilim, and demons. Cold air licked my skin now that we were outside. Snow fell lighter now, the flakes slowly drifting toward the ground. Focus, I told my brothers after opening a link into their minds. Together, we can do this. We can win. Our blades aren't doing shit to him. Blood streaked from Castor's hair, though the wound had already closed. Keo rushed to his side and cut through a shade who had heard the commotion of the breaking glass and attacked. Shrieks filled the night as more low-level demons changed course to pursue us instead. We have to trigger the synchronization, I said. And how do you suppose we do that, Sherlock? Castor swiped with his golden dagger, causing the shade in front of him to explode. Now's not the time to be a smart ass. Come on, Alistair, Lucifer said as we surrounded him. This isn't interesting at all. You wish for me to fear the power of the eight cursed Nephilim, yet I'm moments from falling asleep. His gaze followed Galen, or rather, Wrath, as we circled him. My brother was still inside there somewhere, but his sin had taken over. Unlike in the past, when the very thought of Wrath consuming him scared the piss out of us, Wrath, although blood-crazed, was tame enough not to hurt his family. Damon lunged at Lucifer and was knocked aside by the edge of Lightbringer. My heart skipped a beat as he landed hard on the cold ground. Caught ya! Warren jumped through the broken window and gathered Damon in his arms. In his hybrid form, pale blue horns curved up from his silver hair. Roaring, he sent a blast of ice toward Lucifer as he cradled my brother. I'm okay, Damon said, voice veering on a gasp. Just knocked the breath out of me. The ice had stunned Lucifer, if only for a moment. It froze the ends of his long black hair and created a frosted design on his pale flesh before melting away. 
An ice dragon, he said, mouth hitching upward. The winter solstice increases your power. It was true. Warren was a strong warrior to begin with, but this time of year strengthened the mana flowing through his veins, amplifying his ice powers. Hit him again, Warren! Gray dashed forward and sliced at Lucifer's abdomen before rolling out of the way. Lightbringer hit the snow where Gray had just been standing, sending out a cloud of powder into the air. As ice flew from Warren's fingertips, blasting Lucifer, Damon forced himself back to his feet. He held his side before readying his sword and standing beside his mate. Relief trickled through me. There was no blood on his hand when he pulled it from his side. The blow would have been much worse if not for the coat he wore. King Nikolai's wife, Queen Kira, had a knack for fashion and had designed Damon a coat with magic thread that allowed him to spread his wings while wearing it, to fly without ripping apart his shirt. Apparently, it also acted as armor. Where Damon had been sliced, the threads were a bit frayed, but the blade hadn't actually pierced his skin. Thank the gods for that. Shade snarled as they ran toward us on all fours, scattering the top layer of snow. Mason fired his gun, causing orange explosions as he hit each of them square in the chest. Titan severed one of their heads with a single swing of his metal arm. Phoenix teleported around the snowy field and slit throats with the blue jeweled dagger Bellamy had given him. The stones in the hilt matched the ones in his collar. Are you all right? I asked Lazarus. Commotion came from the drawing room, the bangs and swords clashing, trickling through the broken window and into the night. What did I tell you? came his response. Focus on Lucifer. Just making sure you are still alive. You can't get rid of me that easily, Pride. Hearing his voice ignited a fire inside me, gave me strength. I lunged at Lucifer, sliced at his bicep, and jumped out of his reach before Gray attacked him, then Raiden. A simple life with Lazarus. During a time when so much was unknown, when the world was in absolute chaos, that was one thing I knew without a doubt in my mind. I didn't need more time to figure it out. I wanted Lazarus. I wanted to see how deep our bond could go. Wanted to reach inside his very soul and see all the things he'd never shown to anyone. I wanted to love him and be loved in return. That desire propelled me forward. Callius attacked after me, then Castor. Galen and Raiden crashed into Lucifer, one on each side, before Damon leapt into the air, his movements in equal parts graceful and lethal as he brought his blade down on Lucifer's neck. Demons materialized around us, a mixture of shades and upper-level ones who'd come to their king's aid. Keo, Mason, Titan, and Phoenix cut them down, while Warren blasted them with walls of ice, freezing them where they stood. Clear your mind, Pride whispered, and allow pure instinct to guide you. Trust me. A weightlessness then came over my body, spreading from the tips of my fingers inward, traveling through my bloodstream. I was aware of my actions, aware of every forward lunge, slash of my sword, and pivot. But it was as though someone else had control over my body, like I was on the outside looking in, on autopilot. Each of my brothers followed suit. A dazed look appeared in their eyes. Their movements were sharp, harmonious. One of us attacked before another dove in. Because of our blood bond, I had always been able to sense them, but this went beyond that. I was attuned to their every breath, every twitching of their muscles. They moved and I moved. Repeat, we didn't speak, telepathically or otherwise. We didn't need to. We had tapped into that synchronization from before, only now we had Callius with us to complete the chain. The world around me faded away. I had tunnel vision, seeing only my target. Enough of this! Black wings tinged with red sprang from Lucifer's back. As he lifted from the ground, Galen grabbed his left wing and slammed him back to the snow. I didn't stop to consider why Lucifer hadn't been able to teleport. I moved on reflex, as did my brothers, as we continued the synchronized attack. Fallen angels dropped from the sky. The mates took care of them, causing cracks of thunder as each one died. Mason used his celestial bullets, hitting them in the heart. As a sharpshooter, he rarely missed. And then, it happened. 
Damon's blade grazed Lucifer's chest, and a thin red line appeared along his collarbone. Callius thrust his sword into Lucifer's side, and it pierced him. Lucifer gasped, both pain and shock morphing his expression. Gray jumped up and sent his sword crashing down, the sharp edge cutting into the fleshy tissue of Lucifer's shoulder. Whereas our weapons once had no effect, they now cut through him like butter. Don't lose focus, a familiar voice yelled from nearby. A deep, pleasing voice that replaced my blood with rich honey. My mate. Callius pierced Lucifer's side at the same time Castor struck him in the stomach. Gray thrust his short sword into his spine. Raiden's blade dug into Lucifer's ribcage. Damon and Bellamy stabbed him in his lower abdomen. Galen swung his sword and lodged it into Lucifer's upper back. Do you regret it now? I asked, stepping in front of him. My voice was deeper than usual, like it had come from someone else. Blood trickled from the corner of Lucifer's lips as he stared at me, surprised, perhaps even a bit frightened. I then jabbed my sword into the base of his throat, the steel going all the way through to the other side. The blade glistened red as I retracted it. Lucifer gurgled, choking on blood and spit. He lifted a shaking hand to the hole in his neck, red pooling between his fingers. The hold on me lifted, and everything came back into focus. I blinked, processing what I was seeing through my eyes instead of pride's. Seven blades jutted from Lucifer's body. Mine rested in my hand. We had him pinned in place from all sides. Our combined powers had managed to weaken his skin, allowing our weapons to penetrate. Something within our cursed blood offset the magic in his that made him invincible. We had done it. We won, Pride said. No! Belphegor roared, knocking Galen aside with his wings before grabbing Lucifer. The rest of us stepped backward, all in various stages of disbelief. Gray sagged to the ground as a sleepy spell hit him. Mason knelt beside him, keeping his eyes on Lucifer. We all did. The male I had once looked up to, one I'd once loved, seemed so much smaller now than before. No longer an unreachable godlike being of cosmic power. He could bleed like any other. Blood streamed down his body, turning the snow beneath his feet crimson. His blue eyes fluttered closed before opening again. He was so weak. Each breath brought him closer to death's embrace. A hand settled on my lower back, the touch warm. The smell of crisp apples mingled with the winter air, soothing me. Why did I need to be soothed? Wetness trickled down my cheeks, turning cold in the frigid air. It's over now, Lazarus murmured in my ear. He smoothed his thumb along my cheek, wiping away a tear, replacing the chill with the warmth of his touch. You did so good. I whimpered and turned my face into his neck. The plan had worked. With Lucifer's defeat, his forces would withdraw. Once the leader fell, a majority of the soldiers would lay down their swords in surrender. The war was over. Only... It wasn't. A croaky laugh reached my ears. That hurt worse than I expected. Shivers shot down my spine, and I drew back from Lazarus. He had gone still against me. His breaths had all but stopped, much like mine as I looked at Lucifer. There's a first time for everything, Lucifer rasped, slumped against Belphegor. One by one, the swords shot from his body, landing in the snow around him. More blood poured from the gaping wounds. Never had I felt the cold sting of a blade until tonight. The experience is very enlightening. Michael landed beside me, visibly shaken as he looked at Lucifer. Cuts and shallow stab wounds covered his torso, but they faded as he healed. You should be dead. Ah, Michael, Lucifer slowly exhaled, and as he did, the eight puncture wounds stopped bleeding. Although slowly, he was healing. You're going to hurt my feelings. 
My knees nearly gave out. But we weakened you. We broke through your skin and stabbed you with celestial steel. You shouldn't be able to survive that. It will take more than celestial steel and the aid of you bouncing around me like pests to kill me, Alistair. Perhaps now you'll rethink which side you wish to fight on. Something for you to maul over until we meet again. Lucifer straightened to his full height and fanned out his wings, the sight remarkable and terrifying all at once. Let us consider tonight a draw. I'm much too tired to continue. He then wrapped his wings around Belphegor and teleported from the snowy field. At first, there was only silence, save for the fighting still echoing from the woods. But soon, that stopped too, as the corpses returned to their graves and the enemy Nephilim withdrew. I was sure Pura and Vepa left, if they were still alive. What the hell just happened? Castor squatted down and locked his fingers behind his neck, chin dropping to his chest. He took deep breaths, but still couldn't fill his lungs with enough air. I sensed his growing panic. I felt the same panic rising inside me, too. We failed. Galen clenched his fist. That's what happened. I don't understand, Bellamy said, staring at the blood-stained snow. The synchronization worked. We broke the shield that made him impenetrable and stabbed him like a goddamn pincushion. How the fuck did he survive that? No one had an answer. The eight of us had joined together. We had been successful. A brief taste of victory before the rug had been pulled out from beneath us. From beneath me. I had been so confident it would work. Now, I felt lost. Devastated. How would we win the war? How would we stop Lucifer? How would I stop him from killing everyone I held dear? The world tilted. Lazarus caught me against his chest as a horrible, strangled noise clawed up my throat. My brothers had relied on me, and I'd failed them. I'd failed everyone. The weight of that failure crashed down on me, suffocating me. More rough sounds left my throat. It was all too much, too overwhelming. Shh. Lazarus pressed a kiss to my temple and cupped the back of my head holding me close. We'll find another way. This isn't the end. So why did it feel like it was? I stood on the deck at daybreak, watching as the first light of morning burst across the top of the Mediterranean Sea. After we'd returned to the island the night before, Lazarus and I had come to his bungalow, crawled into bed, and held each other in silence. He had kissed my hair while I'd clung to him, too brittle to say a word. I hadn't been able to sleep. Every time I'd closed my eyes, I had seen Lucifer's injuries heal, despite the seemingly fatal blows. I'd felt that sinking in the pit of my stomach and the acidic taste of my failure. The door behind me slid open. Lazarus's proximity was felt in my very core. Flutters moved through my chest, and warmth pooled in my belly. I made you tea. I hope it tastes all right. Thank you. I accepted the cup from him and held it between my palms. The familiar aroma was a comfort. Earl Grey? Lazarus rested both his hands on the railing. It's your favorite. But you never make tea. I didn't do a lot of things before opening my heart to you. He turned his face toward the sun, his white hair ruffling in the wind coming off the sea. Cheeks heating, I focused on the tea. It was a few shades lighter than how I normally drank it. He'd added a bit more cream. I took a sip and sighed as the rich flavor trickled down my throat. Sweeter and creamier, but delicious. Did you mean it? Lazarus asked, staring more intently at the sky when you told Lucifer about wanting a simple life. Yes. I glided my thumb along the rim of my cup. A warrior's life is all I've ever known. Even after Lucifer was caged, we became protectors of the human realm, fighting demons, monsters, and any other threats. 
patrolling every night. Fighting is necessary, and I'm damn good at it, but I crave peace. And love? His gold-flecked blue eyes shifted to me, stealing my breath. Yes. I angled my body closer to his. It was automatic. But not just any love. The heat in my face spread to the tips of my ears. I want to love you. Do you think you can? He whispered, the tendons in the top of his hand more pronounced as he gripped the railing. I've done many things I'm not proud of. We all have. I reached over and traced the tendon of his middle finger. It relaxed beneath my touch. You can be cold and detached, but that's not the real you. Oh? He smiled a little. You know the real me, do you? I'm beginning to. His smile softened, and something achingly tender reflected in his eyes. I'm beginning to know you too. We were suspended in a moment, an achy and raw moment, where the true extent of our feelings brimmed to the surface. I spoke of wanting to love him, but I realized right then a part of me already did. Whether I'd ever be able to love him more than myself, I wasn't yet sure. I'll need to visit Uriel soon. Lazarus returned his gaze to the water. To tell him about my failure. I drank more tea, then set my cup behind me on the patio table. I wouldn't call it a failure, he said. In all the years I've known Lucifer, nothing has ever managed to pierce his skin. Yet, you and your brothers gravely wounded him. Not that it matters. He healed himself. That acidic taste returned to my tongue. We're no closer to defeating him than before the battle. I'd say we're actually farther away. My plan worked to a degree, but it wasn't enough. A pause. We weren't enough. I have nothing else, Lazarus. My brothers and I fought with everything we had and still failed. How are we supposed to defeat someone who can't be killed? For so long, I believed Michael was invincible. I looked at him. He continued. Shortly after Lucifer and the others defected, there was a battle. I saw your father drive a celestial blade through Michael's chest. I feared the sound of his soul leaving his body, but it never came. He bled for only a second before the wound sealed. Michael's immune to celestial steel? I asked, shocked. Lazarus nodded and, still with his gaze forward, grabbed my hand and entwined our fingers. Lucifer was the first archangel ever created, followed by Michael. They lived together, just the two of them, for weeks, perhaps months, I don't know for sure, before the rest of us came into being. Uriel and the other archangels are more powerful than I am, yet we all share the same weakness. We all have one thing that can kill us. Yet, neither Lucifer nor Michael can be killed with celestial steel. But Michael has scars, I said, given to him by Lightbringer. Realization sunk in. Lightbringer is the one thing that can kill him. Yes. So does that mean Michael's sword of fire can kill Lucifer? Lazarus shook his head. I wish it were as easy as that, but no. Lightbringer was forged in the light of the first morning. The sword, much like its wielder, is omnipotent. Michael's sword is fueled by solar and celestial energy, but it's not as powerful as Lightbringer, which is why one can overpower the other, but not vice versa. I pondered that. Lucifer is the sun, and Michael is the fire from that sun. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. More thinking. The seer that showed Lucifer's visions of his victory in conquering the human realm also showed him one where he lost, right? Yes. From when we caged him? No, Lazarus answered. The vision he saw was of his death. 
death by all hands, which is proof he's not fully indestructible. I rolled the info around in my brain. Wait, how do you know what happened with the seer? That was after Lucifer defected. You weren't there, were you? No, I wasn't there. Lazarus gently squeezed my fingers before withdrawing his hand. But I spoke with someone who was. Who? Mephistopheles. His pensive expression formed a line between his eyes. He came to the council once Lucifer betrayed him and asked for their forgiveness. That's when Michael ripped off his wings. Lazarus nodded. In exchange for his life, Mephis informed the council about Lucifer's plan and revealed the visions. What he knew of them, anyway. It's also how he learned about you and the other boys. The council then gave the order for the army to attack. That's when Callius' father was killed, I said, as everything started to make more sense. The start of the war. The intention was to stop any of you from ever being born. But it was too late. The plan had already been set in motion. Yes, Lazarus answered. I was then ordered to wait until the eight of you were old enough to be trained and to hide you away. Use Lucifer's plan against him. Do you believe Mephistopheles told the council everything? It matters very little now if he didn't. Something was right there, just begging to be discovered, but I couldn't see it. Not yet. A night of no sleep probably wasn't helping my muddled thoughts. Come. Lazarus skimmed his lips along my earlobe. You need to rest. I don't need rest. I need answers. You can hardly keep your eyes open, he said, his voice low and gruff. Let me put you to bed. I'm not a child. Though my whiny-ass tone conveyed the opposite. Besides, the day's just beginning. I can't sleep. We need to meet with the others, and... There will be no training today. No meetings. Lazarus grabbed my jaw and angled my head the way he wanted it, meeting me for a short kiss. Everyone is recovering from the battle. Your brothers are spending the day with their mates. The war can wait until tomorrow. But... Alistair. My name on his lips kick-started my heart. He glided his nose along my cheek. Come to bed with me. With a slight turn of my head, I captured his lips. An acceptance. A sexy growl rumbled in his chest as his arms came around my waist. He guided me into the bungalow and toward the back room, our mouths melding together. After laying me on the bed, he shed my clothes, tossing my oversized t-shirt and cotton night pants to the floor before tugging down my boxer briefs. I need to be naked to sleep. I asked telepathically as he nipped at the skin below my jaw. I was teasing him. I stopped being tired the moment he said my name in that deep, authoritative tone. I shivered at both the memory and the light graze of his teeth down my neck. I thought it best to tire you more first, he responded, smoothing his palms along my bare sides. He kissed down my chest and swirled his tongue over my nipple. I groaned. Unless you'd rather go straight to sleep. I can stop. Don't you dare, I answered him aloud, then groaned again as his hand found my cock. His raspy chuckle caused vibrations against my nipple as he continued working it with his mouth. The simulation was both too much and not enough. I wiggled beneath him, then pumped my hips up, seeking more warmth and friction from his palm. He denied me, pulling his hand away. Are you pouting? He smirked up at me, his cheeks flushed and his lids heavy. The image of pure seduction. No. I wiggled my hips again. But if you don't touch me, I'm going to shove you down and take over. Not this time. Pardon? Lazarus lightly clamped his teeth around my nipple, and I released a mix between a grunt and a yelp. I gave you control for my first time. I even let you have control the morning after when you rode me into the sheets a second time. He flicked his tongue against the hard bud and retook hold of my aching cock. But now, I'm going to dominate every sweet 
delicious inch of you until you shatter in my arms. Laz, I moaned, arching up into his palm and mouth, craving more. I wanted to be dominated by him, wanted him to unravel me piece by piece and sew me back together with his hard kisses and possessive touches. It was something I'd never had with any of my past lovers. Topping or bottoming, it didn't matter. I had been in charge. My partners had followed my lead. Pride wouldn't allow for anything else. Now, my sin purred in my chest, accepting Lazarus's touch, surrendering to him. Such a good boy, Lazarus murmured against my skin, his smoldering gaze flickering to mine, responding to me like this. I whimpered. Each time he called me a good boy, I melted. Only with him, though. Any doubts about me having a praise kink were put to rest. I inhaled that praise like it was oxygen. He worshipped my body, licking and stroking, caressing every contour of muscle with his long, deft fingers, asking nothing in return. You're so beautiful, he said, before kissing my inner thigh. The compliment swelled in my chest. I brushed aside strands of his white bangs. You are too. Beautiful and mine. I've always been yours. Lazarus caught my hand and pressed it to his cheek. And I always will be. Emotion constricted in my throat. I'm yours too. The tender ache in his eyes said so many things. Regret and grief over lost time. Uncertainty about our future. But when he aligned our bodies and took my face in his palm... He kissed away the bruising heartache. He fused himself to me with every gentle kiss, with every caress. More, I said on a moan. More touching, more of the feelings he was awakening inside me. Lazarus used lubricant to prepare me, pressing one slick finger inside before adding a second, murmuring praises against my heated skin as I writhed beneath him. Giving him control was euphoric turning off my brain and just feeling. In that bed, Lazarus gave me the freedom to exist without having to be in charge, without having to make decisions or feel the weight of responsibility. He allowed me to let go. When he joined our bodies, slowly easing forward, his nose lightly bumped mine. I tilted my face up to kiss him, and he pushed his tongue past my lips as he seated himself inside me. Butterflies swarmed my stomach at the weight of him on top of me. His winter apple scent wrapped around me as he pumped his hips once, pulled back, then did it again but deeper. So perfect. He brushed his tongue along the seam of my mouth and started a slow rhythm with his hips. I never want to stop. Then don't. I wrapped my arms around him and groaned as his hard cock nudged my prostate. Let's stay like this until the world ends, and long after. Lazarus cradled my head, his hand a barrier between me and the pillow. He pecked kisses along my jaw as he rocked into me. Something powerful surged in my chest then. The feeling shot from my heart vessels and sparked through my entire body. Our faded mate connection had been building since the moment the seal broke, but as we moved together, entwined in the silky sheets, that bond deepened, consumed me. Les. His name sounded like a plea as I trembled from the intensity of the heightened emotions and the overwhelming need for something more. Tell me what you need, he rasped in my ear in a low, husky voice. He nipped at my jawline. My teeth ached and the understanding of why left me a bit breathless. I wanted to mock Lazarus, wanted to possess him body and soul. More than that, I wanted to claim him so every being would know he was mine. It was a soul-deep desire that had me writhing in frustration, in need. I wanted to possess him and be possessed by him. But I couldn't get the words out. I couldn't tell him. As an angel, he didn't have a taste for blood like fallen angels and Nephilim did. I didn't have to drink his blood to mark him. A bite without breaking the skin would work, but drinking his blood on top of that would also place his mark on me, 
so everyone would know who I belonged to. Would he be disgusted with me for suggesting it? Alistair. He seized my chin and forced my eyes to his. Tell me. I won't ask you again. I... My voice shook. I want to mock you. His fingers slid through my hair before gripping it tight and inclining my head. He guided my mouth to his neck. Make me yours. Officially. His voice shook a little as well. Did he feel that same twisting sensation then? One that begged for him to strengthen our bond. It was a huge step. Once my brothers marked their mates, there had truly been no turning back. Biting an angel feels... Wrong, I said, nuzzling his neck. Like I'm tainting you. There's nothing wrong or sinful about this. About us. Lazarus exposed more of his throat. I'll wear your mark with pride. I groaned against his skin as he angled his hips and pushed them forward, then back, hitting my sweet spot. Pleasure was building. As I placed my teeth at the base of his throat and bit down, that pleasure skyrocketed. For both of us. Harder. His voice filled my head. Bite me harder. Any more and I'll draw blood. Good. Lazarus pressed closer, forcing my teeth deeper. As his blood landed on my tongue, electricity sizzled through me. He tasted crisp and sweet with a slight tautness, just like those apples he loved so much. That's it, he moaned, petting the back of my hair. The pace of his thrusts increased. Take all you want. Every piece of me belongs to you. Marking him wouldn't bind our life forces, but as his blood ran down my throat, our bond strengthened. His essence interwove with mine, deepening the intensity of our pleasure as our impending orgasms built. I had never felt so close to someone before. It was scary and exhilarating all at once. I pulled from his throat and licked the bite marks. His healing ability sealed the punctures, but the mark remained. My mark. A possessive growl escaped me, and I moved my hands up his back. The indentations of his scars beneath my fingertips brought out another emotion. Anger. I wanted to tear Uriel apart for hurting him. Shove those thoughts aside, Lazarus said, taking hold of my face. Desire darkened his blue eyes. You and I are all that exists right now. I trailed my hands higher and stopped at the slits in his shoulder blades. Slowly, I pressed my fingers inside both at the same time. Gods! His thrusts faltered as his hips jerked. That's amazing. I smiled up at him. Then you'll love this. A loud grunt left him as I moved my fingers in slow circles. I rubbed the soft inner lining of the wing slits before dipping lower and teasing the very tips of the feathers concealed within. Lazarus slammed a hand beside my head on the mattress and took me harder, faster. I came moments later, groaning hard as my body quaked beneath his. He buried his face against my neck as his abdomen went taut. And then he was coming too, moaning softly in my ear. The gentle crashing of waves outside the window mixed with the sound of our heavy breaths. What we'd shared went beyond sex. I had never felt so spent, but also so alive. He hadn't only made love to my body, but he'd caressed my very soul, knitting together the frayed pieces. Will you stay like this for a while? I asked, holding him tighter. Our sweaty torso stuck together, but I didn't care. I wanted to feel him, all of him. His weight on top of me felt too good. I'll stay for as long as you want me to. He kissed the curve of my jaw and smoothed his hand over my hair. His rough breaths tickled my skin. In a post-orgasm haze, I fought to keep my eyes open. But I wasn't ready to leave this moment. Don't fight it, he whispered. You should sleep. No. I nuzzled the top of his shoulder, breathing in the saltiness of his skin and his unique scent of snow and apples. 
So stubborn. Just like you. Another nuzzle. I couldn't help but think our time together had an expiration date. Not an unreasonable worry. We were at war with a seemingly invincible foe. We also had the council, who may or may not try to break us apart once they discovered the seal had broken. Michael would defend our right to be together, but he was only one archangel out of seven. What if today was all we had? Pride whined. The sound crept up my throat, a bit broken. Lazarus pressed his mouth to mine, and the gentleness of his kiss eased some of my growing anxiety. Exhaustion weighed in my muscles, and as much as I didn't want to, I needed to sleep. But my mind wouldn't rest. My thoughts spiraled with what-ifs and various possible outcomes of the war, most of which ended horribly. I feel your worries. He toyed with my bangs that lay messy and damp on my forehead before trailing his fingers to my temple. May I? It's not like you to ask for permission. I smiled as I said the words and peered up at him. His eyes were so warm. Please. Lazarus kissed me again and applied a light pressure to my temple with his fingertips. As he used his sleeping power on me, grogginess took hold and I started to drift off. Before sleep fully claimed me, he rested his cheek on mine and whispered three sweet words. I love you. But perhaps I only imagined it. Chapter 16 Lazarus Sunlight gleamed off the celestial palace as I walked down the white stone path. Once Alistair fell asleep, I held him for a while before pulling away, showering, and leaving the island. The council needed an update on the war. Nerves jumbled in my stomach. It would be the first time I'd spoken to them since the warding blocking mine and Alistair's bond broke. I took deep, calming breaths and ascended the steps, nodding to the two guards standing outside the entrance. Commander Lazarus! Samuel smiled at me before glancing over at the stone-faced Quinn and forcing the smile away. He was a joy-bringer angel, who joined our ranks once the war with Aza escalated. Old habits died hard. Uriel is in the palace garden, Commander, Quinn said, his voice just as hard as his expression. Salafiel and Raphael are with him. Thank you. I stepped forward as they opened the door. Natural light flooded the entrance hall, coming through the domed glass ceiling above the grand staircase. The members of the council were the only ones allowed to live in the palace. Michael had a room, but he rarely stayed the night. Sleeping beneath the same roof as Uriel, he had said once. A frightening thought. His snores can be heard all throughout the palace. Whether that was true, unlikely. But Michael was, well, Michael. Although the most powerful archangel in the heavens, there were rules that had to be followed. Uriel, more often than not, persuaded the other council members to vote in his favor. It angered my friend, so he preferred to live elsewhere. I didn't blame him. I wouldn't want to live with Uriel either. I passed servants on my way toward the gardens. They were lower-rank angels whose job was to serve the council and care for the estate. They were treated well, though. In our realm, no position was looked down upon. The palace gardens flourished with crystalline pools, arrays of colorful flowers, and soft green grass. Orchards of trees and rose vines rested on one side. Granite walkways curved throughout the courtyard, leading to seating areas with large decorative cushions on the lush lawn. Laughter spilled out from the gazebo in the center of the garden. The rose gold roof reflected the soft hues from the pastel sky. More nerves jumbled in my gut. I did my best to steady them as I advanced down the path toward the three archangels sitting outside for afternoon tea. I couldn't help but think of Alistair and how he'd enjoy such a thing. Now's not the time to think of him. Put him from your head. Easier said than done. That Nephilim was on my mind more often than I cared to admit, even prior to the breaking of the seal. Lazarus, 
Raphael said as he spotted me. He appeared the most youthful of all the archangels, with a slender build, smooth complexion, strawberry blonde hair, and magenta eyes. He had a pleasant temperament, often found with a warm smile and a musical laugh. Please, have a seat and join us. The pastries are quite lovely, buttery, flaky, and sweet. An ornate, four-tiered platter sat in the center of the table, holding an assortment of treats. Croissants, chocolate petite fours, different flavored macarons, lemon cookies, and a mix of butter and fruit tarts. Raiden would have drooled. A teapot and dishes of sugar and cream adorned the table as well. Your offer is most kind. I bowed my head to him. However, I come here for business, not pleasure. Then consider it a business meeting, with refreshments. Raphael motioned to the vacant seat beside him. Do try the tea. It's one of my specialty brews, with a hint of raspberry and a dash of honey. Uriel's gaze burned into me. His silence was unsettling. We won't bite, Zalafiel said with a smirk. His wavy golden hair brushed the tops of his shoulders, and his dark blue eyes sparkled like the night sky. As an archangel, his power was rooted in astrology. He helped people interpret their dreams, and he ruled over the movement of the planets. Speaking of biting, Uriel grabbed a pistachio macaron from the platter and examined it. As his green eyes shifted to me, he crumbled the cookie in his hand. That's an interesting mark on your neck. That abomination has claimed you. Raphael frowned at the destroyed macaron. He then grabbed one for himself, a strawberry one, and nibbled it. He didn't seem phased by Uriel's statement. Along with Michael, he had voted in favor of my fated bond with Alistair all those years ago. The warding on my soul faltered, I explained, keeping a steady tone even though I felt anything but. It was out of my control. Out of your control, you say? Uriel pushed back from the table and neared me. His seven-foot stature was accompanied by lean yet defined muscle and medium-length brown hair that fell into his eyes as he glared at me. Was betting him out of your control, too? You've disobeyed another order. Yes, I have. I squared my jaw. And I accept whatever punishment that may arise from such disobedience. However, we have more concerning matters to discuss right now. Who are you to make such a decision? Uriel grabbed me by the throat, digging his fingertips in deep. I should rip that mark from your neck. The smell of him is revolting, but not nearly as vile as your insubordination. Uriel. Zalafiel rose from his chair, the bottom of his blue and gold robes swishing as he approached. Lazarus is right. The war is what matters at this moment. I'll be the judge of what matters. Uriel squeezed my windpipe. I will not tolerate this behavior. Release him, a deep voice said from behind me. As Uriel withdrew his hand, I coughed once and sucked in a breath. Michael, Uriel said through a tight jaw. I shouldn't be surprised you came running to save him, just like you always do. Michael stepped up beside me, his expression hard. He wasn't my silly-humored, witty friend right then, but rather the warrior angel who instilled fear in his enemies. Over two thousand years have passed since the council ordered him to seal the bond. Within that time, he never once strayed from that order. As I said long ago, fate cannot be ignored forever. The seal broke through no fault of his own. That will be for me to decide. Us, you mean? Raphael said, slowly scooting his chair back and standing. He dusted crumbs from his mouth and bare chest before walking over. You're not the only member of the council. You don't hold absolute power, no matter how hard you try to make it so. Uriel's scowl deepened. As the council, is it not our duty to enforce the rules of our realm? If we allow one angel to disobey a direct order, what's stopping others from doing the same? It's why we must strike down those who go against our ruling. 
Strike me down after we defeat Lucifer then, I said, my voice more gravelly than usual. He should be your priority. Zalephiel turned the sapphire ring on his index finger, as he so often did when thinking. If the rumors are true, your boys wounded Lucifer but failed to kill him. If the cursed sons cannot fulfill their duty, then they serve no purpose, Uriel said. Irritation prickled at my scalp as his insinuation became clear, but it was Michael who spoke before I could. We aren't killing the boys, he snapped. Remove that thought from your head. Your grudge against their fathers blinds you, Uriel. You didn't see what I did. You didn't see how they weakened Lucifer's defenses and pierced his skin. It's something none of us have ever been able to do. They're the key to all of this, but a piece is missing. We only need to find it. Do you believe that Mephistopheles told the council everything? Alistair's question had seemed irrelevant at the time, but what if he'd been on to something? Lucifer said it would take more than the cursed sons weakening him to kill him. As Michael pointed out, a piece was missing. And Mephistopheles might have that missing piece. Permission to speak, I asked, interrupting one of Uriel's rants. Please do, Salafiel said with a sigh, waving his hand at me. If I have to listen to those two fight for another second, I'll lose my mind. Mephistopheles first told us about the cursed sons, I started. Only as a bargaining chip to save his own hide, Uriel said. What of it? Regardless of his reason for telling us, it's because of him we were able to take action and ensure that the boys didn't grow to become Lucifer's weapons. Proof that his intel was credible. You believe he knows something more, Michael said, eyes narrowing in contemplation. Something he kept to himself? Alistair suggested it, I responded. He's always been clever and highly perceptive, seeing things no one else does. I never once considered there was more Mephis might know. Raphael snuck back over to the table and returned with a croissant. Even if he does know something, what makes you think he'll tell us? He was stripped of his wings and banished to the realm of the lost. He took a bite and released a happy little sigh. The pastry cream filling oozed onto his lips, and he licked it off. The years of isolation would make anyone bitter. I thought back to when we visited him on All Hollows Eve. He had been bitter toward me, sure, but he'd enjoyed the boy's company. Mephistopheles was lonely, as anyone forced into solitude for so long would be. It's worth a try, I said. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I agree, Salafiel said. I vote in favor of the idea. Me too, Raphael nodded. As do I. Michael focused on Uriel, waiting for his answer. For a moment, Uriel only glared, at me, at Michael. Then he blew out a frustrated sigh. Although I believe it's a waste of time, go ahead. But I suggest you make it quick. While you run off to speak to the traitor, Lucifer's army continues to march on the human realm. Michael and I then returned to the island together. Go wake your mate he told me once we'd landed. I'll inform the others of the plan. Wait. I touched his arm, causing him to turn back to me. Thank you. What for? For believing in fate's plan for me and Alistair. Speaking such sentiments aloud made me self-conscious. You are too good to me. Michael smiled. As you are to me. I've done nothing of value for you. As Uriel said, you're always running to my aid, yet I never do anything in return. I must disagree. His smile turned sad. The other angels see only my power, but you see me for how I truly am. You allow me to be myself in your presence. An immature fool? A booming laugh burst from him. <laughs> Precisely. He gazed up as birds passed overhead. Uriel is an ass, but he was right about one thing. We need to do this quickly. Time is a luxury we don't have.
Alistair was still asleep when I returned to the room. I sat on the edge of the bed and smoothed my hand over his pale hair. His nose crinkled, and he pushed his backside more against me, wiggling his hips. I smiled. Seeing him that way was a contrast to how serious he was around everyone else. This adorable side of him was one only I got to see, even if he was asleep and unaware of it. I pressed my lips to his temple. Wake up. One lid opened, then the other. What time is it? He croaked. Time for you to get out of bed. No. Too tired. My heart swelled as I smiled again. The smell of Alistair's skin grounded me, spicy and earthy. The council's pending decision hung over me like a dark cloud, but I wouldn't think on it, wouldn't dwell on what might happen. Alistair. I trailed like kisses from his mouth and jaw, stopping at his ear. Don't make me spank you. Always bossing me around, he mumbled before giving me a lazy kiss. He was falling back asleep. Oh well. Letting him sleep for another hour wouldn't hurt. This is the worst Christmas Eve ever, Gray said, kicking at the grass. We should be watching movies and baking cookies, sitting in front of the Christmas tree and looking at the pretty lights, enjoying a toasty, warm fire and drinking hot chocolate. But no, we're on our way to a scary place with endless pits of doom and bogs of nasty, smelly water. We'll celebrate when you get back, Angel. Mason wrapped his muscular arms around him. We can eat sweets and watch Krampus with Dino Steve. Gray beamed at that. Okay, but Simon has to watch it with us. I want to scare him. It's been too long. Simon rolled his eyes before latching on to Galen's waist. Watch out for those pits of doom, big guy. Wouldn't want you to get swallowed up. I have wings. I can just fly back out. Galen tenderly cupped Simon's face and bent to kiss him. Behave while I'm gone. Pfft. Simon straightened his glasses that had gone askew with the kiss. I always behave. Humans weren't allowed in the realm of the lost. Their souls were too susceptible to the void of nothingness. If they stepped into purgatory, they wouldn't step back out. So Mason and Simon weren't accompanying us. The other mates refused to stay behind, though. I saw no reason to fight the decision. I wouldn't win that argument anyway. Sorry I'm late. Raiden landed in the grass in front of Baxter's villa, ten minutes past our meeting time. He held a red plastic container with a green plaid ribbon on top. Had to let these cool before I iced them. What is it? I asked. Soft gingerbread cookies, he answered. Mephistopheles loved the ones I brought him on Halloween. These are the same, but instead of pumpkin-shaped, they're gingerbread men. Titan landed beside him, holding a glass dish with a chocolate cake that was covered with plastic wrap and topped with a red bow. And this is a Yule log. It's fucking delicious, too, Raiden said. Sponge cake with peanut butter frosting between the rolled layers and covered in rich chocolate ganache. He put raspberries on top. Michael eyed the cake, his curiosity and love of sweets briefly showing. He then shook his head. Now that everyone's here, we should go. Though... I almost think I should stay behind. Why? Alistair asked. I'm the one who took his wings. Michael had done what he thought was right at the time. Traitors had to be punished. Yet he carried guilt over it too. He never took joy in hurting others, even when his position required him to. He may not be willing to talk with me around. You need to be with us, I told him. As a member of the council, you have the authority to agree to any terms he may have in exchange for the information, because it was only reasonable for Mephistopheles to want something in return. Everything came at a price, especially during wartime. Very well. Michael withdrew a silver ring from his pocket and placed it on the middle finger of his right hand. The stone in the center of the ring softly transitioned between blue and purple as the magic within pulsed. Everyone, gather around. Lucifer was the only angel who could teleport, but Michael's ring gave him that teleportation ability. 
and unlike the stones I used that were only good for a single round trip use, the ring's magic was infinite. He could use it as many times as he liked. He had lent it to Salafiel and recently got it back. Alistair grabbed my bicep. My skin tingled. He offered me a small smile, and I brought him closer to nuzzle his soft hair. Would it always be like that between us? Me responding to his closeness in that way? I hoped so. Once everyone formed a link, Michael activated the ring and teleported us from the island. Silence greeted us a second later. So did the shadows of night. The realm of the lost was a wasteland of eternal darkness. The sun never rose. There was no wind, as if the air itself hung between the balance of life and death. In the distance, the veil separating the outer wasteland from that of the lost souls of the dead faintly glowed, the translucent barrier the palest shade of blue with white pulses. Shit, Michael, Casta said. Could you have teleported us any farther from his cabin? My friend was back to his good-natured self and grinned at Casta's whining. Walking will do you good. Truth was, it was impossible to teleport any closer to his home. It was why I had teleported us so far away when we'd come months ago. Mephistopheles, though stripped of his wings and exiled there, still had his powers. He'd placed warding around his property to prevent anyone from popping in. He knew everything that happened in the realm, too. The moment we'd arrived, he'd sensed us. Give me a cookie, Ray. Gray reached for the container. Nope. Raiden lifted it out of his reach. These aren't yours. But it's Christmas Eve. Giving is the reason for the season, or whatever. Gray jumped up to grab the container, then pouted when he came back empty-handed. I need sugar, or I'm going to curl up and take a nap. Oh, Smalls. Raiden grabbed the lid. Don't give in to him, Alistair said. He's spoiled rotten. Gray stuck out his tongue at his eldest brother. You okay, Cal? Bellamy placed a hand on his shoulder. Yes, I am well, Callius answered in a shaky tone. His dark eyes focused on the veil ahead of us. Returning to this place is just... daunting. No worries, brother. Castor's hand landed on his other shoulder and squeezed. You'll never go back to the void. We won't let it happen. The barren land altered slightly as we reached a small hill and descended the other side. Trees jutted from the ground, their branches thin and bare, and dark pools of water bubbled, reeking of rotten earth and mildew. Gross, Gray shuddered. Smells like moldy ass. A log cabin sat ahead. Smoke rose from the chimney, and warm light spilled out from the windows and into the dark, starless night. Small patches of dead grass surrounded it, as if it had tried to grow but was rejected by the soil. A larger pool of thick water sat off to one side. How quaint, Michael said. Quaint? Looks more like a place a serial killer would live to me, Casta muttered. The front door opened, and Mephistopheles stepped out crossing his arms as he leaned against the doorframe. The fire from inside the cabin highlighted the outer strands of his long red hair, and his orange-yellow eyes faintly glowed, like a nocturnal creature. You have balls showing your face here, Archangel, Mephistopheles said. Or have you come to finish the job? I know I'm the last face you wish to see, Michael responded. But we've come to ask for your help. I have no intention of harming you. Harming me again, you mean. You took my wings. And you betrayed us. A crime in which you were punished accordingly. Mephistopheles stared at him, expression indifferent, then nudged the door more open with the heel of his boot. Might as well come in. I'll put on a pot of tea. He stepped back into the cabin, leaving the door open for us. Gray leaned over to Bellamy. You don't think the tea comes from the ass water, do you? Alistair briefly closed his eyes. Gray, for the love of the gods, be on your best behavior. He looked at Castor. You two. Hey, what the hell did I do? You opened your mouth. Keo choked on a laugh. Castor gaped before throwing his arms around him and tickling his sides, 
causing his mate to laugh even harder. Raiden stepped forward first, followed by Titan. Warren placed a hand on Damon's lower back and guided him up the three steps into the cabin. The rest of them went inside, leaving only me, Alistair, and Michael. God's help us, I said under my breath. Alistair softly smiled. Perhaps Mephistopheles will be charmed by their idiocy. The cake will help. Michael stepped forward. But if he doesn't want it, I'll happily take it off his hands. The interior of the cabin was cozy. A fire burned in the hearth, and a collection of books and leather-bound journals lined the built-in shelves on both sides of it. The armchair in front of the fire was worn from years of use, and a knitted throw blanket was folded and draped over the back. A tiny kitchen was to the left, consisting of an old-fashioned oven, a wooden counter with a bowl of oranges, and a half-eaten loaf of freshly baked bread on top, and an antique brass faucet with a single basin. Make yourselves at home. Mephistopheles grabbed a pot and filled it with water. Castor watched him. Not to be, like, rude or anything, but how did you manage all this? And more importantly, where does that water come from? Alistair scrubbed a hand over his face. No doubt he was cursing at his brother through their mind link. The cabin was here when I arrived, Mephistopheles answered. One of the very few amenities given to me with my banishment. My drinking water comes from an infinite well in the back that's always fresh. Another kindness from the council. A kindness from Raphael, to be exact. As an archangel of health and happiness, he couldn't bear to think about Mephistopheles not having a clean water source. He couldn't die from living off the rancid water in the realm, but forcing him to do so would have been cruel. And he'd been punished enough. I also have a small pond with an endless supply of fish, Mephistopheles continued, another of Raphael's gifts. Though it's not big, I have an area with fertile soil where I can grow vegetables and plant fruit trees. There is no sun in this realm, so I infuse the soil with magic to help the crops grow. I summon any other small items I need, such as yarn and books. I get by well enough. He was blocked from using magic any stronger than the warding he'd placed in the minor summoning spells. Raiden set the red container on the kitchen counter. We brought you some goodies. More of those soft gingerbread cookies, and Ty made you a Yule log. As I said before, your gentle heart is a true rarity, Mephistopheles told him, then looked at Titan. Thank you both. He grabbed a cookie, faintly smiled at the decorated gingerbread man, then took a bite, moaning softly. Even better than last time. Glad you like it, Raiden said. Gray sprawled out in front of the fire and closed his eyes. Sloth was taking him over. The others remained standing. My impatience grew as the minutes ticked by, and I shifted my weight to my other leg. Once the tea was finished, Mephistopheles poured a cup for Alistair, who thanked him, and then offered one to me, which I declined. As he asked everyone else, I deeply inhaled and shifted my weight again. Should I tell you to behave too? Alistair asked me telepathically. I take no orders from you, pride. A smile lit his eyes as he took a drink. I fought a smile of my own. He had me wrapped around his finger and he knew it. Mephistopheles cut a slice of the Yule log and took the plate and his tea over to the armchair. Once seated, he took a bite and stared at the fire as he chewed. Tell me why you've come. You don't already know? Damon asked. He had rooted himself against the wall so he could see everyone in the room. Warren stood beside him. When we came for Callius, you were already expecting us. I see many things here, yes. Mephistopheles answered. Yet, much is hidden, too. Sometimes the fog is too thick to see things clearly. It's quite frustrating. My sight allows me to feel like I'm still part of the world, albeit small, and when my vision is shrouded, that's when the loneliness seeps into my bones. He brought the fork to his lips, but his hand stilled. But that's beside the point. Considering the reason why you retrieved Callius from the Vale, 
I imagine you're here about the war. We are. Alistair set his cup on the mantle. My brothers and I wounded Lucifer. Shock touched the fallen angel's eyes. You pierced his skin? Yes. We weakened him and stabbed him with our celestial swords. Like a pincushion, Bellamy added. We pinned the fucker in place from all sides, and he was choking on his own blood. We thought we'd won. But then he healed himself, Mephistopheles stated as a distant look appeared in his eyes. So it's true. What's true? Michael asked. How to kill Lucifer. The eight cursed sons are the only ones capable of weakening his defenses, yet something else is needed to deal the final blow. The breath stilled in my lungs, and my blood raced hot through my veins. You were right, I told Alistair. He knows how to kill him. Of course I was right. I cut my eyes over to him. Now's not the time for arrogance. You love my arrogance. That's debatable. Why did you keep this from the council? Michael asked in a hard tone. It took a lot to anger him. It would have helped us during the first war. It could have prevented all of this. Why? Mephistopheles set his plate on the small table beside his chair and pushed to his feet, facing Michael. I came before you and the council, fell to my hands and knees, and begged for your forgiveness. Uriel said if I gave valuable information, my plea for mercy would be considered. So I told you of Lucifer's plan for the cursed sons. I told you the locations of his generals. And what mercy was given to me in exchange? You wanted to rip my head from my shoulders, but you settled for my wings instead. Then I was banished here for all eternity. A fair sentence considering your crimes, Michael retorted with a slight snarl. It was merciful. I've been here for thousands of years, Michael. At this point, I almost would have preferred for you to remove my head. At least then I wouldn't have to endure this crushing loneliness in such a lifeless, desolate place. His body shook with anger before he expelled a breath and forced himself to calm. Which is why I will not help you. I'd rather you bend to Lucifer's rule or burn. Both would be a fair sentence for you. Mephis, I started. He- Don't call me that! Mephistopheles snapped his head toward me, his eyes glistening. You and every angel in the heavens can fight and fight, but you'll never beat Lucifer. But isn't that what you want? Alistair asked. Lucifer's defeat. He convinced you to defect from the celestial realm and then betrayed you. He made you promises and broke them before casting you aside like you were nothing. So ask yourself which is greater, your anger toward the council or your hatred of him. Gods, you're just like your father, he said with a frustrated huff. You know exactly what to say to persuade others to do what you want. But it won't work on me, son of Azazel. His amber eyes shifted back to me. His charms have worked on you, though. His scent is all over you. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Lazarus will not be cast out for falling in love, Michael said. I won't allow it. Yet you waged war on those of us who only wished for the freedom to do the same. Desiring love wasn't the reason you defected. You craved power, just like Lucifer. The two of you plotted to conquer the human realm and the underworld. And when he chose to rule over both by himself, you came crawling back to us. Mephistopheles scowled. If this is your attempt at convincing me to help you, you're doing a piss-poor job. Then allow me to try. Callius stepped forward. To not seem like a threat, he had left his siphos behind. Yet even still, every inch of him screamed warrior, from his cropped black hair to his piercing dark eyes and strong build. Go on. I was born a Spartan. We were taught to never surrender, never beg. Yet, Callius dropped to one knee and bowed his head, lowering his gaze. Here I am, 
kneeling before you and begging. Please help us. His melancholic tone filled the air, an echo of his own pain. My mate waits for me in the Elysian fields. My only hope of seeing him again rests on us defeating Lucifer in this war. Uriel will not allow our souls to enter the celestial realm otherwise. Your words move me, Mephistopheles said, losing his bite from before. Uriel's grudge against your fathers has been unfairly passed to all of you. I was saddened the night Lazarus brought your soul here upon your death instead of the afterlife you deserved. The memory was fresh in my mind. When Callias died, his soul should have gone to the afterlife with his mates, but Uriel wouldn't allow him to pass through the gates to the celestial realm. Throw his wretched soul in the fiery pit, Uriel had told me, emotionless, as if he were merely telling me to take out the trash. That's an order. Instead, I traveled to this realm, desperate. Please, I'd begged Mephistopheles. Allow his soul to pass through the veil. Why should I? Because he doesn't deserve to burn for the sins of his father. Alistair's hand brushed mine, bringing me back from that dark place in my mind. Our eyes met, and the ice in my chest thawed a little. Will you help us? Callius asked, still kneeling. You ask much of me, Nephilim, Mephistopheles said. Helping you would be helping the council, and I'm petty enough to allow the world to fall into darkness before lifting a finger to help them. Raiden then knelt beside Callius. I'm begging you to. You have every right to be pissed for what's been done to you, so I'm not asking you to help the archangels who banished you here. I'm begging you to help us, me and my brothers. We can't do it without you. His voice shook. If you don't, I don't know if we'll survive this war. And I can't lose them. Any of them. They're mates, too. They're my family. Ray. Casta walked over and put a hand on top of Raiden's head. The connection the eight of them shared allowed them to feel each other's strong emotions though in that moment I was certain every person in that room felt the weight of desperation and fear clinging to the avatar of gluttony. Mephistopheles sat back down and combed his fingers through his long hair. His gaze fell to the half-eaten cake. You have been kind to me without expecting anything in return. Very well, I'll tell you. Alistair grabbed my bicep, his pale eyes glued to the fallen angel. Being so close to the answer to winning the war had his breath catching. However, Mephistopheles lifted a finger. My help comes at a price. Name it, Michael said. My freedom. That I cannot give you. Michael shook his head. Surely his exile can be reassessed after so many years, I said. The decision for me to seal the fated bond hadn't yet been overturned, but the matter would be brought before the council for reconsideration. The same rule should apply to him. Yeah, Gray sat up, slowly blinking. Penn rebelled with Lucifer and did some not-so-nice things, and he wasn't killed or locked up in a scary place. Penemuel aided Lucifer, yes, but his crimes are minor in comparison, Michael said. He's also aided us since then. However, as the saying goes, drastic times call for drastic measures. Defeating Lucifer is all that matters right now. So I'll take your request before the council and vote in your favor. You have my word. Your word means little to me. Mephistopheles tapped a finger on the arm of his chair. My word is everything. If I say I'll do something, I will. Michael lifted his closed fist to his chest. I alone cannot grant your freedom, but I will do everything in my power to free you from this place, should your information help us win this war. I swear this to you. I suppose that will have to do. For now. But if you go back on your word, 
Let me swear something to you, Archangel. I will use every resource I have to destroy you. Michael smirked. I'd expect nothing less. Well, as long as we have that settled... Mephistopheles grabbed the cake from the side table and took another bite. Mmm, this peanut butter filling is orgasmic. The food of the gods. Titan had helped Raiden back to his feet and held him close, jaw tight as he looked at the fallen angel. To better show your gratitude, you can stop upsetting my husband and tell us what we need to know. Of course. A flicker of guilt shone in Mephistopheles' eyes before quickly fading. Like many who met Raiden, he seemed to have developed a soft spot for him too. When Lucifer saw the vision of his death, I touched his arm and saw it too. What did you see? Michael asked. Eight Nephilim, each with a different color in their black wings, surrounding Lucifer. Beneath a dark sky in the dead of winter, they stabbed him with celestial blades. Someone chanted in the distance. And then a black sword was plunged into his heart. A black sword? Bellamy rubbed at his slightly stubbled jaw. The avatar of lust was normally clean-shaven, but his demon mate liked the scruff. Made of pure obsidian and cloaked in darkness, Mephistopheles responded. But it's not an ordinary sword that can be forged by any of us. It's a soul weapon. Whose? I asked. Patience, Lazarus. I'm getting there. Get there faster. Alistair gently bumped me. I bumped him right back. As sunlight broke across the cosmos for the first time, Lucifer took his first breath, and the Lightbringer came into being along with him. Mephistopheles looked at Michael. Much like you, with your sword of fire. Soul weapons only come to those of great power, or those who have been chosen by fate, like the water dragon. He nodded to Keo. Keo seemed uncomfortable by the sudden attention on him. His katana was a soul weapon that had chosen him when he was a baby. One of the factors that showed me he was a worthy mate for Castor long before they bound their life forces. If that's true, why weren't we born with one? Alistair asked. The eight of us are more powerful than a majority of the angels who have soul weapons. I've pondered this. Mephistopheles responded, and I've come to the conclusion that, in a sense, each of you were born with one. Your sins. They grant you special abilities without the use of a physical weapon. Mind control, the strength of a hundred men, the power to feed off and manipulate people's emotions. Anger, sadness, hunger, sex. Alistair's brow furrowed. So that's why we're able to weaken Lucifer when our sins join together. Because they are weapons. Yes. At least, that's my theory. Mephistopheles washed down the cake with a drink of tea, then dabbed at his mouth. Which brings me to the sword. I've heard whispers of it during my exile. Prophetic dreams, if you will. Nightfall. Nightfall? Damon asked. Mephistopheles nodded. What can snuff out the light but darkness itself? Just as Lightbringer was created with the first light of morning, nightfall began to take shape the moment Lucifer's heart darkened and he became consumed by his wrath. Huh? Gray sat crisscross on the rug, resting his chin on his hand. Nightfall can't be Lucifer's sole weapon. He already has Lightbringer. I didn't say it was his, Mephistopheles responded. I said it began to take shape inside him. Nightfall fully came into being when the darkness of Lucifer's rage, pride, envy, and all the wicked sins that led to his rebellion took its first breath. My chest constricted as his meaning sunk in. No fucking way, Castus said seconds later. 
Although a major smartass, he was sharp. He'd figured it out, too. Alistair stood frozen beside me. He gripped my arm tighter. Are you implying what I think you are? Galen asked. I'm lost. Raiden glanced between his brothers. Where are we supposed to find this sword? It's already been found, Alistair said, his voice barely more than a whisper. He looked at Michael. And its owner is sitting in your prison. Remarkable, is it not? Mephistopheles returned his gaze to the fire, the flames dancing in his eyes. Nightfall is the sole weapon of Aza Morningstar. Chapter 17 Alistair I was unaware he possessed a soul weapon, I said, and the admission gnawed at my chest. But if our sins were technically our weapons, as Mephistopheles speculated, then it was only reasonable for Aza to have one as well, seeing how he was the ninth Nephilim born and held a piece of all our sins. We were all connected in this fucked up game of power and betrayal. I've seen it. Bellamy looked at me. When Aza attacked our mansion to retrieve Lightbringer from your vault, I saw him wield an all-black sword. Yes, I saw it too when we fought. Smoke swathed the blade. Shadows, Mephistopheles corrected. It draws its power from the dark. But, if I'm correct in my thinking, Nightfall's true purpose has yet to be fulfilled. Explain. Lazarus said. That one word held such authority that it made my insides quiver a bit. Gods damn him. Mephistopheles glanced at Bellamy. When you saw the sword, did you notice any stones along the hilt? Uh, no. He moved a hand through his golden hair. We were kind of getting our asses handed to us at the time. I didn't stop to admire his pretty sword of death. Phoenix pressed his lips together. Well, I lived with the bastard for a year. I've seen the sword. I just didn't know it was a soul weapon. I never saw him summon it from his body like Belphegor does his. It was always just with him. And the stones? Mephistopheles asked. I thought they were diamonds, the demon answered. Or clear quartz. Just a fancy decoration. What's the significance of these stones? Michael questioned. Right now, they are nothing more than decoration, just as the demon presumed. Mephistopheles shifted his orange yellow eyes to me. A second passed as he held my gaze. Then he stood and walked over to grab another cookie. Your blood holds extraordinary power, boys, as I'm sure you know. You couldn't kill Lucifer without Callius but that power in your blood was able to seal him in his cage. I processed his words. The stones are meant for us. Your intellect is astounding. You came to that conclusion much quicker than I expected. Eight stones, one for each of you. Mephistopheles rested his hip against the kitchen counter, facing us. He bit the head off the gingerbread man and slowly chewed either savoring the bite or intentionally testing my patience. Testing Lazarus's patience, too. My mate shifted in place and heavily exhaled. Damon pushed from the wall. So we're supposed to... what? Fill the stones with our blood to strengthen it, then plunge it into Lucifer's heart? Sounds simple enough, Casta said. Mephistopheles looked at me again. He kept his silence but something in his eyes unsettled me. My scouts believe Belphegor's been searching for a way inside this celestial prison, Michael said. Could this be the reason? Lucifer knows about Nightfall and wants to find it before we do. He did seem awfully interested in finding Aza, Lazarus said, which seemed out of place, considering how he allowed Aza to be sacrificed to gain his freedom. Then he stepped over Aza's dead body with no remorse. Bellamy added. Gray's eyes watered as he yawned so big his jaw popped. He raised his hand. Question. 
If Lucifer knew Butthole Aza held the key to his death, why did he leave his body in the field after the fight in Scotland? Because he was dead, I answered. A soul weapon no longer has power once the soul of the body it inhabits passes on. But Aza's soul didn't pass on. It never left his body because of the resurrection spell he used. Once Lucifer learned Aza was alive, that's when Belphegor began searching for him. Correct. Mephistopheles finished the cookie and licked the icing off his fingers. Furthermore, Aza Morningstar was never meant to be your foe. It's why you're bound together by destiny, your sins and his sword. When united, they become the only thing in all the worlds that can defeat Lucifer. That explains a lot. Phoenix laid his head on Bellamy's shoulder, and his black tail did what it always did when that close and curved around Bell's leg. Belphegor pushed Aza to incite the war, which wasn't too difficult. Aza was impressionable. All it took was an encouraging nudge and stroking of his ego for him to take action. Aza holds a piece of pride, I pointed out. Belphegor used that to his advantage. Why didn't Belphegor just kill him? Raiden asked. He needed him, I answered. Aza was the only one who could wield Lightbringer to locate Lucifer's cage. So he manipulated him, ensuring everything fell into place according to plan, then disposed of him to guarantee Lucifer's victory. Or so he thought. Man, Casta blew out a breath. Aza is an evil asshole, but the guy never stood a chance. His life and death was planned from the time he was born. The witches, Phoenix said. I think I may know what Lucifer wanted with them. As a magic wielder myself, the nexus in Hoyabashu is beyond anything I've ever felt. When we fought all of you there? Yes, I know, I'm an evil, villainous prick, how dare I? He angled his head and lightly poked Bellamy with his one intact horn, earning a soft smile from my brother. My magic was enhanced. Aza's was as well. It allowed him to summon more demons from the underworld. So Lucifer wanted to summon something? Bellamy asked. Not something, I said, catching on. Someone. He hoped the witches would be able to summon Aza from the celestial realm since he couldn't step foot there himself. That's very likely, Mephistopheles said with a small nod. And if you hadn't confronted him that night, he might have succeeded. Michael walked over to the window, staring out into the pitch-black night. I suppose it's fortunate I didn't execute Aza for his crimes. We have use for him now. If he helps us, Lazarus said. Well, we're screwed. Gray fell backward on the rug, kicking out his legs and spreading his arms. He's not going to help us unless he gets something out of it. Revenge is always a good motivator, Damon said. By helping us, he'll take down his father. Envy has heard his envious thoughts. I felt his deep insecurity and bitterness when it comes to Lucifer. The opportunity to prove himself greater than his father should work in our favor. I knew from experience. Pride had jumped at the chance to do the same, which had led me to Echo Bay. If not for that mistake, though, Lazarus and I would have never embraced our bond. It had been what finally pushed us together. I grabbed his hand. His attention moved to me, and though his eyes appeared somewhat cold, a habit he developed when around us, I saw traces of warmth within the blue depths. I'll speak to the council about this. Michael turned back to us. Aza is a prisoner in our realm, and as such they need to be informed of our intentions with him. Don't forget to speak with them about my exile as well, Mephistopheles told him. Should my information prove to be true. Michael nodded to him before opening the door and stepping outside. Galen followed, then Castor and Keo. Callius helped Gray to his feet and smiled as our sloth for a brother latched on to his back. He carried him from the cabin. I'll try to bring you more treats soon. Raiden adjusted his hat before grabbing Titan's hand. What do you think about chimney cake? I think anything you make will be delicious, 
Mephistopheles responded. The rest of my brothers left the cabin. After nodding to the fallen angel, Lazarus then guided me toward the door. Alistair. I looked back at Mephistopheles. Yes? There's something else you should know, he said, stepping toward me. Your victory depends on it. This must have been the reason behind the prolonged glances that had left me feeling uneasy. That feeling returned full force as I waited for him to say more. But he didn't tell me. He showed me. Mephistopheles placed two fingers at my temple, and in an instant I was standing beneath a moonless sky, snow beneath my boots. Yet, I wasn't actually there. I didn't feel the biting cold or smell the stench of blood and death. Bodies lay motionless all around me. Demons, Nephilim, angels. The aftermath of a battle. Ahead, I saw me and my brothers fighting Lucifer. I wielded a black sword that looked like darkness itself. We fought, slashing, cutting, and striking. It was the vision of Lucifer's death. Mephistopheles was letting me see it for myself, and what I saw left me shaking. I watched until the vision faded away. Blinking, I found myself back in the cabin with a worried Lazarus beside me. What did you see? Lazarus asked, cupping my face. God's Alistair, you're so pale. Say something. He turned to Mephistopheles. Tell me what you did to him. I did nothing. I only showed him the truth. Show me too. I cannot. Mephistopheles then looked at me with a solemn expression. That's how you will win this war, son of Azazel. Many paths lead to Lucifer's victory, but only one leads to his doom. And you've just witnessed it for yourself. You know what needs to be done. Yes, I said, hating the quiver in my voice. I do. All my life, I had enjoyed unraveling mysteries and uncovering the truth. Knowledge was power. Yet, in that moment, it felt more like a curse, a burden I had to carry until that fateful night arrived. Lazarus and I joined the others outside and walked far enough away from the warded property to where Michael could activate the teleportation ring. The entire time, Lazarus kept his eyes on me. When we returned to the island, Michael left for the celestial realm, and my brothers and their mates went inside the villa to speak to the allied commanders probably to eat, too. We hadn't eaten dinner before traveling to the realm of the lost, and I sensed Raiden's need for family time. Cooking and eating helped ease his anxieties. Come with me. Lazarus led me to the orchard beside Baxter's villa. Reaching it, he spun around to face me. What did you see in the vision? I'll tell you later. I tried to step around him. You'll tell me now. He grabbed my arm and brought me closer to his body. What did you see? Moonlight bled through the branches above us, shining on his face. I lifted a hand and stroked the curve of his smooth jaw. As his winter apple scent surrounded me, pride purred in my chest. Beneath his scent, I smelled another. Mine. You're so beautiful, I told him. The first time I ever saw you, you reminded me of the snow. Cold, but striking. When you grabbed my hand, though, you felt so warm. I went to those woods hoping you'd come for me. I tucked my head beneath his chin. And you did. Lazarus wrapped his arms around me. You're worrying me, Alistair. Don't be worried. The backs of my eyes burned. I saw our victory. Then why are you shaking? He held me tighter and buried his face in my hair. Tell me the truth. The truth would crush him. It was crushing me. Remember when we caged Lucifer? I rested my ear over his heart, listening to the beats. They helped calm my own. Our blood was needed to seal the door, but our life force was also needed to reinforce it. 
The same will be required to kill him. Nightfall will need our energy. A spell must be performed to transfer our energy into the blade as the final blow is made. Okay. He took slow, steady breaths. So it will be like it was during the first war. You will be weakened and close to death? He wasn't fully understanding, and I didn't have the heart or the nerve to clarify. I squeezed my eyes shut, forcing back tears. Yes. This is the only way? I nodded. Lazarus kissed my hair. All will be well. There were only seven of you last time. With Callius, you'll be stronger. My chin quivered. Yeah, we will be. Quiet moments rarely happened when all of my brothers got together. If they weren't bickering, they were being obnoxious in other ways, like concocting asinine ideas, pranking each other, or cracking jokes. There were no jokes as we stood on the moonlit beach, no playful bickering or light-hearted jabs. I had asked them to meet me once their mates had gone to sleep for the night. Then, I had told them what I'd seen in the vision. You're sure this is what needs to be done? Galen asked, breaking the silence. I had wondered if it'd go on forever, one painful, silent moment stretching into another. I am. Bellamy dropped to his knees in the sand and stared at the dark water. Damon knelt beside him. A second passed before he wound his arms around Bellamy. The two of them said nothing. They just held each other, being each other's strength when both felt like breaking apart. I knew because I felt it too. This is bullshit, Castor said, arms crossed. The fingertips of one hand dug into his bicep as he squeezed it tight. There has to be another way. Maybe you misinterpreted the vision. It's the only way, I said. Believe me, I wish I was wrong. One of the very few times in my life I'd ever wished for such a thing. My words hung in the air. More silence. Waves lapped at the shore, rolling in and brushing the tips of my boots before receding. Raiden crouched down, placing both hands on the back of his hat as he lowered his head. It's not fair. We've already given so much. Why can't we just be happy? Because we were never meant to be happy, Galen gritted his teeth. It's our curse to bear. The veins bulged from his arms as he tensed. One of his eyes clouded over, the pupil expanding until the entirety of the iris turned black. I was a fool for thinking otherwise. What about our mates? Bellamy whispered, hand lifting to the key dangling from his necklace. Our souls are bound. What will happen to them? They should be fine, I answered. Though I suppose fine isn't the right word. There are no right words for this, Damon said, his voice rasping. I felt an echo of his aching heart, not yet shattered, but preparing for it. What are we supposed to tell them? Nothing. I closed my eyes, recalling Lazarus's scent as I pressed my face into his chest, as he held me. We tell them nothing until the night it happens. Nix and I don't keep secrets. How am I going to face him? How can I hold him and pretend everything's okay, knowing that I... that we have to... Bellamy shoved from the sand and yanked his hands through his hair. God damn it! Gray flinched at his outburst and curled into a ball. But he wasn't afraid of Bellamy. He was feeling his anguish. We all felt it. Galen, no longer able to contain wrath, punched the tree closest to him, cracking the bark. What was the goddamn reason for us finding our mates if this is how it all ends? To make it mean more? To test our resolve? The fates work in mysterious ways, I said, trying to keep my emotions at bay, trying to be a pillar for them to lean on. But I won't force any of you to do this. Castor scoffed. It sounded pained. 
You say that like we actually have a choice. You do. As Raiden said, we've given so much throughout our lives. We've known little outside of war and constant fighting. If any of you choose to sit this one out, I'll understand. This needs to be a decision you make for yourself. Callius stared out to see, the short strands of his black hair ruffling with the breeze. We haven't a choice. If we don't do this, Lucifer will never be stopped. He'll succeed in his conquest and bring all of humankind to its knees. This world we stand upon at this moment will turn to ash as he burns it all down. Then let it burn, Bellamy said, balling his hands into fists. Let it all fucking burn. I don't care anymore. We can't let that happen, Raiden said. Why not? Bellamy trembled. From sadness, from anger. We've spent our entire lives fighting. Why can't someone else deal with this shit for once? I'm tired of it. Tears sprang to his eyes, and he turned away from us, shoulders slumping. I just want to make a home with Phoenix. Start a family with him someday. And now I can't. None of us can. Damon stared at his wedding ring. He touched the band, made of two-toned metal, gold and platinum, with a single sapphire on top. Marrying Warren? Loving him? It's made me so fucking happy. His voice cracked. But I'll never see our cottage again. I'll never get to see him become a dad or be one myself. The thought of a mini war with his silver hair and big blue eyes, his little hands holding mine. Gods, I want that so much. I want more time with my husband. But we won't get our happy ending. And then Damon did what I'd never seen him do. He wrapped both arms around his stomach, leaned forward, and cried. Body-shaking sobs that cut across my heart like jagged shards of glass. D. Bellamy dropped in front of Damon and pulled him to his chest. This will kill him, B. Damon said through his tears. It'll break war's heart. Fuck, it's breaking mine. Gray whimpered and made himself smaller in the sand, curling more into himself. I want Mason. I'll give you time to think this over, I said, fighting the sharp, burning ache in my sternum. Michael's making arrangements for us to visit Aza. Give me your answers before then. For tonight, return to your mates. Hold them. Love them. Well, we still can. Castor lowered his gaze. Galen's black and red wings exploded from his back before he shot upward, leaving the beach without a word. Castor gathered Grey in his arms and did the same. Damon and Bellamy stood and, with one arm wrapped around each other's waist, found the path through the trees that led to their villa. Callius continued staring at the dark sea, expression calm even as his soul wept. I will never see Alassus again. Will I? I couldn't respond. No matter how hard I tried to stay strong for them, I felt myself slipping. Felt the pillar starting to crumble. If we choose not to fight, Uriel won't allow our souls into the celestial realm. His voice carried the weight of his grief. And if we do fight, if we defeat Lucifer... Our souls will be forever trapped, unable to pass on to the afterlife. Either way, my soul will never join his. That's what I'd seen in the vision. Eight stones along the hilt of nightfall, meant for eight souls. It would be more than a simple blood spell or transfer of some of our energy. The sword was a vessel for us to channel our powers through. Our souls had to be placed inside Nightfall, housed in the stones. Only then would it be powerful enough to kill Lucifer. It was just like when Aza's soul had been transferred into the ring. He hadn't died, but in all the ways that mattered, he had been gone from the world. The same would happen to us. 
still alive but confined, unable to speak or feel, frozen in a moment. No way to be freed. Let's go home, Raiden said to Callius. I'll make us late night nachos. Extra meat and sour cream. Just how you like them. With a sad nod, Callius turned from the sea and released his wings. He and Raiden then left the beach. I stood alone beneath the starry sky, listening to the sound of their wings grow faint. Only when they were completely out of sight did I finally crumble. I fell to my knees and released a strangled cry, my fingers burrowing into the sand. I wept for my brothers and their mates. I wept for me and mine. I wept for the future we'd never have and our broken dreams, like Damon's wish for him and Warren to have a child. Bellamy wanted the same with Phoenix. I hadn't known they desired families of their own, and the realization of how much they'd be giving up only added to my crushing heartache. Once I pulled myself together, I returned to the bungalow. Before meeting with my brothers on the beach, Lazarus and I had made love. It had been gentle at first, but as my heart weighed heavier and heavier with the truth I'd kept from him, I had pushed him to his back and ridden him hard. Even still, he had sat up and taken me in his arms, kissing me softly, as if a part of him knew I hadn't told him everything. Afterward, he'd held me close and pressed kisses into my hair until he'd fallen asleep. As an angel, he didn't need much rest, but when the days caught up to him, he slept deeply. Deep enough for me to sneak out unnoticed, so he wouldn't follow. Where did you go? Lazarus asked in an adorably sleepy voice as I crawled back into bed. He brought me closer and nuzzled my neck. You smell like the sea. I met with my brothers and told them about the vision. He stilled. It required you to speak with them in secret? Yes. We had much to discuss. Then discuss it with me, too, he said. When we face Lucifer again, we do so together. I will fight beside you, watch over you, just as I always have. I pulled back to look at him, storing every detail to memory. The way the moonlight kissed his flawless skin, the gold flakes in his blue eyes, and his cupid bow lips. I traced the edges of them before leaning in and ghosting my mouth across his. He shakily exhaled before melding them together, a soft pressing of his mouth on mine before he deepened it. I know you're keeping something from me, he said telepathically as our lips met again. My heart weighed a thousand pounds. Barbed wire scraped my sternum and plunged to my gut, twisting, gnarling. I broke from his lips with a pained whimper. Alistair. He took my face in both his hands, and the warmth of his palms only worsened the ache in my chest. Because I knew our time, our touches, everything we had in this moment was limited. Tell me, you're a warrior, I said, hating the frailty in my voice. It's all you've known. It's how you've trained me and my brothers to be. Follow orders and put personal feelings aside. Don't let emotion get in the way of the mission. But my throat tightened. What if, to save the world, we had to make the ultimate sacrifice? His breath faltered. What would you tell me then, Les? A tear escaped the corner of my eye. Because I'm so lost right now. Torn between duty and the selfish desires of my heart. Torn between saving the world and wanting to watch it burn, if only to have another moment here with you. What are you saying? Lazarus rolled me to my back and pinned me to the bed. His hand slid to the side of my neck, and although his firm gaze was piercing, that hand shook. A second passed, then another. He searched my face for the answer I couldn't give him. What will happen when you kill Lucifer? Answer me! Just kiss me, I pleaded. I'll tell you everything, I promise. 
but right now I just need you to kiss me. Please. I needed him to make me forget, at least for tonight. Such a stubborn boy. He grabbed my jaw and crushed our lips together, settling between my legs. But I'm your stubborn boy, I told him as we kissed. Only yours. For as long as I lived and long after, I would belong to him. No one else. If only we had more time to... No, don't think about it. Lazarus kissed down my chest as he removed my pants. I was still stretched from when we'd had sex earlier, so after slicking his cock, he positioned it at my opening and eased inside. I stared up at him, loving how a section of his white hair fell forward as he hovered above me. You will tell me. He grabbed both my wrists with one hand and tugged my arms above my head as he penetrated deeper, grazing his teeth up my neck as his hard cock filled me. Yes, I will. I tilted my head back against the pillow, lifting my hips to meet his slow thrusts. But not tonight. Not tonight, he agreed. Tonight, we fly. He was dominant, yet tender. Possessive, yet giving. He kissed me deeply as his hips rocked back and forth. My back arched, and I tested the hold on my wrists, trying to break free. I felt him smile against my lips. Let me touch you, I said. Another soft smile. I didn't hear you say please. Do it now, I told him instead. Pride stirred in my chest, and I imagined him cutting his eyes at our mate. As I've told you many times before. Lazarus pulled nearly all the way out before slamming back into me, grunting under his breath. I don't take orders from you, Pride. It had become our thing. Me trying to boss him around and him putting me back in my place. Secretly, I loved it. I enjoyed giving him control. I enjoyed pressing his buttons, too. But I was too needy right then. Please. I sucked in a breath as he nipped at the sensitive place below my ear. I want to touch you. Lazarus released my wrists and caressed my brow, my cheek, then my lips as his hand trailed back down. The gentle touches contrasted with his hard exterior. His soft kisses did too. They said he treasured me. I treasured him too. My hands landed on his sides, and I moved my fingertips along the grooves of hard muscle as he rocked into me. Our bodies moved as one, joined physically and also on a soul-deep level. I felt all the delicious sensations he elicited as he pumped into me, but I also felt him, his pleasure, his love. The mark I'd placed on his neck told the world he was mine, but God's I was his too. Fly with me, Alistair, he murmured, resting his cheek on mine. And if you fall... Let me fall with you. It wasn't until afterward, when we were basking in our post-orgasm glow, that his words truly sunk in. If I died, he wanted to follow me in death. But my fate was grimmer than that. I burrowed in closer to Lazarus, settling into my favorite place between his arm and side, and pressing my face to his neck. His scent both comforted me and caused a lump to form in my throat. The first icy breath of winter. Crisp apples. I haven't forgotten, he whispered against my temple. I expect an explanation in the morning. I know. I squeezed my eyes shut. And you will not lie to me. Do you understand? Yes. Lazarus tipped my face up and kissed me. His lips lingered on mine as his thumb brushed my cheek. The gentleness of it was bruising. The intimacy of it reminded me of what I'd be sacrificing. The peaceful, simple life I'd yearned for would never come to pass. Lazarus and I wouldn't build a home together. We would never be able to complete our mated bond or deeper explore our relationship. We were just like the snow, 
beautiful and bright, but destined to melt with the passing of winter. Chapter 18 Lazarus Alistair's side of the bed was cold when I woke. I touched his pillow, confused. Where are you? I asked him. His absence caused a sick sinking in my gut. His reluctance to tell me about the vision didn't bode well. Something bad was coming, and until it reached us, I needed him beside me. A light thud sounded from outside. I jumped out of bed, not bothering to get dressed as I left the room. A massive shift from how I'd been not even a month earlier. The changes inside me had come little by little, all because of Alistair. He'd shown me parts of myself I hadn't known existed. He'd shown me what it was like to love another person, even if I hadn't been able to say those words to him yet, with the exception of when it had slipped out once while he was asleep. It's just me, Alistair said, closing the back door as I came into the kitchen. He trailed an appreciative gaze over my body. Quite the greeting. I have half a mind to throw you back in bed and never leave. You didn't answer me. Where were you? It's Christmas Day. He placed a covered pan on the counter. I come bearing gifts. Ray used some of the apples Michael brought from the celestial realm and made apple cinnamon muffins. I thought we could have them for breakfast. To soften the blow before you share the details of the vision. Alistair showed little emotion as he held my stare, which told me just how strongly he was feeling. He hid it all behind a mask of indifference. He lifted the lid on the pan. There's apple fritters, too. In three strides, I was directly in front of him and taking hold of his nape, forcing his eyes up to mine. Enough with the delay tactics. I pressed him against the counter. You're not leaving from this spot until you tell me what I want to know. God's your bossy. He swallowed hard, eyes darting across my face before he looked away. I forced them back to me. I met with my brothers again this morning. We're ready to visit Aza. And we're prepared to do whatever's necessary to win this war. Which means what exactly? I asked, the words sounding more like a growl. Several possibilities ran through my head, but the one I feared most, the one that had me holding him firmer, my chest tightening, a world where he no longer existed, one where he sacrificed himself to save it. Alistair placed a trembling hand on my hip. I think you already know. If your brothers die, their mates die with them. They'd never agree to anything that would harm them. I knew that for certain. The cursed sons were selfless when it came to risking their own lives to save the world, but they wouldn't risk the lives of their mates. Another thought had me pressing closer to him. Or is it only you who must pay such a price? Alistair's life force wasn't joined with mine. We hadn't performed the binding ritual to fully become mates, meaning he was the only one, other than Callius, whose death wouldn't result in someone else's. I wish that were the case, he finally responded. I would gladly lay down my life in exchange for what we must do instead. Something worse than death? He traced the scar on my shoulder, silent. Alistair. Nightfall is more than Aza's soul weapon, he said, not looking at me. He just kept tracing my scar. It's a vessel. As Mephistopheles said, Aza was never meant to be our enemy. The nine of us are all connected. We were meant to join together should Lucifer ever allow his heart to darken to the world. Like a failsafe, I guess. His sins are what will destroy him. I'm not sure I'm following. How does our souls will power the sword? His hand stilled on my shoulder. It's why, as the keeper of the sword, Aza has a piece of each of our sins inside him too. It's why we don't have a physical soul weapon. Because nightfall belongs to all of us. The knot of worry I'd felt upon waking and finding him gone grew right then. Don't you see, Laz? 
When he finally looked up at me again, tears brimmed in his blue eyes. We won't die. Instead, we'll become part of the sword. Eight stones meant for eight souls. I went weak in the knees and braced myself on the counter for support, one hand resting on each side of him. He slowly slid his arms around my waist. It hurt to breathe. Trying to drag air into my lungs was like being buried alive, each inhale suffocating. No, I said. The word was strangled, pained. I crushed him to my chest, my vision blurring as his sweet cedar scent wrapped around me. I won't allow it. We've made our choice, he whispered, and his chin quivered as he pressed his face to my neck. Several paths lead to Lucifer's victory, but only one to his doom, remember? This is the only way. I've seen how it plays out. We will win. But at what cost? I didn't recognize my voice. It was too broken. One my brothers and I are willing to pay. Do I not get a say in this? I withdrew from his embrace and took his face in my hands, his beautifully devastating face that seemed much too resigned in that moment. You always told us we had a purpose. This is it. He flattened his palm over my heart. Put personal feelings aside. Defeating Lucifer is all that matters. Would you go back on your word now? If it means losing you, I... The back of my neck tingled as I sensed another presence, and I spun toward the deck door just as Michael stepped through it. Only when his eyes blew wide did I realize I was still naked. Pardon the intrusion. Michael flipped around, turning his back to me. The tops of his ears blazed red. The council approved the plan to visit Aza. I came to retrieve you. I suppose I should have knocked on the front door instead of letting myself in. You think? Alistair stepped around me, placing himself between me and Michael. We need to discuss boundaries, as in your complete disregard of them. I... Well, yes, I agree, Michael said. If I hadn't been so mortified, I would have found humor in his stammering. I will correct this behavior. He paused. Do I smell pastries? As my Nephilim mate expelled an annoyed sigh and grabbed the pan with the muffins and fritters, I left the kitchen to quickly shower. The discussion wasn't yet over. But first, we needed to visit Aza to see if he was even willing to hand over Nightfall. His cooperation was vital. Although I'd never admit it out loud because it went against everything I stood for, everything I'd fought for, a very small part of me hoped he would refuse. No sword meant Alistair and the boys wouldn't be forced to merge their souls with it. The world would fall to ruin beneath Lucifer's heel, but at least I'd still be able to hold Alistair, to feel his beating heart and the tickle of his breath on my skin. It was the type of thinking that had led to the fall of so many angels, choosing something, someone, over the well-being of the realms. As a sudden wave of anxiety crashed into me, I slumped against the shower wall. My wings would be stripped if I allowed myself to be driven by such selfishness. But if it meant saving the man I loved, would I care? If you don't hurry, there won't be any breakfast left for you, Alistair told me. This overgrown toddler is eating all your muffins. His voice broke through my whirlwind of thoughts, pulling me from the dark place they'd been spiraling toward. Save me a fritter, I responded. I may very well strangle him if he eats them all. I'd enjoy seeing that. Despite the heavy achiness in my heart, I smiled. Behave. Get in here and make me. After finishing my shower, I grabbed a towel and dried off before dressing, foregoing a shirt as usual. Then, I joined my mate and my best friend for Christmas breakfast, pretending for just that moment that nothing else mattered. The celestial prison housed very few cells, fifty at most, mainly because most angels who committed acts to warrant being imprisoned normally found themselves cast out instead. 
The cells were intended to hold dangerous enemies, who were swiftly disposed of once questioned, and for angels serving sentences for minor infractions. At one time, I had locked Galen in one. It had been after his lover Marcus was killed by demons in the days of ancient Rome, and he'd lost control over wrath. Not only had he slaughtered the demons responsible, as well as any others he'd come across, but he had also harmed humans during his rampage. The cell had been the only thing strong enough at the time to contain him. That blinding rage had nearly resulted in his death. As we walked down the corridor toward Aza's cell, Galen stared straight ahead, jaw tight and eyes hard. Was he remembering too? Gray latched onto his arm, and he relaxed a little. Simon hadn't come with us, none of the mates had, but Gray had a way of soothing all the brothers. What if he tells us to fuck off? Castor asked. We could torture him, Bellamy suggested. The bastard deserves it. Alistair walked beside me, close enough that our arms brushed. Aza is clever. He knows if he doesn't help us, he'll rot in that cell forever. But he's petty enough to make us work for it. What do you propose we do? Michael asked. The few times I visited him, he didn't say a word. He only smirked at me. Sounds like him, the smug bastard, Bellamy muttered. What I wouldn't give to slice that smirk right off his face. It'd be an improvement. He has each of our sins inside him, Alistair said to Michael. That's the angle we'll work with. Stroke his ego, but not too much, or he'll think we're desperate and say no just because it amuses him. I'm not stroking anything of his, Gray said. He's a butthead who killed Dino Pete. Dino Pete? Michael looked at the smaller male. A friend of yours? Gray's wild blonde hair bounced a little as he nodded. I adopted him from Simon's antique shop. He was the best dickosaurus who ever lived. He burned up in the fire when Aza attacked our mansion. I have Dino Steve now. I love him, but you never forget your first, you know? Michael's confusion only grew. What is a dickosaurus? I'll show you when we get back to the island. Gray patted his arm. If you're nice, I might even let you have one of your very own since it's Christmas. I have a whole army of them. Speaking of the holiday, Raiden said, when we're done here, maybe we can have a small Christmas feast. Smoked ham, sage dressing, and green bean casserole. Oreo balls and a chocolate pecan pie for dessert. That sounds delicious, Michael said. Getting back on track... Alistair glanced at his gluttonous brother before returning his gaze to Michael. Asa's pride, wrath, and envy will be the most vulnerable right now. We'll use his anger and bitterness toward Lucifer to our advantage. Michael gave an impressed nod. You sound as if you really know how he thinks. Reading people is what I was trained for. Alistair moved a bit closer to me. I had a damn good teacher. I fought a smile. Sconces with eternal flames flickered along the walls. It was the only light, apart from the half-moon-shaped window at the end of the corridor, that allowed sunlight to filter in, though not enough to make the prison any less dreary. We passed a set of stone steps that led to the section of cells underground. The dungeon cell block was intended for only the most powerful prisoners. That didn't include Aza. Since his resurrection, he had lost all his powers, the Morning Star's blood still ran through his veins, but he had no magic or any of the abilities that had given me and the boys a headache during his very short reign as king of the underworld. Here we are, Michael said as we reached the cell at the end. The cells in the dungeon had heavy doors to cage the prisoners, but the ones on this level only had bars. The bars were made of celestial steel and had warding wrapped around them that prevented the prisoner from breaking or slipping past them. Aza sat against the wall in the corner with his eyes closed and one arm resting on his raised knee. His long black hair was tangled and a bit greasy. Grime stained his cheeks. Oh, joy, he said as he opened his eyes. The crimson shade of them dimly glowed from the shadows. 
How lucky am I to see all your lovely faces again. That was sarcasm, by the way. You've seen better days, Casta said. Definitely not as pretty. I'd say this look suits him, Bellamy said. It's a better reflection of who he is on the inside. Filthy. Vile. You always had a way with words, Lust. Aza's lips curved into a half-smile. Tell me, how is our demon phoenix doing these days? Still feisty? That's none of your business. It was my business for a while, Aza responded. I miss the sensation of pushing my cock into his tight ass. Total bliss, am I right? And his raspy moans when I angled my hips just right. Gods, I'm getting hard just thinking about it. You motherfucker! Bellamy slammed his hands against the boss. Get the fuck over here! I'm going to tear you- Bellamy, Alistair said with authority ringing clear in his tone. Back off. A direct order. Instantly, Bellamy's mouth snapped shut and he took a step back. Damon grabbed his arm but glared at Aza. Other than the obvious reasons, both of them despised the son of Lucifer. He had gone after both of their mates. Alistair looked at Aza. Another comment like that from you, and we'll leave you here to rot. Then tell me why you've come to visit me in this hellhole. Aza made an attempt to fix his hair. Did seeing Alistair cause the piece of pride he also carried to stir in his chest? Make himself conscious about his unkempt appearance. We have a proposal for you. Alistair kept a cool tone, giving nothing away. I'm listening. Lucifer has waged war on the human realm. As we speak, his army is burning cities to the ground, slaughtering humans and paving the way for his ascension. Aza breathed out a laugh. Am I supposed to care about this? Yes, Alistair answered without missing a beat. We want your help to stop him. Surely you're joking. Aza pushed to his feet, using the wall for support. His imprisonment had weakened him further. That weakness didn't affect his cocky grin, though, as he stepped closer to the boss. Why would I ever help you, Pride? Why would I want to? Because for once, our goals align. Our goals? Aza's cocky demeanor waned. And what might that be? Lucifer's defeat. The opportunity to best him. Alistair stepped up to the boss, and I fought the urge to yank him away. The prisoner could do no harm while locked up, but I hated them being so close. He raised you as a lamb for slaughter never showing you love or affection. He didn't bat an eye when you were sacrificed to release him from the cage. If for no other reason, surely you want to get revenge for his callousness and neglect toward you as a father. Aza rested his hands on the bars and tapped a finger against one. Why come to me for help? In case you forgot, I have no power. He scowled as the words left his lips hit to his pride, I was sure. Recently, I learned something interesting, Alistair told him, still keeping a cool and calm composure. He truly was spectacular, in every way. You, me, and my brothers, we weren't meant to be at odds. Fate wanted us to unite. Pfft, like that would ever happen, Aza said with a scoff. You hero types grate on my damn nerves. So much power and potential, yet you hide in the shadows and protect the pathetic humans who care more about murdering each other than living in the perfect world you wish for it to be. Better to let them all die. You sound like Lucifer. Asa's grip tightened on the boss. I'm better than my father. Then prove it, Alistair baited him. Agree to work with us and show him that you're better. You'll also get the opportunity to take vengeance against Belphegor for his betrayal. Ah, oh, so tempting. 
This thing you learned about us. Asa's indecisive stare flickered from Alistair to the other cursed sons. Is it why I share your sins? Yes. And somehow, we're supposed to join forces and defeat my father? Yes. A hint of a smile formed on Aza's lips. So you need me. Need? Alistair returned that cunning smile. Don't flatter yourself too much. We came to you because your help would make our jobs easier, but we don't need you. There are other ways to defeat Lucifer. More of a bother, sure, but we'll manage. If you refuse, we'll simply leave and enjoy a nice Christmas feast while you pace the confines of this dirty cell alone. Aza's smile faded. Let's say I do agree. Would it get me out of this prison? Alistair looked at me. If it were my decision, I'd keep you locked away for the rest of your days, I said. But fortunately for you, Michael is the one who oversees the prisoners and decides their fate. Michael was silent for a moment. Cooperate, and we'll discuss a possible release at the conclusion of the war. Then, no, Aza answered. A possible release sometime in the distant future isn't good enough. You want my help? You'll give me something that will benefit me now. How about a bath? Castor asked. Because, dude, you smell like ass. Galen stepped forward, bringing a wave of rippling anger with him. He grabbed the balls and snarled. You want something that will benefit you? How about keeping your head attached? Aza backed away. It was clear he was thankful for those bars separating them right then. Still a violent beast, I see. And here I thought my great-great-whatever-the-fuck-he-is nephew helped calm that ferocity. His name's Simon, Gray said. And he's the most awesome human ever, right along with my mason. Simon was related to Asa on his maternal side. He didn't share Lucifer's blood, but his connection to Aza was what dragged him into this conflict with us. Though I suppose fate was more to blame, it was what brought him to Galen. You're in no position to make demands, Alistair said. However, I'm sure an arrangement can be made that will at least make your situation better, should you cooperate. The son of Lucifer sighed and fingered the messy strands of his hair. Fine. Tell me how you think I can help and I'll consider it. Your sword, I said. My sword? What about it? It has the ability to kill Lucifer, Alistair answered. But only when my brothers and I lend some of our power. That's how we'll work together to beat him. Was it wise to tell him that? I asked my mate. Yes, he would see through a lie. I had to give him just enough of the actual truth for him to believe me. Interesting. Aza slowly paced in front of the bars, but stayed far enough away to prevent the still-snarling Galen from reaching him. Belphegor said my sword was useless, which was how he convinced me to search for Lightbringer. He stopped pacing and turned toward Alistair. Are you saying that was another manipulation? In that instant, Aza seemed so young. Despite being thousands of years old, he had only been around nineteen when placed inside of the ring. When he emerged, he still had the mind of a nineteen-year-old. He'd been impressionable and naive, and Belphegor had used it to his advantage. A manipulation? Yes, Alistair responded. However, he was partly right. Your sword's true strength can only be awoken by us. You're the keeper of it, but we're the powering force. What will my role be in this? Aza asked. As I said, I lost my powers, my strength. I refuse to be the one putting myself on the front line while you and your meathead minions stand back and watch. I'll wield the sword, Alistair said. All you have to do is hand it over. Aza's expression turned suspicious. How? 
Soul weapons can only be used by the soul they belong to, or someone who shares their blood, like how I could wield Lightbringer, despite it being my father's weapon. All sins, Alistair explained. You share a piece of each of them. This connection allows any of us to wield it. All you want me to do is summon it and give it to you? Not to fight. Correct. Aza's gaze dotted around his cell. What happens if I say no? You stay here, Michael said. This offer will only come this once. You won't get another. Fine. I'll help. But, Aza held up a finger. Before I give you my sword, I want out of here. Until the conclusion of the war, when my possible release will be discussed, I want to spend my imprisonment in comfort. A hot bath, raspberry-filled donuts, and a warm bed to sleep in. No more dirty cells and disgusting meals. Those are my conditions. Raspberry-filled donuts? Raiden asked. I have a recipe for those. Of course he did. Michael carefully considered his request. Very well. I agree to these terms. You'll be moved to a room in the palace with guards outside the door at all times. You'll also wear strength-suppressing cuffs and be restricted from leaving the room. But your time will be spent in comfort. Bellamy's mouth clamped shut, and he ground his molars together. Alistair looked at him, and I knew they were speaking telepathically. Living in comfort was the last thing Aza deserved, but it was the price for his cooperation. Excellent, Aza said. Let's not waste more time standing here. Take me to my room, and you'll get the sword. This is certain, Michael asked as we stood beside the lake. The boys had returned to the island with nightfall, and we'd stayed in the celestial realm to tell the council of the bargain we'd struck with Aza who now sat comfortably in the palace. I had just told Michael what Alistair shared about the vision of Lucifer's death, and in a way, it was the death of the boys, too. Not dead, but not truly alive, either. Yes, I answered. They will merge with nightfall. Then we'll release their souls from the stones afterward, Michael nodded to himself. Problem solved. It will only be a temporary housing, like with Aza and the ring. I had also considered that option, until I'd realized the truth. I fear that won't work. Sorrow filled my chest, made it heavy. When Belphegor placed Aza's soul in the ring, it was a containment spell. The ring didn't possess any power of its own, and wasn't meant to be a weapon. This will be different. The spell needed will infuse their life force with the sword. And once joined, it can't be undone. It was like pouring water from a spring into a larger pool of water and then trying to scoop it back out. Once added, it would be nearly impossible to separate it again. Nothing is impossible, Michael said after a short while. I don't believe the fates would bring you and Alistair together only to tear you apart so soon. There's a way around this, and we'll find it. For a warrior, you lean heavily on emotion rather than logic. A great warrior must have both. His brown hair had grown out a bit over the past month, and the strands ruffled with the breeze. I pass down judgments based on the facts presented to me, but emotion must come into play as well. Otherwise, I'll forget myself. A cold, unfeeling heart leads to cold deeds and wickedness. Too kind of a heart leads to catastrophe. The balance of the two is fundamental. My house sat on the border between the autumn and winter areas of the realm. It was my favorite weather, not too warm or too chilly, but somewhere in between. I found little enjoyment in it that day. My eyes burned, and I told myself it was due to the crisp air. I can't lose him, Michael. Alistair's mating mark tingled on my neck. I placed a hand over it as the burning in my eyes worsened. How will I stand by and let him do this? It's a no-win situation, he answered. 
But, as painful as it may be, you mustn't interfere with the plan. Sparing him will allow Lucifer to continue his conquest of the human realm, resulting in the possible end of mankind. I know. His brown eyes moved to me. You've contemplated it, haven't you? My heart rate skyrocketed. Admitting it to him could be seen as an act of attempted treason on our realm, a punishable offense that would have me thrown into the same dingy cell Aza had been in. But this was my best friend. My only friend, really. Yes, I've contemplated it, I confessed. I imagined taking Alistair far from this war, even if it meant Lucifer's victory. You speak of logic and emotion, and after learning what must be done, I battled between the two. Defeat Lucifer for the good of the realm and lose my mate in the process, or abandon my duty and protect him instead. Protect all of them. All of my boys. Boys who had grown to be the greatest warriors I'd ever known. And yet, you brought Alistair and the boys here, so they could retrieve the same sword you fear will become their tomb. A tear slipped from my eye. Yes. I don't fault you, brother. Michael squeezed my shoulder before lowering his hand again and resting it on the railing. I've grown attached to the Nephilim in my short time with them on the island. They are good boys with good hearts. They deserve much more than this life has given them. Which is why, even if you or I try to stop them, they wouldn't change course. They've made their choice. We must respect their decision. You should throw me in a cell for that admission. Here you are comforting me instead. Yes, well, you're my best friend. And I know your heart. Michael softly smiled. It's also a fine example of how I balance logic and emotion. Uriel, who rules with an iron fist and gives little mercy to those who step out of line, would punish you for even thinking such a thing. But I see the surrounding circumstances and the reason behind your thoughts. You love Alistair. I do, I whispered. What an irritating emotion love is. If given the choice, would you stop loving him? No. Loving Alistair had opened my eyes and heart to so many wonderful things. I didn't feel as cold. About this morning, Michael's cheeks turned a dark shade of pink. I apologize. This morning? It took me a moment to remember, and when I did, my face heated. He'd seen me naked. Oh, that... A deep laugh rumbled in his chest. <laughs> yes, that. I will make an effort to knock next time. You're mated now. He threw an arm around my shoulders and shook me from side to side. My dearest friend is all grown up. Enough. I swatted him away but smiled as I did. We should rejoin the boys. They're expecting us for dinner. Then let's go, he said. We mustn't keep them or the delicious food waiting. Colorful lights greeted us as Michael and I returned to the island that evening. Strings of red, green, and blue lights had been hung around Baxter's villa. Twinkling clear lights had been draped over bushes and wrapped around tree trunks. From inside the house, a decorated Christmas tree glowed. How festive, Michael beamed before opening the door and going inside. I took a moment to pull myself together before stepping in behind him. When Raiden mentioned having a Christmas feast earlier, the suggestion hadn't been because of gluttony and his cravings. Raiden had realized this would be their last holiday together, with each other, with their mates, and he'd wanted one last Christmas for them to laugh, eat, and visit as a family. Lazarus Angel Boy McGee! Clara exclaimed from the living room couch, cuddling against Serena. A big red bow was on top of her blonde hair, the type meant for presents. About time you joined us. We were about to eat without you. Enough with that nickname, woman. It's Christmas. I can call you what I want. The witch stuck her tongue out at me. 
Her flushed cheeks told me she'd gotten into the wine, though not enough to turn her into a slobbering drunk. It just made her perkier. Cheekier, too. Room for one more, I hope, Michael asked. It smells incredible in here. Of course, Pennymule responded as he closed his laptop and stood from the recliner. The sight of him didn't anger me nearly as much these days. Perhaps because after being tempted with my own desires, I somewhat understood what led to his fall. He'd wanted freedom. Ray didn't even let me help with the cooking. And Penn didn't burn anything this time. Gray latched onto Pennymule's arm and swung a bit. He wore an ugly Christmas sweater with a glitter reindeer on the front. An animated sloth, also in a Christmas sweater, rode on the reindeer's back and carried a bag of presents. He can do more than write books and eat bagels now. I'm so proud of him. Flashing an awkward smile, Penemule adjusted his glasses and continued toward the kitchen, carrying Gray along with him. Mason met them halfway, and Gray moved from one male to the other, just like the animal on his sweater. Greetings, Captain, Dargan said once spotting Michael. The warrior, who normally kept a stern expression, smiled warmly. You must try the eggnog. Human alcohol had no effect on angels, but adding ambrosia definitely made it more potent and could intoxicate us if we consumed too much, as the warrior was on his way to doing. Yes, Evangelos, a warrior from my unit, said. He hiccuped. It's delicious. Lead the way, Michael told them. I must try it. Me too, Nico said, running after the three of them. The young Nephilim also wore an ugly Christmas sweater, though his depicted a glittery Christmas tree with small puffballs attached to the branches to act as ornaments. The tree wore sunglasses and had the phrase, All jingle your bells, at the top. Absolutely not. Titan grabbed Nico by the back of his sweater to stop him. You're not old enough. I'm old enough to fight, Nico countered. I should be old enough to down some spiked eggnog, too. It's not like I haven't done it before. Just ask the guys in the barracks. We have a good time. Is that so? Titan was unimpressed. Remind me to order you all to run drills at first light. Perhaps that will teach you to behave. Nico pouted at him, then smiled before shouting, Raiden, Titan's being mean to me. He won't let me have any eggnog. Serena glanced at him over her shoulder. Child, listen to your father. Titan's stern demeanor slipped. Being called Nico's father brought a small smile to his lips. Food's done, Raiden called from the kitchen, then poked his head around the archway. Everyone, come get you some grub. He grinned at Titan and Nico. Is someone being a tattletale in here? Don't you know snitches get stitches? Titan's booming laugh sounded as he and Nico walked that way. As everyone crammed into the kitchen, I glanced around the living room, then down the hall. Looking for me? I turned to see Alistair standing at the foot of the stairs. He must have just come from the second floor. Most of his belongings were still at the villa, with the exception of the few clothes and books he'd brought to the bungalow. More books than clothes. Always, I responded, taking in his appearance. His hair was fixed in a sophisticated yet casual style with the top combed back, and he wore a long-sleeved navy blue sweater with a white-collared shirt beneath it. Fitted dark wash jeans complemented his long legs. You look... handsome. He closed the distance between us. Breathtaking. Butter me up a little. Pride demands compliments. I lightly grazed the backs of my knuckles over his cheek. I will if you're good. I suppose I need to be extra good then. Alistair ran his hands up my bare chest before resting them at my nape. One day I'll get you into a suit. Hey, don't glare at me like that. You can't walk around shirtless forever. I can and I will. I caught him around the waist, and he rewarded me with a crinkly-eyed smile that hit me right in the heart. However, for you, I will consider this request. So formal. His fingers played with the back of my hair. You need some of Raiden's eggnog. Dargan and Evangelos can't get enough of it, so it's Angel approved. You seem different tonight. Do I? He smiled again. How so? 
The reason for the change struck me, and it was like a dagger to my heart. You seem happy. His pale blue eyes searched my face. Unlike you, you look like you're seconds from falling apart. Little did he know I'd already fallen apart, many times. But I kept pulling myself back together again. Something I would no longer be able to do the moment his soul exited his body and went into the sword. The moment he left me. Forgive me if I'm not in the holiday spirit. I find little worthy of celebrating today. Why not? Today was a success, he said, eyes bright. Pride more than likely aided in his good mood, pleased by that success. Aza gave us nightfall. All we need now is to prepare the spell. I'll speak to Clara about it tomorrow. Will she be performing the incantation? Yes. That excitement in his eyes dimmed a little. Well, that's my hope. I haven't asked her yet. In the vision, I heard chanting. It was her voice, so I'm confident she'll agree. She's a powerful witch. If anyone can do it, it's her. He smirked. She'd love to hear you say that. I forbid you from telling her, I grumbled. Face it. Alistair nestled in closer to my chest. You're one of her boys. Your family. Family. The word touched me much deeper than I expected. But as I held Alistair, I realized that's what we were. He was my fated mate, but his brothers meant so much to me as well. And yes, the witch too. I understand now why Clara came into our lives, he added, his voice softer. Everything that's happened has been leading to this final confrontation with Lucifer. The final confrontation. As a strand of his bangs slipped from its hold, I brushed it aside, my heart squeezing. I wish it would never come. I saw it then, a slight quiver of his chin, a cracking of his mask. Don't think about tomorrow, or any of the days that follow. I want to spend this Christmas with those I love, happy and not stressing over what I can't change. He pushed his face to my neck. Stay in this moment with me, Laz. I'm here. I rested my cheek on his head. Nowhere else. Hey, you two, Castor said from the archway. Stop with the lovey-dovey shit and come make your plates. Ray won't let anyone eat until you do. Being spoken to like that came as a slight shock. In the past, the Nephilim brothers had either said nothing in my presence, watched their tone if they did, or told me off on a few occasions. But now, Castor spoke to me like I was just another of the mates. You're smiling, Alistair said with an awed expression. My palm slid against his as I linked our fingers. Maybe I'm happy too. That crinkly-eyed smile returned. I'm glad. Know what would make me glad? Cast a motion to the dining room. If you'd get your asses in here, I'm hungry. Yeah, Gray bounced up beside him. Unless meanie Laz is too good to eat all this yummy human food. I felt my smile widen. I both loved and hated the feelings blossoming in my chest. But instead of dwelling on the bleak future, I led Alistair into the dining room to join the others. Talk of the war would cease for the rest of the evening. Tonight would be spent with each other. Everything else could wait. Chapter 19 Alistair Nightfall's obsidian blade shone like glass, smooth and glossy. Shadows moved along the razor-sharp edge, traveling up to the black hilt, where eight clear stones rested. I ghosted my fingers over them as a chill settled deep in my core. Lazarus tensed beside me, staring at the stones too. I don't like that thing. Gray sat on the rug, his arms around Callius's leg, who stood beside him. It gives off dark energy. Nightfall, Damon said. Guess they don't call it that just for shits and giggles. 
We had gathered in Baxter's study that morning, my brothers, Lazarus, Michael, Baxter, Serena, and Clara. Their mates hadn't been allowed in the meeting, which had understandably caused suspicion to arise. My brothers still hadn't told them the truth of what we had to do. They didn't know how. If Lazarus hadn't pushed me like he had, I wouldn't have known how to tell him either. This is amazing, Clara sat at the desk, flipping through the thick book of spells Michael had brought from the celestial realm. It contained the spell we needed, one not easily attained since it was more or less forbidden. Necromancy? Love potions? Not that I need that. Hexes? Wow. In the wrong hands, this spellbook would be very, very bad. Yes, very, Michael said. Which is why it was confiscated from a coven of dark witches centuries ago and placed in the celestial vault so it could never be used again. She glanced up at him, her blonde hair spilling over one shoulder. And you trust me with it? I do. No hesitation. A golden aura surrounds you. Your magic is warm and calming. The markings of a healer. She healed me. Gray touched the scar across his neck. The memory of him lying on the stairs in our mansion, his throat slit with a celestial blade, still pained me. It was also the first time I had started to trust Clara. She'd saved my brother. Me too, Castor added. She's patched me up too, Bellamy. Me as well, Lazarus said. When all eyes moved to him, he snarled his upper lip. What? Unable to contain my smile, I stepped away from the sword and rested my head on his shoulder. He slipped an arm around my waist, and there was a light pressure to my hair. A kiss. Damon arched a brow. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll get used to that anytime soon. I find it sweet, Callius said. Sweet? Castor rolled his eyes. That's a word I'd never think to use for Lazarus. Sour, maybe. Actually, he's sweet with a slight tautness, I said. Like freshly picked apples on a crisp morning. Laz tastes like apples? Gray asked. Gross. Michael laughed. He enjoyed it when Lazarus was the target of jokes. You say it's an energy transfer spell? Oh, I think I found it. Clara wiggled excitedly in her chair. She then cocked her head to the side, stilling. Wait. This says soul transfer. I thought you were transferring some of your energy. Baxter had reclined on the leather couch and sat up. Interest peaked. Serena seemed equally perplexed. They didn't know either, but they were about to find out. What I say must stay in this room, I said. It's a sensitive matter and must be kept between us. You have my word, Serena nodded. Just spill it, Pride, Baxter said, his mismatched eyes tapering. However, before I got the chance to answer, Clara gasped and pushed back from the desk. I just read what this spell does. She slammed her hands on top of the book, her expression somewhere between shock and anger. You're out of your damn mind if you expect me to help you do it. Do what? Baxter asked. Our souls will be merged with nightfall, I explained. We will become part of the sword. That's what will give it the power to kill Lucifer. Okay. Baxter tugged a hand through his pink and black hair. So you'll be sucked into the sword, and then released once the job's done? No. I pressed closer to Lazarus, suddenly feeling a bit weak in the knees. My gaze trailed back to the sword. Our souls will fill the stones in the hilt, and remain there. Maybe I can undo the spell once Lucifer's dead and return your souls to your body. Clara flipped through the book again, her hands shaking. Tears flooded her green eyes. Damn it, there has to be a way. It's magic for crying out loud. The spell is forbidden for a reason, Lazarus said, and his arm tightened around me. Because once cast, it can't be undone. Then I won't do it, Clara said, slamming the book shut. Lucifer can take over the world, I don't care. I'm not losing my boys. But you gotta. Gray stood from the rug and padded over to her. She threw her arms around him and hid her face in his tousled blonde hair. You're the only one who can do this. 
She only squeezed him tighter, said nothing, but I knew she would agree. I had seen it, after all. Every excruciating detail. Your mates don't know, do they? Baxter asked. That's why you want us to keep it quiet. Bellamy gripped the key around his neck, something he often did when thinking of his demon. No. They don't know. Don't you think you should tell them? Castor fidgeted with his golden dagger. And tell them what, exactly? Hey, we're going to sacrifice ourselves to save the world, but we won't die. It'll just seem like we did. God damn it! He threw the dagger, lodging it into the wall in front of him, and slumped forward on the couch, hands going over his face. I hate this! Baxter looked at the dagger jutting from the wall. I was sure he'd give Castor shit for it later, but he held his tongue for now. Clara kissed Gray on the cheek before pulling away and turning her back to us as she wiped at her face. Serena rested a hand on Clara's side, her expression sympathetic. It was rare to see Serena show any kind of softness, much like the angel at my side. I pressed my face into Lazarus's neck, breathing him in. You seem so happy, Al, Bellamy told me telepathically. I looked at him. He stood across the room beside Damon. Both stared at me. Just as you all are happy with your mates. Galen growled. If we're done here, I'm leaving. He stormed toward the door and slammed it on his way out. Beneath his angry outburst, I felt his heartache. Time with our mates was drawing to an end, and he didn't want to waste a second with Simon. Damon looked as if he wanted to leave too, but he stayed in place. He and Warren couldn't be apart for long before he became restless, even more so now. How long do I have to decide? Clara asked. I'm not sure, I answered. In the vision, the battle took place beneath a moonless sky. There were stars, though. No clouds. So, a new moon? Clara's brow pulled together as she thought. I'll need to check my lunar calendar to see when the next one is. But was there still snow on the ground? Yes. She grabbed her phone off the desk and tapped at the screen. After a minute or so, she made a face. Hmm. What is it? Gray popped up beside her to peek at her phone. Oh, no pictures, just boring words. December has two new moons this year, she explained. It's kind of rare for two to fall in the same month. We refer to the second as a black moon. This black moon is special? Michael asked. Oh, yeah. Clara flashed an incredulous smile. Like super freaking special. Any spells performed on the night of a black moon are more potent. When does it take place? I asked. She checked her phone again. The black moon will occur during the final hours of December 31st. Holy shit, you guys, this is big. As she gushed, Serena's features softened. Not a smile, but almost. Clara's excitement bubbled over as she continued, flinging one hand around as she talked. A black moon is rare in and of itself, but this one will straddle the line between this year and the next, meaning the energy will be off the charts during this black moon. My mind wandered back to the vision. I saw the moonless sky, the snow-covered ground, and armies clashing. In my gut, I knew the truth. That's when we'll face Lucifer, I said. During the black moon. Lazarus dragged in a shaky breath. That's four days from now. Five, if you consider the daylight hours leading up to then. Callius placed a hand on the mantle above the hearth and stared at the dying flames of the fire. Bellamy slowly slid down the wall and rested his head against Damon's leg. Were you able to see the location? Michael asked me. I shook my head. The details outside of us fighting Lucifer were fuzzy. I only saw the snow and sky. Though something about the landscape was familiar. Back in Hoya Bashu? Damon suggested. Another attempt for him to use the Nexus? Could be, I answered. I took Lazarus's hand without even thinking about it. Would I ever be ready to say goodbye to him? He brought me closer. 
Nothing was said between us, but as I stood against his body, our hearts beating together, I felt the things he didn't say. I hoped he felt what I didn't say either. Things I wanted to tell him, but would break me right then if I tried. Will you be able to perform the spell on such short notice? Michael asked Clara. Ingredients are needed to cast it, but we should have time to gather them before then. I still haven't agreed to help. But even as the words left her mouth, she returned to her chair and scooted closer to the desk, opening the book. You're all pains in my ass. Love you too, little girl, Raiden said, his smile not reaching his eyes. Now, give us the deets. What do we need for the spell? Wolfsbane? Vampire fangs? Or werewolf fur? Gray chimed in. Dead man's shoes? Silver coins for the ferryman? He made a blink noise as he touched both of his eyes. Our toenails? Let's see. She browsed the ingredients before grabbing a notepad and jotting down a list. Some of this I have in my personal supply at Ravenwood. Black sand, lilac, and dried rose petals. But I'll also need blood from each of you. What else? I asked. She ran a finger down the list and nodded to herself. Nothing too extreme. Your names, written on century-old paper that's then burned over a black candle. Since Nightfall is Aza's soul weapon, I'll need something of his, too. Hair, blood, eyelashes, anything, really. Just something that will bind your energy to that of the swords. I can acquire that for you the next time I return to the Celestial Realm, Michael said, then looked at Raiden. Perhaps you wouldn't mind making more raspberry donuts for him as payment? Prisoner or not, I don't fancy the idea of taking it from him by force. Sure. Raiden smiled at Lazarus. Should I make more apple fritters while I'm at it? Lazarus quietly cleared his throat and subtly shifted his weight to his other foot. Make it or don't. It matters little to me. Liar, I projected into his head. I'm sure you got hard as soon as he said the word apple. Watch that mouth, he responded, cutting his eyes over at me. Or you'll do what? Keep being sassy and you'll find out. Sassy? I'm a good boy. He smirked. Then, like a good boy, I expect you to find a better use for that mouth. My stomach fluttered and my cock twitched. Damn him. Ah, Clara said, drawing my attention back to her. We'll also need the essence of an ancient one. Ancient one? Hmm. Could be referring to any kind of immortal, to be honest. Vampires, Serena said. Not a low-level leech, either. Ancient vampires have extraordinary power. Hallucinogenic properties, ability to grant immortality and heal the fatally wounded. Some legends claim vampires evolved from the offspring of fallen angels and demons. So the ancient ones, whose bloodline is less muddied, are said to have both celestial and demonic power running through their veins making them desirable and highly sought after among spellcasters who require great strength. Clara smiled at her. It turns me on that you know that. Well, I've hunted them long enough, Serena said. Among other monsters. Still hot. A smirk upturned the edge of the female warrior's lips. If the final ingredient is the essence of an ancient vampire, I suppose we're in luck. I turned to Lazarus. We need to go to Crave. The nightclub for the damned sat on the outskirts of Echo Bay, situated among abandoned warehouses and a dense forest. It was a safe place for all supernatural beings to gather, regardless of species, a haven for those in need of an escape, a party for those with pent-up energy, and racing libidos, or merely a place for us to go without needing to hide ourselves. Freedom. That's what Crave offered. It was the vision Connor had when he created the club. Party time! Casta bounced through the parking lot, jabbing at the air with his fists. Idiot. Keo shook his head with a smile. But he's my idiot. I planned to meet with Connor, so Michael had teleported us to the club using his ring. My brothers would be there if I needed them, but I told them to enjoy themselves. They had brought their mates. Four days were all we had left, if I was correct about the black moon. 
which, considering the rarity of it and the effect it had on magic, I knew Lucifer would use it for a spell, like he'd attempted to do in Hoya Bashu before we stopped him. While mankind rang in the new year, we'd be fighting for our lives beneath a winter sky. And then, as one year welcomed the next, our souls would leave our bodies, and Lucifer would draw his final breath. Oh, the memories, Bellamy said as we neared the club entrance. Do you miss it? Phoenix frowned at the pavement. All the fun you had here? Bellamy grabbed his hand. Not even a little. I never thought I'd find someone who accepted me, who loved me. This place helped soothe my loneliness and gave lust his fix, but that emptiness never fully went away. He stopped and faced his mate, touching the demon's collar. Until I met you. You sap. Phoenix swatted at Bellamy with his tail before continuing toward the front door. He was smiling, though. Now come buy your gorgeous husband a drink before I start chucking fireballs at the place. Bellamy stared after him, his heart aching so much I felt it through our connection. I didn't need to read his mind to know his thoughts. He dreaded the moment he had to tell Phoenix about the soul transfer. With so little time left, it needed to be soon. Damon and Warren entered the club behind him, followed by Gray, who clung to Mason's back. Nick, the bouncer, tipped his head to them. Spotting Michael and Lazarus, the werewolf balked and muttered as we passed, A goddamn archangel. That's something I don't see every day. Once we were inside, Lazarus shifted a gaze throughout the club. Half-naked bodies swayed on the dance floor, music boomed through the speakers, and sweet scents perforated the air, a mixture of drinks, perfume, and the pheromones of those engaged in sex. Some against walls, on the couch in the corner, and one couple fucked in the cage above the dance floor. Repulsive, he looked at Michael. I apologize that you have to come to a place like this. No apology is necessary, Michael responded, also taking in the atmosphere, though he did so with interest rather than disgust. Demons are welcomed here too. Connor appeared beside us. All are welcome here. Demons, reapers, shifters. His purple-eyed gaze roamed over Michael's body. Angels. You must be Connor. I'm Michael. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us. The pleasure is all mine, I assure you. Connor gave him another once-over before turning to me. About time you came to visit me. This level of neglect of our friendship has wounded me deeply. Do forgive me for focusing on the war instead of you, old friend, I told him. How unspeakable of me. What do you say we retire to the private lounge and catch up over a drink? Connor smirked before drawing me in for a short embrace. When we pulled apart, I noticed Lazarus glaring daggers at him. For quite some time, he had seemed to dislike my friend. Any time I had mentioned Connor in the past, Lazarus had been grumpier than usual. Laz is so fucking jealous right now, Damon told me using our mind link. He and Warren stood beside the bar, waiting on their drinks, club soda for the ice dragon, and my brother had ordered a vodka cranberry. I can feel his bitterness toward Connor. You should give Con a kiss on the cheek just to fuck with him, Bellamy added. Twenty bucks says Laz will punch Connor in the throat, Casta said. Only twenty bucks? Raiden chimed in. You're cheap tonight. All of you get out of my head. Connor offered a hand to Lazarus. It's nice to see you again. He had the ability to read people's thoughts, even mine. However, he respected my privacy and didn't intentionally do so. But could he read the minds of angels, too? Nice is an interesting word choice, Lazarus responded, looking at his outstretched hand but not taking it. Connor withdrew his hand. Pardon, my friend here. Michael gripped Lazarus's shoulder and shook him. He's forgotten his manners. Manners? Lazarus's scowl deepened. Says the one who has no sense of personal space and barges in whenever and wherever he wants. Amusement shone in Connor's purple eyes as they shifted to me. He motioned to the door to the VIP area. 
shall we? I nodded and walked with him in that direction. The angels walked with me, weaving through the dancing bodies. You could have accepted his hand, I told Lazarus. He didn't respond, but his jaw tightened. I turned my face away from him so he wouldn't see my smile. I got a weird satisfaction from his jealousy. It made me think of how I'd been toward Michael in the beginning, jealous of their closeness and irritated by the idea of anything more than friendship between them. He must have felt the same about Connor. We entered the VIP room in the back. Smoke wafted in the air as a group of fae lounged on a long couch, a golden bowl of incense burning on the table in front of them. The incense heightened sexual appetites and smelled sweet with an underlying floral note. A werewolf knelt between the legs of one of the males and nipped at the fairy's inner thigh. Good pup, the fairy said, sliding his fingers through the wolf's shaggy blonde hair. You deserve a treat. He then leaned forward and kissed him, passing an aphrodisiac to the wolf in the form of a small tablet as their mouths joined. The werewolf's eyes rolled back as he softly whimpered. Intoxication. Lust. A place for all your cravings. The name of the club was fitting. Connor led us through another doorway and into his own private lounge. A bar sat along the back wall, and lights lined the shelves of liquor, decorative bottles of specialty blood, and ambrosia. The bartender nodded to us as he wiped off the counter. A 70-inch flat screen was mounted on another wall with a sitting area in front of it. Couches, armchairs, and a large round cushion on the floor. Make yourselves comfortable, Connor said. If you'd like a drink, let Michael know. He then smiled at the archangel. My bartender, Michael, not you. Call me Mike to make things easier, the bartender said with a warm smile. What can I get for you? How kind of you to offer, Michael responded. Though I must decline. Pleasure doesn't bring me here tonight. Connor watched him. That doesn't mean pleasure won't find you anyway. Wait, was he flirting? Given the way Michael smirked, he wasn't the only one. I'd be damned. Connor very rarely flirted with anyone. Why meathead Michael, of all people? He wasn't even his type. Regardless, I definitely picked up on the vibes while observing their body language. I believe my best friend is crushing on your best friend. I said to Lazarus. Lazarus sat on the couch and pulled me onto the cushion beside him. Good. Anything to get that vampire's attention off you. Nothing has ever happened between us. I rested my hand on his leg. So be nice. And before you say it, yes, I know you don't take orders from me, but do so anyway. The corner of his mouth twitched. Michael sprawled out on the other couch and I didn't miss the way Connor's gaze drank in his abs, as the archangel, like my mate, didn't know the meaning of a shirt. I suppose one drink couldn't hurt. I had a thing called spiked eggnog that was sweet but very good. Do you have some here? Mike cracked a smile. I don't have eggnog, but if you like the creamy sweetness of it, I can fix you up something else you'll like. Give me a minute. As in the past, the bartender was privy to our secret meetings. Connor trusted him. They weren't lovers, though. Connor had saved the human from a vampire who'd gone rogue and given him a job. Mike had then fallen in love with a female vampire from Connor's coven, and the two married. Try this, Mike said as he brought over a drink in a short round glass. With my acute senses, I could smell nutmeg, coffee, and cinnamon. I call it a coffee smoothie. It's my own holiday recipe with a generous pour of brandy. Thank you. Michael took a drink and rested his head on the back of the couch, eyes closing as he savored it. This is delicious. Connor stared at him. How is the situation in town? I asked, drawing his attention. Lucifer's army is attacking all over the globe. It's contained. Connor sat in the oversized armchair across from me, crossing an ankle over his knee. Although the reason for it is not ideal, my dream of uniting the supernatural beings of Echo Bay has come to fruition in the past few weeks. My coven, the wolf packs, even some of the fairies have joined together to fight the monsters. The people of Echo Bay are safe under our watch. 
You have my gratitude for all you've done. Mine as well, Lazarus told him. Connor studied my mate for a moment, a glimmer of humor still in his eyes, before looking back at me. You mentioned on the phone you needed my essence for a spell? Yes. As I'm sure you can understand, I don't freely give away my blood. Or any part of me, for that matter. I'm a gentleman, after all. The smile in his eyes touched his lips. Yet for you, I'll consider it. Tell me more about the spell. A weight settled over my chest. I hadn't yet told him what would happen. Telling my brothers, Lazarus, then Clara, had been hard. I hated upsetting those I cared about. Connor would be another name on that list. Lazarus placed his hand over mine, his quiet way of saying he was with me, that I could lean on him. His support gave me the strength I needed. So I told Connor about visiting Mephistopheles, where we'd learned about Nightfall, and then how we'd retrieved it from Aza. With my heart in my throat, I then revealed the final step in the plan. Lazarus held my hand a bit tighter. So your souls will then be trapped inside Nightfall, Connor said once I'd fallen silent. Yes. Who will wield the sword? I will, I answered. That's how I saw it in the vision. One by one, each of my brother's souls entered the blade, and right as I stabbed Lucifer in the chest, my soul joined theirs in the stones. Lazarus grew taut beside me. Soul magic can be finicky. Connor rested a hand beside his mouth, his index finger pressing to his lips. A person's will holds a lot of weight in terms of efficiency of the spell. This can either be a pro or a con. It can enhance the effectiveness or weaken it. My brothers and I are firm on our decision, I said. We won't let the magic falter. I have no doubt in my mind of your dedication, my friend. However, I'm talking about after the fact. Lazarus focused more intently on him. You're suggesting that their souls can be returned to their bodies? I'm saying it may be possible. Like the seal you placed on your soul, Michael told Lazarus, becoming more alert as he sat up and placed both legs back on the floor. The coffee and brandy concoction, which added ambrosia, was half-drained. Thanks to his massive build, a lot more was needed for him to feel the effects. The warding faltered because your will was tested. It overpowered the magic used to block your bond. When Lazarus and I first kissed, that was when the warding shattered completely. Our faded mate bond obliterated the magic, meant to keep us apart. Love, I whispered. It has the power to break any spell. You've always been such a romantic at heart, Connor told me. And in this, I do believe you're right. Love is irrational, unpredictable, and one of the strongest forces in all the realms. Capable of turning enemies into lovers, breaking hexes, and... His gaze flickered to Lazarus, even bringing an angel to his knees. Lazarus glowered at him. I prefer bringing him to his. <laughs> Who are you? Michael threw his head back against the couch as his large body quaked with a laugh. And what have you done with my pure friend? Ignoring him, Lazarus threaded our fingers together. All of the boys have found their faded mates. It's a connection that runs much deeper than love. Does this increase the likelihood of the spell breaking? Maybe it was because of the mark I'd placed on him, but I was attuned to the way his breathing hitched, how his heartbeats quickened. Hope. I'm no expert on the matter, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Connor reached into the inner pocket of his suit jacket and withdrew a glass vial filled with a thick dark red substance. His blood. For you. So much for him needing to consider at first. He'd had the vial ready to go before I even got to the club. I accepted it from him, my heart warming. Thank you. Of course. You're my family. There's little I wouldn't do for you. 
He rose from the chair and buttoned his jacket before smoothing his hands down the burgundy material. Though we will forget all of that ancient one nonsense, that word, along with old, should be banned. Smiling, I stood and pocketed the vial. I'm in your debt, my friend. Lazarus got to his feet as well. Return the favor by joining me for tea one week from today. We have crumpets and gossip to indulge in. I knew what he was really saying. Don't let this battle be your last. Soul magic was unpredictable. With my brothers being bound to their mates, their wills to return to those mates would be stronger than anything in this entire universe. As I held Lazarus's hand, I knew my will to return to his arms was just as strong. Hope blossomed in my chest, like a drop of ink falling from the end of a quill and landing on paper, starting small but quickly spreading out. We will win the battle, Pride whispered, and return to our angel. Our angel. It was the first time my sin had referred to him like that. Proof I wasn't the only one who'd fallen for the white-haired angel with the icy exterior but warm touches and gentle heart, even if he claimed otherwise. When we left the private lounge and returned to the main part of the club, my gaze roamed the room. Bellamy and Phoenix stood talking to Evelyn, a female vampire Bellamy used to hook up with prior to being mated. She had her own harem of males, though, and only wanted his friendship these days, which was fortunate because Phoenix would have undoubtedly set her on fire. Gray had dragged Mason to the dance floor. Seeing the former Marine so awkward and stiff, while Gray twerked in front of him, was enough to make me chuckle out loud. Castor and Keo danced beside them. The water dragon linked his hands behind Castor's neck. Their chests pressed together as they moved to the beat. Damon danced on a raised platform before spinning around a pole while Warren watched him. Their eyes locked before a smile broke across Damon's face. A rare sight, him being so expressive, because he knew the days were passing quickly. Time was running out. Connor believed the spell could be broken. Should I tell them, Laz? Or will it be cruel to give them and their mates hope only to have it not work? That's a tough question, he responded. Yet I know you'll make the right call. You always do. I beamed over at him, pleased by the compliment. His eyes narrowed. Well, almost, always. Sometimes your ego gets in the way. He rested a hand on my lower back as a werewolf walked by who had been checking me out, something I'd noticed too. His possessiveness thrilled me. Worried someone will steal me away? I asked. I'd like to see them try. Gods. The slight snarl in his tone, combined with that possessive gleam in his eyes, made me want to find a private room in the club, lock the door, and ride his cock like there was no tomorrow. That fantasy was soon interrupted. The air beside me shimmered before a male with light brown hair and yellow eyes appeared. Taden, I said. Pride. He tipped his head. The Reaper had a bad boy reputation both in the club and outside of it. He was said to get a sick satisfaction from when he reaped souls and took them to the fiery pit. Their terrified cries got him off, or so the rumors claimed. Last time I saw you, you were in the underworld on your way to rescue your brother's demon mate. Yes, you're the one who took us there. Out of the goodness of my heart, too. Taden lifted a hand to his chest. However, I believe a certain deal was struck between us for that assist. If I helped you, you'd help me in the future. A favor for a favor. My good mood from earlier was rapidly dissipating. I take it you've come to claim that favor. Maybe. Maybe not. The Reaper glanced over at Damon, and sadness filled his eyes, if only for a moment. I heard you boys are playing at being heroes again. You have a weapon in your possession that can kill Lucifer himself. Is it true? Where did you hear that? Lazarus asked with a growl. Taden scrutinized him. I have my sources, none of which I'll reveal to you. 
No one outside of us and our allies knows about that, I said, as an unsettling feeling jumbled in my stomach. Had someone betrayed us? Did Lucifer have a spy in our ranks, reporting back to him? Answer the goddamn question, Taden. What will you offer me in exchange for the information, Pride? This isn't a game, Reaper, I said. If someone is feeding info to the enemy, we need to know about it. We're at war. A war I have no part in. I'm neither on your side nor theirs. Right. You only care about what you can get out of it. I forced myself to stay calm. Agitation bubbled in my core, threatening to spill over. You're loyal to no one but yourself. I'm the only one I can trust, he countered. Is everything all right here? Callius asked as he reached my side. His dark eyes were unwavering on the Reaper. State your purpose with my brother and his mate. Ah, Taden's smirk returned. You're the long-lost brother. We haven't had the chance to meet yet. How is life among the living treating you? It's a pity I wasn't the one given the honor of reaping your soul. I wasn't alive back then. His yellow eyes trailed my brother's body. But if the rumors are true, and you are about to face Lucifer in battle, perhaps I'll get my chance soon enough. Callius's expression remained hard. You smirk, but I sense a great sadness in you. Hiding your pain will only make it hurt worse when it finally becomes too great to contain. Taden's gaze flickered to Damon, so quick it was nearly imperceptible before shifting back to Callius. Pain? I know it well. It rings clearly in the screams of the souls I drag into hell. Nothing makes my dick harder. Tell me this. I stepped closer. Would your dick get hard if it was Damon's soul screaming in pain? The Reaper's cheeks lost some color. You don't have a smart-ass response for that one, do you? After all this time, you still love him. So stop with the games and tell me where you learned about the weapon. His life could depend on it. Taden averted his eyes to the floor. Horden. Your Reaper, buddy? Buddy is a stretch, he responded, regaining some of his former cocky attitude. Coworker is more like it. After helping Belphegor with the souls earlier this year, Holden went into hiding, as you know. He knew you and your mighty band of heroes would be after him, so he's laid low in between performing his duties to death. Who, yeah, was fucking pissed by it all, but gave Holden a second chance. How did Holden learn of the weapon then? I asked. Has he been spying on us? No. Taden looked at Lazarus. One of your angels is fucking him. They met when that Pura fucker was setting all those zombies loose here in Echo Bay. When I sent angels to help, Lazarus said. Yeah, one of the zombies killed a human on a hiking trail. Holden went to reap her soul and ran into the angel who was disposing of the zombie. Lust at first head chop, I guess. Tayton grabbed a drink off a tray carried by a female cat shifter. She winked at him and swished him with her tail. He couldn't have seemed less interested in her if he'd tried. Anyway, that's how they met. When they fucked the other day, the angel told Holden about a black sword. Belongs to Aza Morningstar, right? Electricity tingled in the air as Michael came closer, his lethal gaze burning so intensely that his normally brown eyes sparked with gold. Do you know the angel's name? Evan something? Taden shook his head. Can't remember. Evangelos? Lazarus asked. Yeah, that's it. I turned to my mate. A spy for Lucifer, or just a fool who can't keep his mouth shut during pillow talk? I'm not sure, Lazarus answered, looking just as lethal as Michael had. But I'll find out. Chapter 20 Lazarus Uriel stood on the palace balcony, the wind tossling the longer strands of his brown hair as he stared out across the colorful kingdom. Grassy fields bursting with patches of vibrant flowers rested beneath a pink and gold sky as the sun prepared to rise on our realm. Is it true? he asked, and his green eyes shifted to me. 
Alistair and the others will need to sacrifice themselves in order to kill the Morning Star. Yes. An Iron Maiden encased my heart and snapped shut, piercing and heavy all at once. If you intend to gloat, I have no desire to hear it. It's no secret that I have little love for those abominations. Their very existence is a stain upon the earth. They are constant reminders of the betrayal we suffered at the hands of Lucifer and his most loyal subjects. Uriel turned from the railing and rested his back against it. Yet I had every intention of welcoming their souls into paradise upon their deaths, should they do as I requested. Did you really? You doubt me. A tick started in his jaw. When I make a promise, I honor it. I was willing to forgive their trespasses. Which trespasses might that be? I asked, my irritation building. They've done nothing wrong. Their only crime was being born the sons of fallen angels. They didn't choose their fate any more than you or I did. They have the blood of traitors running through their veins. They aren't their fathers, I said, watching a purple cloud slowly drift above us. It clashed with a puffy white one. Purple and white, a certain Nephilim and myself. Even the sky conveyed that we belong together. As such, you should have never held that betrayal against them. Your anger blinded you, as did your fear. Careful, Lazarus. You forget your place. Uriel's eyes narrowed. I only allowed you to join us today because you are directly involved with the angel in question, but I can toss you out just as easily. He could do much worse than simply toss me out. The scars on my back stung from the reminder. The doors to the council chambers swung open as Raphael, Salafiel, and three other archangels arrived. There was no door leading to the balcony. It was accessible after taking three steps up and walking between two large stone pillars. The weather around the palace was always perfect, so there was no need to block out rain, snow, or excessive heat. Uriel walked back into the room, and I followed him. Where's Michael? Gabriel asked, taking a seat at the round table. Collecting the suspect so that we may question him, Uriel sat as well. Question him? Zadkiel said before pulling out the chair across from Uriel. If the information proves true, we'll do much more than that. The only suitable punishment for a traitor is death. Where are the treats? Raphael pouted at the table. No macarons or cakes, not even tea. How will I ever endure this meeting without them? There was no time to prepare refreshments, Uriel told him. We're here to interrogate a possible spy of Lucifer's. Desserts are trivial. I find you trivial. Raphael toyed with the glittery blue hair clip, pinning a section of his strawberry blonde bangs to the side. And boorish. You're also... Cease your incessant rambling, Uriel interjected, his hands curling into fists on top of the table. You grate on my nerves with your gluttonous impulses. Delicious treats are good for the soul, Raphael answered. Not like you'd know. You deny yourself all pleasures in an attempt to make yourself seem more important and mightier than the rest of us. I assure you I make no attempt in doing so. It's a mere fact. Were all council meetings like this? I stood to the side of the table and quietly observed them. Only one chair remained vacant. Michael's. All of the chairs had cushioned seats and ornate engravings in the wood. Only one had gold inlay and gemstones, and the surliest of the bunch currently occupied it. Uriel truly did view himself as the head of the council, despite the rules in place that forbade any one angel from having all the power. He chided Raphael's gluttony, yet he had no qualms about his own sense of pride and holier-than-thou complex. Michael materialized by the door seconds later, holding on to Evangelos before pushing him forward. My friend's stormy expression right then could have struck fear into anyone's heart. I knew how big of a marshmallow he was, and he even made me uneasy. Why am I here? Evangelos asked. Oliver and I are supposed to be scouting right now. Oliver is with Dargan, Michael told him. 
You're here to answer some questions. Questions concerning what? Michael shoved him into a chair as Uriel stood and approached them. Golden cuffs appeared around Evangelo's wrists. As an archangel of truth, the cuffs were one of Uriel's gifts. The wearer was unable to lie when bound. I have a right to know why I'm being detained, Evangelo said, struggling against the handcuffs. His stare darted around the room before stopping on me. Commander Lazarus, I served under you for many years. You see me as one of your trusted warriors. It's why I was chosen to stay with you and the others on the island. Correct. You were one of my trusted warriors, I said, saddened it was no longer the case. That trust has since been broken. What? Why? He tried to break off the cuffs to no avail. Release me at once! What's your relationship with the Reaper called Holden? Uriel asked him. Holden? I don't know who- Evangelos winced, then gritted his teeth. The lie couldn't leave his lips. Fine. He's my lover. That's not a crime. No, it isn't, Michael agreed. However, telling him classified information is. Evangelos pressed his mouth into a thin line, choosing to keep his silence. Uriel's eyes flashed gold. Reveal the truth you're hiding. Did you tell Holden about Aza Morningstar's sword? Sweat beaded at his temple, and the restraints tightened around his wrists, propelling him to answer. Yes, I told him. Why? Michael asked. Because Holden helped Belphegor in the past with the souls, Evangelos responded, the truth spilling from him. He couldn't control it now. I thought I could trust him. I thought he was on our side. Our side? I asked. An ally of Lucifer. My blood went cold. You're a spy. Silence. Answer him! Uriel commanded. Y yes Evangelos responded. But I haven't always been a spy. When Belphegor released Lucifer from his cage, that's when my loyalty shifted. Why? I asked. Why betray us? Why betray me? Simple. Evangelos shrugged. Lucifer is more powerful. He was the first angel and is omnipotent, greater even than Michael. At the time, there was no known weapon that could kill him. With him freed, I weighed my options. I concluded that the Celestial Army is no match for Lucifer. We weren't during the First War, and we aren't now. So you were a coward, Michael said in a clipped tone. Call me what you will. I don't care. I made my choice and will accept the consequences. Michael's murderous gaze burned into him. Have you told Lucifer about us retrieving Nightfall? Yes, Evangelo smirked. You think you've beaten him, but you're wrong. He's going to kill all of you. You, the cursed sons, and Aza, all of you will fall to the Lightbringer's flame. Lucifer isn't powerful enough to breach this realm, Uriel said. He'll never get to us or Aza. Evangelos was no longer nervous. He was bold now, defiant. Perhaps because he knew it was a lost cause. He couldn't lie to us. His goal isn't to breach this realm. At least, not yet. He intends to summon Aza to him. Like he tried to do in Hoya Bashu, I asked. The forest won't allow it. The spirits residing there, along with every living thing, will fight him. Ah, you have it all wrong, Commander. Lucifer won't need to tap into the magical energy of the forest this time. There's another way. Impossible, Gabriel said. Not quite impossible, Salafia countered. His golden hair brushed his shoulders as he stood from his chair. I feel the astrological energies shifting. A rare event is about to occur in the human realm that will increase this energy. If Lucifer performs the summoning when I suspect he will, he will succeed. The black moon, I said. Evangelos's smirk widened. He looked crazed. 
Now that Lucifer knows you have Nightfall, he intends to use the power of the Black Moon to summon Aza and kill him, preventing you from carrying out your plan. Nerves twisted in my gut. A soul weapon can only be destroyed if the soul it's attached to dies. Michael worked his jaw. Lucifer plans to kill Aza, so Nightfall will die with him. So there are brains along with that brawn. Bravo, Captain. Uriel stepped closer to the chained angel. Where will this summoning take place? In the place where it all began, Evangelos answered. Where Aza Morningstar's soul first awoke. At first I was confused, but then the answer hit me, and a bittersweet ache came with it. It was where Aza's soul had been released from the ring, where the war and everything springing from it had been set in motion, a place where the brothers had felt so safe once upon a time before that safety had been ripped from them and set aflame. The Mansion in Echo Bay Oliver stood on the beach beside Daichi. The Earth Dragon spoke to him, much too quietly for me to hear. In our time on the island, the two had become good friends, though Oliver felt a deeper bond than friendship, one he hid out of respect for the other male's marriage to Kyo's sister. Daichi was comforting him. I had left the celestial realm before Evangelos' sentence had been carried out by Michael. The council's decision had been unanimous. Verdict. Execution. How are you holding up? Dogan asked me. Having a warrior under your command betray you would eat at anyone. I'm fine, I answered before nodding to Oliver. It's him I'm concerned for. His heart is too big sometimes. Eh... <sighs> He'll be fine, too. Dargan's caramel eyes focused on the pair near the water's front. Especially with the dragon at his side. My heart went out to Oliver. For thousands of years, I had endured the pain of desiring someone I could never have. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Watch over him for me? I asked Dargan before releasing my wings. I need to visit the boys. Yes, sir. I then flew to Baxter's villa, where Alistair and his brothers had gathered with the Allied commanders to discuss the night of the Black Moon. Nico met me outside. He was sitting on the front steps, eating a popsicle. I was kicked out of the meeting for talking too much, he said before biting into the cold treat. But Ray gave me this. It's banana flavored. My favorite. Another bite before he slapped a hand to his forehead. Ow! Brain freeze! Kicking him out for talking too much had more than likely been an excuse just to get him out of the room. Raiden and Titan cared for Nico, as if he was their own son. They didn't want him anywhere near this battle, despite his training over the past year to prepare him for the war. If you get bored, you can join Oliver and Dargan by the beach, I told him. His hyperactive personality might help lift the angel's moods, because although he'd kept a cool composure, I knew Dargan was hurting too. Evangelos had been one of us. He'd fought beside us, trained with us, laughed and dined with us, and then betrayed us. It cut deep. Once inside the villa, I followed the sound of voices toward the study. The smell of fajitas lingered in the air, a melody of chicken, shrimp, and steak, enough to feed an entire army, or close to it. Before I reached the door, Alistair stepped from the room, his expression lighting up upon seeing me. Wariness shone in his eyes, though, after taking in my appearance. He was so attuned to me. He was a spy, I said. The council voted to execute him. I'm sorry. Alistair stepped into my arms. I hadn't known how much I'd needed him until he was against me, his body warm and his sweet cedar scent a comfort to my battered heart. Did you learn anything from him at least? Yes. I nuzzled his hair, then hid my face in it. You were right about the Black Moon. Lucifer plans to use the power to summon Aza from the Celestial Prison. Summon Aza? He asked, trying to pull back. But I held him in place. I felt raw 
and didn't want him to see that rawness in my eyes. He settled back against my chest and slid his hands to my nape. Why? To kill him. He knows we have nightfall. And he plans to kill Aza to prevent us from using the sword against him. Clever boy. Alistair kissed the area beneath my jaw. Purrs rumbled in his chest. His sin enjoyed the praise just as much as he did. I also learned the location of the battle. I reluctantly pulled away. The others should hear it too. Very well. Alistair turned toward the doorway. Let's... I grabbed him by the wrist and spun him back to me, capturing his lips. The spontaneous kiss shocked him, but he soon pressed closer, teasing the seam of my lips with his tongue before pushing it into my mouth. I'm here for you, he told me telepathically. Lean on me if you need to. Yes, he knew me well. He had known I was hurting on the inside and needed his proximity, needed his everything. After we pulled apart, he led me into the study to join the others. Bellamy smirked at us. No doubt lust had sensed the desire brewing outside the door. Desire for sex, for the escape it gave, but mostly for the comfort I only found with Alistair in my arms. Lazarus has news, Alistair said. Do tell. Baxter kicked his legs up on his desk and leaned back farther in the chair, tucking his hands behind his head. I hope you fall backward, Damon told him. Caught ya? Warren said with a light chuckle, bringing his mate closer and kissing his temple. Well, he flirted with you. Damon glared at the pink-haired Nephilim. I'll chop off his dick. For the last fucking time, I didn't flirt with him, Baxter said in an exasperated tone. I only asked if the carpet matched the drapes. It was an honest question. That silver hair and faint blue highlight have always piqued my interest. Damon's hand landed on the hilt of his sword. Warren promptly moved that hand aside and linked their fingers. A mighty dragon taming a feisty kitten. King Tatsuya stood by the window and looked at me. I'd suggest you share your news before they start up again. Without wasting any time, I told them what I learned from Evangelos, the reason for Lucifer waiting until the Black Moon and the location being at their mansion, or what remained of it, in Echo Bay. Alistair froze. Why would Lucifer need to summon Aza from the ruins of the mansion? Because that's where his residual energy is, Clara said. She sat on the rug with a sleepy Grey cuddled up to her. Mason sat on Grey's other side. When Aza's soul awoke, his life force created a ball of energy. The lingering effects of that energy are what Lucifer will tap into to summon him. How is the spell coming along? Alistair asked. The brothers' mates were in the room, so any mention of the soul transfer was off limits. All they knew was a spell was needed to strengthen Nightfall, not the specifics of that spell. Everything's ready to go, Clara answered. She petted Gray's hair and I noticed the slight wobble of her chin. She turned her face toward the fireplace to hide it. Alistair had shared with her what Connor said about soul magic, but there was no guarantee it would work. It was only a slight possibility that it could. He told his brothers about it too, deciding it was best not to keep it from them. A wise decision. They were stronger when absolute openness existed between them. No secrets. When the boys would tell their mates the truth, I wasn't certain. I'll need to return to my palace, King Tatsuya said, turning from the window. His long black hair fell over his blue Jinbei kimono, a two-piece garment where the top resembled a kimono and the bottoms were loose-fitted trousers that hit him mid-calf. My wife's... well... His gaze fell to the wedding ring. There was a gem in the flat bend for each of them. I wish to see them again before the battle. Of course, Alistair told him. He then looked at Damon. If you and Warren wish to return to the Ice Kingdom for a night or two, you should. Use a teleportation stone to get you there and back. We'll meet you here again on December 30th to make further arrangements. Damon peered up at his mate. Want to see our cottage again? Warren smiled down at him. Nothing would make me happier.
We should go with your brother, Casta said to Kyo. I'd like to see Ryoko and the babies. Ryoko had twin boys who Casta adored and liked to spoil with toys. They adored him too, from what I'd heard. The reason he wanted to go tugged at my chest, though. It was the same reason why Alistair suggested Damon and Warren spend time at their home. Because it may very well be their last time to do so. Galen cupped Simon's cheek. What do you say, sexy? Want a hole up in your loft for the night? The loft above Simon's antique shop where he used to live prior to meeting the Nephilim brothers. We can order Chinese from your favorite restaurant and watch sappy movies in bed. Hey, I don't watch sappy movies, Simon said. I watch things like American Pickers on the History Channel like a respectable nerd. Not all that romancy stuff. Uh-huh. Galen angled his face and brushed their lips together. Is that why I caught you sniffling at that Hallmark Christmas movie the other day? I plead the fifth. Gods, I love you. Galen drew him closer. Don't ever forget it. Get a room, Bellamy teased. On second thought, strip each other down right here and give us all a little show. You goddamn pervert, Casta told him. Don't I know it, Phoenix mumbled before he cocked a smile and nestled closer to Bellamy. But he's my naughty, perverted Nephilim. You and Nix should come to the Ice Kingdom with us, B, Damon said. We have a guest bedroom. Damon and Bellamy then exchanged a look that said so much without them needing to say a single word. With their last days potentially upon them, they didn't want to be apart either. They never had. After I'd brought Bellamy to the training grounds when they were children, the pair had quickly become friends. They'd been close ever since. A vibration sounded before Mason pulled his phone from his pocket and placed it to his ear. Hawk. A pause. Hey, Storm. Everything good? Gray rolled over to face him. Fuck, man. How bad? Is Scar okay? The hunter closed his eyes and nodded to himself, as if relieved. Good. Just hang in there. This shit will be over soon. Have you heard from Grimm lately? He stood from the floor, and when Gray reached up to him, Mason picked him up and let Gray latch on to his back. Still talking on the phone, he then left the study. The war is escalating, Alistair said. As we stand here now, humankind is at the mercy of Lucifer's army. And his army is at the mercy of ours, Baxter said. We have units stationed in the areas being hit the worst, meeting them steel for steel. Prince Victor nodded. He had returned to the island earlier that morning to discuss the war efforts. With thanks to Penamule, the humans have been more vigilant in their own defense as well, keeping the death tolls down. A victor will be decided come New Year's Day, Serena said. Either Lucifer will stand victorious, or we will. We will. Confidence rang in Alistair's tone. I'll accept nothing less. I only prayed he would be around to see that victory. Water cascaded from the rock wall, crashing over me and Alistair as we kissed beneath it. His naked torso pressed to mine, and beneath the water, he grabbed hold of my hardened shaft. I groaned against his lips before nipping at them. He smiled. The lagoon gave us privacy, almost as though we were the only two beings in the world. In the days since the meeting in the study, we had spent our time at the bungalow, kissing reveling in the feel and taste of each other and soaking up as much sun as possible, existing in our own little slice of paradise. You just had me, yet you're ready to go again, Alistair asked between soft presses of his mouth. He stroked me from root to tip, and my cock swelled even more. I can never get enough of you. I moved my hands down his slick sides, stopping at his hips. Never. Greed is a sin, you know. He flashed me a lopsided grin that had my heart thumping harder. So is gluttony. A kiss to the edge of my lips. And lust. One to my jaw. He stroked me again. But they say pride is the worst of all. 
capable of making even angels fall. Is that what troubles you? I grazed my fingertips along the dip of his hip bone. Me falling. Without me and my brothers, your celestial family is all you have. Michael, Oliver, Dargan. Alistair's breath shook. I just want to make sure you'll be okay after... He didn't finish his sentence. He didn't need to. You aren't going anywhere, I told him, resting my hand on his neck. His skin was so soft beneath my palm and pale despite the days in the sun. Our bond is too strong. You'll find your way back to me. I know you will. Are you trying to convince me of that? Or yourself? His blue eyes searched my face. Both. Let's not talk about it right now. He glided his nose up my throat before biting at my jaw. His hand continued along my shaft, and he palmed my tip. The battle is tomorrow's worry. Today, I want to make you soar. I have wings for that. He smiled again before sinking below the surface of the water and replacing his hand with his lips. A surprised grunt tore from me at the cushioned heat of his mouth. He took me to the back of his throat until his nose pressed against my base. I reached down and tugged my fingers through his pale blonde hair, groaning and tipping my head back. I feel you trembling already. Because you're much too good at this, I responded using our mind link. I want you to grab my head and fuck my throat. Alistair, he chuckled, causing vibrations along my shaft that had me pushing my hips forward involuntarily. I needed more, so, so much more, and he gave it to me. He came up for a quick breath of air before diving back down and showing me no mercy. I didn't last long. My thighs quaked from the force of my release, and my fingers tightened in his hair. He swallowed every drop I had to give before surfacing with a pleased gleam in his eyes. You did so good, I panted, pulling him to my chest. My perfect boy. A low whine left him as he nestled in closer. Pride likes when you say that. I do too. I know. I cupped the back of his head. You're so precious to me, Alistair. More precious than everything in all the realms. That's the orgasm talking. No, it's not. My throat constricted as I buried my face in his hair. I... I love you. He froze. Seconds passed without him saying anything. Had I been wrong to confess my love to him? Did he not feel the same? He felt strong enough to mark me as his mate. The bite on my neck was proof of that. But possession and love were different. Say it again, he finally whispered, his arms locking around my waist. Please. My worries evaporated into the air. Relief settled over my chest, easing the tight grip on my sternum. I tipped his chin up so I could look him in the eye. I love you, Alistair. So much, it frightens me. Pride has never allowed me to love anyone more than I love myself. In every relationship, I cared for them, but they never owned my heart. He glided his fingers up my spine, tracing the grooves of my scars. But I love you, Lazarus. More than I ever expected or thought was possible. More than Joseph, I asked, resorting to telepathy, because if I tried to talk, my voice would crack. I wanted his answer, but dreaded it, too. Yes. My heart felt heavy. You answered that quickly. Alistair kissed the scar on my shoulder. I cared for Joseph. What I feel for you, it goes beyond reason, beyond every rational thing on this earth. When I say I love you, what I really mean is my breaths are yours. 
Every beating of my heart is yours. You own me in a way no one else ever has or ever will. His words brought tears to my eyes, and I blinked them away. Pride loves you too, he added. Don't you see, you infuriating angel? We're both head over heels for you. Evidence of that love shone in his eyes right then, just as I was sure it did in mine as I stared back at him. I brought his face in for a gentle kiss. The rush of the waterfall was a backdrop to our beating hearts, ones that beat in sync, both a little frantic but excited too. Love. Who knew it could be so painful and frightening, yet also be the one thing to make me feel so complete? After leaving the water and drying off, we returned to the bungalow, where we fell into bed together. Not for sex. I wanted to hold him, for as long as I could. I pulled him against me and listened to his soft exhales. So much time had been lost. What I wouldn't give for the chance to do it all over again. I would choose him sooner. Tell me what you're thinking, Alistair murmured. He lay in the nook between my arm and side, his head on my chest. I'm thinking... I turned more into him. How I never want to leave this bed. My soul cracked a bit ached for the wholeness that came from fully binding yourself to a faded mate. I want to perform the mating ritual and join our souls. He lifted his head to look at me. No. No. If we can't return to our bodies, the last thing I want is your soul crying for mine. It's bad enough my brother's mates will go through it. I don't want you to as well. You'll never be able to move on from me if you do. I scoffed. You honestly believe I could move on from you now? I rolled on top of him and grabbed his chin. Such a silly, beautiful boy. Whether we're fully bound together as mates or not, there will never be anyone else for me. My soul will always cry out for yours. I rested my head on his. My heart will too. I'll make you a promise then, he said. When the war is over, we'll complete the mating ritual. Our lives, our souls, will become intertwined. As lovers. As husbands. As mates, I said. Forever. That's what I'm promising you. I slid my hand beneath his head. I'll hold you to that promise. We kissed then, soft and unrushed, sealing the vow. We will win this war, Laz. Yes, I said. But victory means nothing if you aren't by my side afterward. So you better not break your promise. You better return to me. I'll always return to you. He glided his nose along my jaw. You're my home. He was mine, too. Raiden called us a few hours later and invited us to his and Titan's house for dinner. Bellamy and Damon had returned to the island with their mates, as had the others. When Alistair and I arrived, we joined everyone on the back porch. Gray ran around the backyard, chasing Simon with a bug. The smaller male then lost some of his energy and dropped down to the grass with a yawn. The boys and their mates were there, along with Clara and Serena, Nico and two of his friends from his unit. Baxter, Daichi, King Tatsuya, Penamule, and Lev and the twins. Prince Victor had returned to the Ice Kingdom and would journey to the island the following day. To march for war. Michael arrived with Oliver and Dargan not long afterward. My friend's grim expression made my chest ache. He had been the one to execute Evangelos days ago one of the responsibilities that came with his position, and he had been in the celestial realm ever since, dealing with other council affairs, as well as preparing the military for the fight with Lucifer. I hadn't had a chance to speak to him. Alistair followed my gaze. I never thought I'd say it, but I miss his stupid shit-eating grin. As do I. 
I touch the small of Alistair's back. War takes its toll on everyone, even those who live and breathe combat like him. Taking a life is never easy. Welcome to the party, boys, Clara greeted the angels. Grab a drink and have a seat. Gratitude, Dargan nodded to her before sitting beside Baxter, who handed him a beer. Oliver joined Daichi and King Tatsuya at the table, while Michael made his way over to us. Evening, I said to him. I hope you brought your appetite. From the smells coming from the kitchen, I imagine Raiden has cooked a feast befitting the gods. Finally, Michael smiled. It wasn't quite at his normal level, but it caused a familiar sparkle in his brown eyes. I look forward to it. I didn't ask him about the state of the celestial realm or the battle strategy he'd put into place. I kept all talk of war where it belonged. Out of this moment. We made a little bit of everything, Raiden said, beaming with a smile as he stepped onto the back porch. He wore an apron that said, Got Meat, and had a picture of a smirking animated sausage on it. Pork roast with Brussels sprouts? We also have pepperoni pizza, enchilada casserole, grilled chicken with mango, and teriyaki and pineapple glazed drumsticks. There's also a ton of sides, Titan added. Too many to name. Come make your plates. Raiden approached me and Alistair. Guess what I made for dessert? Apple pie. His eyes shifted to me. You're gonna eat, right? So many times I had turned down his offer. But not today. Yes. Sweet. His smile widened. It then fell just a little. I know me and my brothers haven't always seen eye to eye with you, Les, but I want you to know I consider you one of us now. You're Al's mate, and that makes you family. Thank you. My throat was tight. That means a lot to me. You've outdone yourself, Alistair told him. When you said dinner, I should have known you meant feast. Yeah, well, I wouldn't be me otherwise. Besides, Raiden looked at everyone around the outside table. They had filled their plates and sat anywhere that was available, laughing, eating, and drinking. I wanted one last night like this, you know? It was the evening before the battle. Come tomorrow, the boys I had grown to care for would give everything to save the world. Would I be able to let them? Michael watched me for a moment before looking toward the group. Did he know my thoughts? By the tenderness in his stare, I wondered if he shared my same struggle. He'd grown to care for them, too. Where's that apple pie? I asked. Having your dessert first, Raiden's smile returned. That's what I'm talking about. Laughing under his breath, Alistair grabbed my hand and led me into the house. He cut me a slice of the pie, but insisted on having the first bite, mainly to taunt me, the brat. So good, he said, licking his lips. I think I'll just eat the whole thing. I backed him up against the counter in the kitchen. Is that so? He only smiled at me, a devious little smile. I kissed him and pushed my tongue into his mouth, tasting him and the pie he'd stolen. You were right. It's good. I taste better. He nipped at my lips. I need another taste just to be sure, I responded, before joining our lips again. One last night. I refused to waste it. Chapter 21 Alistair. The scouts confirmed it, Oliver said after coming through the front door of Baxter's villa that morning. The demonic presence has increased in Echo Bay. They're swarming to the area. Doggin nodded from behind him. As are Nephilim and fallen angels. As the sun rose here on the island in Greece, it was setting in Echo Bay. And with the fall of darkness, the events I'd seen in the vision would begin to take shape. Lucifer knows we're coming for him, I said. Pieces of the vision flashed through my mind, dead bodies strewn along the snow. So much blood. I had tried not to look at their faces. He'll be ready for a fight. So will we, Michael said. Penamuel entered the kitchen, appearance a bit disheveled. 
His pullover cardigan and undershirt were wrinkled as if he'd slept in them, and his brown hair was tousled. For once, he wasn't wearing his glasses. Not that he needed them. I've decided to go with you. Go with us, I asked. He nodded. To battle. Was that why he looked so rough? He'd been tossing and turning over that decision. I'm afraid I can't allow that, Michael told him. And why not? Because you're no good with a sword. Michael patted his shoulder. I can see how much you've changed. For the better. But you aren't a warrior, Pen. If I allow you to join us in battle, your blood will be on my hands. Nada, who was sitting at the table with her husband, Zale, scoffed. If the writer wishes to fight, let him. I'm tired of running, Penemuel said. Tired of hiding in my cave while the world goes on around me. A world that may not be here tomorrow, depending on the outcome of tonight's battle. I've made so many mistakes in the past. Give me the opportunity to make it right. I admire your courage, Michael responded. Very well. If that's your final decision, so be it. We should have a family meeting, I told my brothers. Lazarus and I had come to the villa to meet with the Allied commanders, but they were still on different parts of the island. And bring your mates. Fuck, Bellamy responded. It's time to tell them, isn't it? Can we just... Not? Castor asked. You can't keep the truth from them forever, I said. The battle is nearly upon us, unless you wish for them not to know until it's too late. They deserve to have a proper goodbye, Callius said. Don't take that from them. Through our connection, I felt his profound sadness. He'd been denied his happily ever after with Alassus, and his heart was slowly withering away as each day passed without him. Saying goodbye might not have brought him closure, but it might have lessened the sting, if only a little. Better than being taken off guard without even a final I love you. We decided to meet at Raiden's house. Nico was rushing out the door with a piece of toast jutting from his mouth as we arrived. He waved at us before spreading his wings and flying toward the military barracks. The Nephilim army was making preparations that morning. As much as Titan wished to protect Nico, he wouldn't be able to stop him from joining the fight. The young Nephilim was too determined. Pride sensed Nico's desire to prove himself. He wouldn't be persuaded otherwise, regardless of Titan's orders. Anyone want pancakes? Raiden asked, once we'd crammed into the kitchen. Toast with strawberry jam? He was trying to delay the inevitable. Gray had just woken from his morning nap and still had a sleepy look in his eyes as he shook his head and slipped his arms around Mason's waist. Not hungry. What's going on? Titan asked with an apprehensive stare. Raiden averted his eyes as soon as he looked at him. You've all been hiding something from us. I've felt it too, Phoenix said, his dark brown eyes pinned to Bellamy. It started after we returned from the realm of the lost. We... Castor fidgeted with his lip ring, a nervous habit. Shit, I can't say it. Simon turned to Galen. Time to speak up, big guy. I'm getting nervous here. Galen's light gray eyes darkened a bit as guilt poured off him. He then looked at me, pleading. My other brothers did the same. I was their support. Lazarus rested his hand on my hip, and he was mine. Before we left the realm of the lost, Mephistopheles showed me something, I said. It's how we figured out when the battle would take place, because I saw it in a vision. I saw something else, too. No one made a sound as I revealed the true purpose of the spell and what we had to do in order to win. I had explained it several times now, but it wasn't any easier, especially once taking in their expressions. Mason's stoicism broken by the tormented look in his eyes. Simon's shock, followed by tears. Keo balled his hands into fists. But don't worry, Raiden said, touching Titan's side. We're not going to die, so you'll be okay. Our souls will just kind of be... 
well, trapped, I guess. That's supposed to make it better? Animosity radiated from Titan. He gripped the countertop so tight with his metal hand that the laminate cracked. You may not die, but you'll still be sacrificing yourselves, Phoenix said, his eyes flashing red. A plate flew off the table and smashed into the wall. Nix, Bellamy reached for him. Don't fucking touch me. Phoenix used his tail to slap his hand away. How could you keep this from me? Tears shone in Bellamy's eyes. I didn't know how to tell you. Tell me what? The demon slammed his fists against my brother's chest as Bell tried to grab him again. That you're going to be a good little hero and sacrifice yourself for a world that doesn't deserve it? It's not that simple. Bellamy's voice broke. This is the only way to stop Lucifer. To protect the world. To protect you. I don't have a choice. You had a choice and made it. Red lit his eyes again before a cup on the counter shattered. You're leaving me behind. Bellamy wrapped Phoenix in his arms, not letting go as he was whacked with the demon's tail and slapped. But then Phoenix stopped fighting him and returned his embrace, releasing a broken cry. I'm so sorry. Bellamy tightened his hold and pressed his face against the demon's neck. I'm so fucking sorry, baby. Mason crushed Gray to his chest. Keo and Casta had stepped from the kitchen and stood beyond the archway leading into the living room, arguing. Simon had burrowed against Galen and wouldn't let him go. Galen ran his fingers through Simon's sandy brown hair, speaking softly in his ear. Callie stood beside Raiden as Titan pulled them both in for a hug. Titan then cupped Raiden's head and kissed the side of his backward hat. Don't do this, Katya, Warren said taking Damon's face in his hands. Please. You are the best thing that's ever happened to me, War. Damon smiled through his tears. I wanted more time with you. No. Warren growled low and brought him closer. Don't do that. Don't say your goodbyes to me. I nearly lost you once. I refuse to do so again. Damon brought Warren's hand to his chest, over his heart. Even if we're apart, a part of you will always be with me. I turned away from them, to give them privacy, but also because I couldn't bear it any longer. I felt all of my brother's grief and fear. It combined with my own. The intensity shook me to my core. My carefully structured life was unraveling, and I didn't know how to make it right again. I didn't know how to take away their sorrow. My knees wobbled as my vision blurred. And then, arms came around me from behind. I've got you, Lazarus whispered in my ear. You're not alone. I tried to stifle a sob, but choked on it instead. It sounded raspy, raw. I know this is the right choice, Laz. So why does it hurt so much? He gently turned me in his arms and rested a hand on my neck because it's not only your life that's at stake. Despite your pride, you've always put your brothers and their happiness above yourself. It hurts because you can't protect them from this. I don't want to leave you. Lazarus steeled his expression, but traces of his own worry glinted in his eyes. You won't be gone for long. You'll return to me. I know it. Yes, we will, Pride said. We'll return to him. I welcomed the surge of confidence from my sin, one of the few times I allowed myself to do so. But I needed it right then. Steps sounded outside the house before the front door swung open. Michael walked in. Lucifer has been spotted in Echo Bay. Belphegor, Pura, and Vepa are with him. They were headed for the mansion. A warrior couldn't allow personal feelings to get in the way of their mission. The male I loved with all my heart had taught me that. Ready the army, I said, doing what I'd always done best, masking my emotions, strengthening my resolve. It's time. The army gathered on the outskirts of Echo Bay, 
A blend of dragon warriors in their hybrid forms, their scales and horns on display, and all the Nephilim from Baxter's and Serena's forces. The force of human hunters had remained in their assigned areas across the globe, fighting back the waves of monsters. Lycus and his pack hadn't traveled to Echo Bay either, just in case the forest was targeted. The air shimmered before Prince Victor, and the Ice Dragon army appeared in the field beside us. He had used a teleportation stone. Warren stepped forward to greet him, and they clasped each other's forearms. Another battle where I get to fight by your side, uncle, Prince Victor said with a hint of a smile. I sensed his pride in that fact. It was clear he admired Warren. Instead of wanting to be king as a boy, Victor had looked up to his uncle and wanted to follow the path of a warrior instead. As the youngest son in the line of princes, his chances of becoming king had been slim anyway. Indeed. Warren tipped his head to him. It's an honor, my prince. Angels landed in the snow, adorned with golden armor and celestial weapons, swords and long-handled axes. Archers were among the ranks as well, their bows silver with swirls of gold. They faced Michael and stood silently, awaiting their orders. That's cool as hell, Nico said. And kinda intimidating. You are to stay beside me during the fight. Titan told him. Am I clear? Nico rolled his eyes. Nico, that's an order. Yes, sir, the young Nephilim responded. I'll stay beside you. Raiden and Titan exchanged a worried look. Stars shone above us, but there was no moon. My blood felt charged, like electricity had replaced the plasma and surged through my veins, searching for an outlet. Each of my brothers felt it too. The anticipation before a battle, adrenaline pumping. Suddenly, a clanking echoed across the lines as the celestial army snapped their heads toward the right and placed their hands on their weapons. Pardon the intrusion, Connor said, gaze skating across the force of angels before settling on me. He wore a white button-down shirt that fell open in the front and a navy blue mid-thigh coat over it. A long-barreled revolver was holstered at his hip. We've come to provide assistance. Shadows flickered behind him before more vampires appeared. His coven. But that wasn't all. Growls rumbled from the trees before glowing eyes lit up the darkness. A massive black wolf padded forward in the snow. Bane, the alpha of the local werewolf pack. More wolves left the coverage of trees, their coats a mix of gray, light brown, and white with black markings. Bane stopped beside Connor, and on all fours, his head reached the vampire's chest. Not as tall as Lycus, but still huge. It's good to see you, old friend. I rested a hand on Connor's shoulder. His brow arched. I'll forgive your use of that wretched word just this once. He placed a hand on mine, too, and gently squeezed. Echo Bay is our home. We're here to help you protect it. Thank you. Lazarus told him. Connor smirked. So you do have manners. I'm impressed. Don't press your luck, vampire. Ah, that's more like it. Once Michael gave the order, we sprang into action and headed toward the mansion. The shield that had once surrounded the property had been destroyed when Aza and his army attacked, resulting in the destruction of our home. Still, the location was far enough from town that we shouldn't have to worry about humans being caught up in the fighting. Mountains surrounded it as well, which would help keep the fighting contained. The element of surprise wasn't on our side, but it didn't matter, seeing as how Lucifer knew we were coming. He'd seen it in the vision, as had I. That knowledge put us on equal footing. But he'll be the one to fall, Pride told me. For once, I agreed with my sin. If we followed the plan to a T, our victory was guaranteed. It was a bittersweet thought. Nightfall was sheathed at my side, and as we approached the mansion, the weight of responsibility threatened to crush me. But I wouldn't allow it to. My brothers and I would do what needed to be done, even if it cost us everything. Stay strong, Lazarus said, brushing the backs of his knuckles across mine just as you always have. I will. He looked over at me, a sad smile on his lips. 
I know. The familiar terrain caused a lump to rise in my throat. I had once walked those grounds, finding comfort in the stretch of sea that had glistened like diamonds beneath the sun's rays. On rainy days, the droplets of rain had created a soothing chorus as I sat beneath the outside awning and enjoyed a hot cup of tea. The garden I had tended to, now buried beneath a thick blanket of snow. Up ahead, cloaked figures moved along the ruins of the mansion. The witches we'd encountered in Transylvania, no doubt. Clara had blown up a few of them with her witch bombs, so more had joined since then. Anger rolled around in my chest. How dare they taint a place that had once been so important to us. It was a violation that would not go unpunished. Before dawn broke across the sky the next morning, they'd join the ashes they stood upon. They're preparing the spell, Clara whispered. Bastards. How much time do we have before they complete it? I asked. She frowned up at the sky, mentally calculating. Within the hour, if I had to guess. Magical energy is all around us and only growing stronger. That's not the only thing around us. Bellamy surveyed the area. I sense demons. A lot of them. They're lying in wait, Phoenix said, the cold air creating a visible cloud as he sharply exhaled. This is feeling more and more like a trap. A trap implies a deception. I kept my gaze forward. There's no trick here. It's a clashing of two armies in a predestined location, neither one having an advantage over the other. It makes me curious, Lazarus said. If Lucifer saw the night of his death, why would he set events into motion that would cause that death to play out? The location, the black moon. Surely he knows he's charging straight toward his own fated destruction. Unless he knows something we don't, Michael said. Always a possibility, I responded, refusing to allow doubt to creep in. However, unfortunately for him, we have something in common. We both allow our pride to propel us into action, often despite the odds stacked against us. Because of that, I think it more likely he saw his death and believes he's capable of preventing it by altering the order of events. But fate doesn't work that way. There's only one way this night ends, and it's with nightfall plunging into his cold heart. The electricity in my veins sparked, setting my blood on fire. And then a weight lodged in my core, sinking into my muscles and trying to force me to my knees. I fought the urge. My brothers stopped walking and struggled against the same feeling. Their bodies told them to kneel, to obey. That could only mean one thing. Lucifer was close. He materialized in front of us, keeping a notable gap between himself and our army. You sound so sure of yourself, my boy. Belphegor and Vepa landed in the snow behind him. Pura was probably hiding in the shadows, like the psychotic bastard he was. I smiled. Did my words get under your skin? It had been exactly as I'd intended. If I knew one thing about Lucifer, it was his inability to ignore a challenge. Another thing we shared. I had thrown down the gauntlet, and he'd accepted. Good. I once saw a marvelous vision of you leading a mighty army of Nephilim in my name. Lucifer's sky-blue eyes tapered as he observed the warriors behind me. How disappointing that you should be here now leading one against me. You have only yourself to blame. I ignored the prickling ache in my chest. I loved you once, admired you as both a father and a king. I would have done anything to make you proud, but not anymore. Because your loyalties have shifted. You found a new family. Yes, I have. I gained strength from that. A real family, not the toxic cesspool I had with you, filled with manipulation and lies. Pity you feel that way. Lucifer then looked at Michael. Once again, we stand on opposite sides, brother. How I wish it were different. Then surrender, Michael said. Stop acting like a jealous child throwing a temper tantrum and call off your army. And then what? Lucifer took a step forward. 
be thrown into a cell I could easily break out of, be banished to another realm I could escape in my sleep, or would you allow me to rejoin you in the heavens, where I'd spend my days playing by the rules like a good little angel? A menacing smile formed on his lips. Those options bore me. I'd rather take my chances here. There would be no convincing Lucifer to give up the fight. Even if he somehow managed to overcome his ego and admit his wrongdoings, his nature would always rule him in the end. He was unable to be anything other than a rebel. He enjoyed it too much. Chanting came from the rubble. The witches had gathered in a circle, standing where my study had once been. The very place Aza's soul had been freed from the ring and possessed Simon's body where he'd drawn his first breath after thousands of years. The summoning had begun. Baxter, Nada, and other warriors from their force bolted toward the witches. Demons met them along the way, creating a barrier between them and the summoning circle. Screeches came from behind me. Shades. They were attacking the warriors at the rear. Bursts of orange blazed as the low-level demons were cut down with ease. More kept spawning, though, keeping the warriors busy which, from a strategy standpoint, was the goal. Black shapes darted across the sky as enemy Nephilim dropped down, their swords drawn, and attacked our army's right flank. Water dragons charged toward the shore and dove into the cold sea. They manipulated the water to create a massive wave that crashed down on the land and dragged some of the enemy soldiers backward and down to the icy depths. Wolves from Bane's pack lunged at a group of mid-level demons, a saber-toothed-looking species, and ripped them to shreds, splattering the snow with their blood. A few wolves weren't so lucky, however. One was sliced in two by a demon wielding a battle axe. Howls followed the death. What are your orders, Al? Casta asked. Let the army take care of the enemy soldiers, I told all of them. Our only focus is Lucifer. Understood. Galen's head twitched to the side as wrath moved through him, preparing to take control. Simon stood behind him, the human's gaze darting around the battlefield in fear. It wasn't his first battle. He had even fought in the underworld, wielding a sword Raiden had given him. This was more intense. Dragons, werewolves, angels, vampires, and demons all tearing into each other. Normally, Galen would have never allowed his mate anywhere near the fighting, but that night was the exception because once our souls were transferred to Nightfall, we might not ever make our way back out. Yes, we will, Pride told me, growling a little. For him, for our angel. I turned to Lazarus. His eyes were on me, too. A battle waged around us, but I still noticed the scent of crisp late autumn air and the gentle tautness of winter apples. That time between the changing seasons. That's where we'd always exist. Stop looking at me like you're saying goodbye, Lazarus said. You made me a promise, and I expect you to keep it. Yes, sir. Your brothers all have pet names for their mates. He faintly smiled. And I'm still sir. I could always call you daddy. I was teasing, of course. I only wanted to see him smile. He snarled instead. Absolutely not. It was so much more pleasing than a smile because it was so him. Michael sprang toward Belphegor, both of them summoning their soul weapons. Swords of fire lit up the darkness as flames danced along the blades. The flames of Michael's turned blue. The celestial warriors clashed with the fallen angels. Flashes of white wings and black ones and gleams of steel were all that could be seen as they fought, moving too quickly for the eye to follow. Booms of thunder echoed in the valley as angels fell on both sides. Lucifer had retreated to where the witches continued to chant, his way of ensuring no one interfered with the spell. Are you ready? I asked Clara. She clutched a satchel that held the ingredients we needed for our own spell. Her hands shook a little. As ready as I'll ever be. You doubt your magic? No, I'm fully confident in my magic. That's what worries me. Her green eyes misted over. I don't want to lose my boys. Not for a stupid, senseless war like this. I rarely embraced people, but I wrapped my arms around Clara and pulled her in for a hug. Thank you for all you've done for us. 
You're the little sister I never had. She whimpered and pushed her face against my chest. When I met you guys, I was at a low point in my life. I just got out of a relationship and was grieving my grandmother's death. I didn't know where to go or what to do. I was so lost. And you boys found me. She clung to me tighter. Every moment has been worth it. Patching you jerks up when you got hurt. Having you all move in and eat all my food. Upping my utility bills. Dealing with zombies, ghouls, and demons. It's been the best adventure a girl could ever ask for. I wouldn't change a thing. Me either. Clara pulled back from me and steadied her quivering chin. Let's go kick Lucifer's ass. Chapter 22 Lazarus Lucifer and the witches were impossible to reach, impossible to stop. Anyone who got too close to the summoning circle was thrown backward. The black moon not only enhanced the magical energy for witches, but for all those with mana running through their veins. Which meant Lucifer was more powerful too. However, it also gave us an advantage. Ice dragons were already stronger during the winter, so the black moon fueled them even further. Demons with magic, like Phoenix, also felt those effects. He teleported around the battlefield, stabbing enemies and slashing throats quicker than they could see him. Fuck, he's amazing, Bellamy said with a smile. Blood streaked across his cheek from the Nephilim he'd just decapitated. Keep it in your pants, B. Damon spun in the air and landed a blow to a demon's face. His sword went through the demon's skull before sliding back out. Now's not the time to I fuck your mate. Warren shot a wall of ice at an approaching horde of shades, freezing them in place. He then cut through them with his sword, shattering them. Tiny explosions detonated in their chests as they died. Fuck, that's hot, Damon muttered. Now's not the time to I fuck your mate, Bellamy repeated in a mocking tone. Shut your ugly face. You know damn well this face ain't ugly. Damon rolled his eyes. More fighting, less chatting, I told them. Boo, that's no fun. When Bellamy glanced at me, his eyes, which had never reacted when our gazes met, transitioned to a familiar shade of blue. The seal had helped hide my desire for Alistair from lust. Now, he could read me like an open book. Alistair should be proud of himself. He managed to steal the icy heart of an angel. Though I admit, sensing desire from you is fucking weird. Pay attention, I snapped, just as a ten-foot-tall demon with a massive warhammer appeared behind him. Phoenix teleported in the air above the demon and shoved a dagger through the back of its bald head. The giant crashed to the ground, shooting up flurries of snow. Thanks, baby. Bellamy grabbed Phoenix by the collar and drew him in for a quick kiss. Anything for you, sweet Bellamy. Mason fired his gun, taking out demons with every silver bullet dislodged from the barrel. Another round of ammunition was clipped to his belt that held celestial bullets for his secondary weapon. Gray? Casta called out before slashing at a reptilian demon. The avatar of Sloth slumped in place, his eyelids fluttering open and closed. His energy reserve was close to being depleted, but he had a plan to combat that. With the last bit of his strength, he leapt onto the back of one of the giant demons and dug his fingertips into the beast's scalp. A glimmer of white passed from the demon and into gray. His power. The ability to drain someone's energy and absorb it himself. And since he targeted one of the biggest demons on the field, the energy he received would be enough to hold him over for another few hours. Callius threw his celestial-tipped spear, and it pierced the weak spot in the armor of a fallen angel. A direct hit to the heart. A snap of thunder filled the air as the angel soul exited their body. The former Spartan then lodged his xiphos into the belly of a serpent demon, sliding the blade upward through the guts to disembowel it. Titan grabbed an enemy Nephilim's face and crushed it with his titanium hand. He tossed the body aside before blocking a demon's spiked axe that had been coming down toward Nico's neck. Raiden took off the demon's head and struck at another. They didn't let Nico out of their sight. Much like me with all of them, one in particular. Alistair's graceful movements as he fought were remarkable to behold. He was elegant yet deadly in his strikes, each one precise. 
After taking down two insect-like demons, he smirked at me, blood streaking through his pale blonde hair. Are you going to gawk at me all night? Warmth gathered in my groin. Gods, he was delectable. You're my mate. I can gawk all I want. He chuckled before facing another foe. I sent my whip hurling toward a fallen angel. It caught her around the neck and singed into her skin before I flicked my wrist, causing the lashing to tighten and take off her head. Another boom of thunder. The battle surged on, bloody, brutal. Dead bodies piled up, some faces I knew, others I didn't. Vampires had lost their lives, as had members of the wolf pack. Lucifer's army had thinned as well, but the fighting continued. It wouldn't stop until that fateful event played out, until I lost those dearest to me. Con! Alistair shouted. He stood in the middle of two enemy Nephilim, fighting both at once. A fallen angel had grabbed the vampire by the back of his hair and flung him to the snow. There was a gleam as a sword was raised in the air and came down. Before it made contact, however, white wings with large gold-tipped feathers appeared and knocked the angel backward. Michael. You okay, vamp? he asked. Connor smiled as he stood from the ground, wiping blood from his lip. The wound sealed. I am now. Thank you. It would be a shame for a face like yours to leave this world, Michael said with a sly grin, before spinning toward an approaching group of upper-level demons. You're much too young to die so soon. Young? I think I'm in love. Connor situated himself on the other side of Michael, and the two of them fought back to back. Shouts drew my attention toward the right of the field. A spinning cyclone of ice blazed through some of our soldiers. Some were torn apart by the ice, their blood mixing with the whirlwind. Vepper was manipulating the weather, using it as a weapon. Dargan tackled Vepper to the ground. The tornado died as the fallen angel lost focus. They struggled in the snow, punching and slashing. Oliver joined them, two against one. Belfi! Vepper cried, reaching a hand toward him. Help me! Belphegor stood beside the rubble of the mansion and only stared at them. And then he turned away. Vepper's hand dropped back to the snow as shock flitted across his face. Then, sadness. The betrayal cut him deep. Belphegor didn't care if he lived or died. With a pained bellow, Vepper threw Dargan and Oliver off before lifting in the sky, using the air as a shield around his body. And then he left the battlefield, abandoning the cause. Sparkles left? Raiden asked. Hey, I'm not complaining, Castor responded. That's just one less strong motherfucker to deal with. Uh, guys? Gray pointed toward a pile of dead bodies. That's not what I think it is, is it? The fallen warriors scattered around us began to twitch. Bloody limbs spasmed before the dead began to rise. Bodies with only half their heads swayed once standing. A few warriors whose legs had been sliced off used their arms to drag them through the snow. Zombies? Lev groaned. Why is it always zombies? Better than ghosts, Warren told him. Right, my friend? Nope, Lev shook his head. Both equally suck. Try not to piss your pants, Lev, Ephraim, one of the ice dragon twins, said. But since you're scared, leave this to us. He then charged at them. Ivan, the other twin, smiled at his brother before following suit. The two of them cut down the zombies, using a combination of their swords and ice powers. I'm not scared, Lev muttered before screaming as one of the corpses dragging itself across the ground grabbed the back of his leg. A cackling laugh came from the shadows before bright green eyes appeared in the darkness. Pura stepped out from behind the garage and twirled his dagger. He licked the flat edge of the blade before tisking. Vappy boy will be punished for leaving us. Yes, he will. Let the dead rest in peace, I said. As anger flared in my chest, the voltage running through my whip sparked. Don't disrespect them this way. Lassie is worried. Pura's unnatural grin widened, showing his sharp teeth. I have an endless supply. Every warrior who falls becomes one of my children. Children? Bellamy kicked a zombie in the chest to knock it back. 
You sick fuck. Three wolves from Bane's pack then lunged at Pura. As they fought, I joined Alistair's side and sliced through more of the shades that had spawned from the shadows. We have to stop them, Clara shouted over the noise of battle. She stared in horror at the circle of witches. The spell is nearly complete. Galen, now possessed by wrath, broke through the line of demons acting as a barrier between him and the witches. More materialized in front of him and screamed as he tore off their arms, legs, and heads, as if the demons were made of clay instead of skin and bone. It still wasn't enough to reach Lucifer. Simon stood beside Clara and threw orbs filled with a sloshing dark liquid. When the orbs shattered, the liquid melted the demon's flesh. Other orbs exploded upon impact, her witch bombs. Branches from the trees closest to the fighting elongated and snatched up enemy soldiers by the ankles before ripping them apart. Daiichi, in his earth dragon hybrid form, had control over nature. Oliver's power was similar. The angel stood beside the dragon warrior and summoned a silver flute with gold runes etched along the sides. Music filled the air as he blew into it, and the earth rose up and swallowed the screeching shades that had been hurtling toward a group of vampires. The vampires nodded their gratitude to Oliver before flitting off toward another section of the battlefield. Everyone was fighting for their lives, fighting for humankind. If we failed that night, there wouldn't be much of a world left after Lucifer fully conquered it. I flung my whip toward Lucifer, and his eyes flashed bright blue as he deflected it. Telekinesis. Such a damn pain. I dove forward and tried again, managing to graze his cheek. Not that it did any harm. The boys were the only beings capable of hurting him. I then set my sights on the witches. If I could take them down, their link would be broken and the spell would fail. Belphegor realized my intention before I could act. He dropped down in front of me and batted me backward with his wings. I didn't fall, but I stumbled back a few steps. You can't win this fight, Lazarus. His brown eyes were devoid of all emotion, so different than those of his son. That's where you're wrong. I followed his movements, keeping a firm hold on my whip. Lucifer had a vision of his death. You know how this night ends. The future isn't set in stone, he responded. It can be changed. It's been done before. Aza saw a vision where he killed the cursed sons, and as you're aware, that never came to pass. Why do you remain loyal to Lucifer? The end of my whip caught him around the bicep, but he broke the hold before it could do much damage. If he succeeds tonight, he will kill the boys. He'll kill your son. That gave Belphegor pause. Morningstar will spare Graydon, he then said. I believe that given time, my boy will join our side. Perhaps once the bastards he calls brothers die. The chanting transitioned to a frenzied shouting before suddenly the witches stopped. Sparks of red and silver glinted in the center of the summoning circle before there was a blinding white light. Aza then materialized in the circle, equal parts confused and frightened. Shit! Castor exclaimed. We're too late! Break through the line! Alistair used his wings to gain speed, heading for the witches. He was stopped by more demons. Raiden ducked down low and charged into the line of enemies, using his broad shoulders to barrel into them like a linebacker. They went flying. Aza's attention darted to the battle waging before him, and when he tried to flee the circle, two of the witches grabbed him. Release me! Our guest of honor has arrived. Lucifer spoke in a cool tone. Fear gripped my heart. If Lucifer killed Aza, Nightfall would die with him. Everything we'd done up to that point would have been for nothing. See? Belphegor flashed a cold smile. You've already lost. Chapter 23 Alistair Fear stabbed at my chest as Lucifer stepped toward Aza. Don't worry your pretty little head. The demon in front of me smirked. He was one of the more powerful ones, a magic wielder. All will be over soon. And maybe I can persuade the boss to let me have some alone time with you before removing that pretty head. I have a better idea. I made eye contact with him and called forth pride. Remove your own, if you can. 
Your skin is so tough. I doubt anything could pierce it. The demon blinked at me before his eyes sparked purple, then glazed over. Without a moment's hesitation, he raised his sword to his throat and slid it. Blood bubbled out in the thick gushes before he dropped to his knees, pupils blowing wide. Lazarus and Belphegor fought nearby. I knew my mate was strong, but as Belphegor's fiery sword slashed through the air in front of his face, my breath caught. Lazarus leaned back just in time to dodge it before his whip snaked around the sword's hilt and yanked hard, disarming the fallen angel. You've always been weak, Belphegor growled. In a one-on-one -on -one match against me, you fall short. Yet here I stand with my weapon while yours disappears into the sea of battle. The whip pulsed as lightning zapped through it. So tell me who it is who falls short now. You've been spending too much time with that prideful prick of a mate. Rage filled Lazarus's eyes before he struck at him. Belphegor lifted a hand to block the lashing from catching around his neck. It wrapped around his wrist instead, burning into his skin. My attention was torn from Lazarus when three demons attacked me. I blocked their hits and ducked when one teleported behind me and tried to take off my head. By the time I dealt with them and looked back at Lazarus, Belphegor was no longer beside him. He returned to Lucifer's side, Lazarus told me telepathically, as if sensing my curiosity. Callius, who had trained hard over the past several months to master his power, then set melancholy loose. A debilitating grief rolled over the foes surrounding him. Some clutched their chests and released agonized howls. Others looked numb, sinking into such a deep depression that their foggy minds caused them to disassociate from everything. They glanced at their weapons before dropping them and walking away. Well done, I told him telepathically. Callius peered at me through the waves of enemies, many of whom continued to leave the field. I did it? Yes, and I'm so goddamn proud of you. He smiled. A rare sight. The moment was squashed as Aza Morningstar's yells of pain pierced the air. Stop! He screamed on his knees. He gripped his head. Please! Lucifer stood over him, his eyes glowing bright blue. It brings me no joy to cause you pain. Yet, it's the way it has to be. Accept my dearest apologies. Nix! Bellamy was a few feet away from me and frantically searched around him. Nix! And then I saw him. Phoenix teleported directly behind Aza and touched his shoulder. Lucifer had been too focused on his son to notice anyone approaching. A mix of hope and nerves swirled in my gut. The demon had a habit of popping in just when we needed him most. No! Lucifer's eyes blazed brighter and a blast of magic projected from his body. Phoenix disappeared right before that blast hit, taking Aza with him. They then appeared between me and Bellamy. You fucking idiot! Bellamy threw his arms around his mate, body shaking. Don't ever do that again! I love you too, Phoenix said, embracing my brother. He nuzzled Bellamy's jaw before glancing at Aza. I never thought I'd risk myself to save your sorry ass, but here we are. Do you expect me to say thank you? Aza curled his upper lip. He was trembling, though, whether from the aftershock of the pain Lucifer inflicted or from his relief that it had stopped. I didn't ask for any of this. I was minding my own business, eating a platter of very delicious donuts, before being yanked from my bed and brought here. You eat donuts in bed? Bellamy asked. Aren't you worried about the sheets getting sticky? That's beside the point. Aza held his chin higher. And not everyone is a slob like you. My sheets are clean. A smirk landed on Bellamy's lips then you aren't having nearly enough fun in them. Lust always found a way to steer the conversation back to sex. Aza's gaze fell to nightfall at my hip. For a moment, I was worried he would call it back to him, something he was very capable of doing as the holder of the sword. His crimson eyes lifted back to my face. Take that sword and plunge it into my father's chest. Make him pay for the hell he's put both of us through. I will. He nodded to me. Strange, but I almost felt a type of truce form between us in that moment. Our goals had temporarily aligned. We both wanted Lucifer dead, so he couldn't destroy the world, so he couldn't hurt us anymore. For selfish reasons, too. Revenge. 
Lazarus stepped up beside me, keeping his eyes on Aza. Go with Michael. He'll guard you until the battle's over. I don't need to be protected, Aza retorted. Even without my powers, I'm- Save it, I snapped. We all have our roles in this fight. Staying alive is yours. So swallow your pride and do as you're told. Michael appeared beside him, having used his teleportation ring. I'll even be nice and buy you dinner after. Aza rolled his eyes. The two of them then vanished. Where? I wasn't sure, but as long as it was away from the fighting, that's all that mattered. At least until we completed our mission. Around us, warriors from both armies clashed. More blood and death. There was only one way to end it. Clara had said the best time to perform the soul transfer spell was right before midnight, when the energy from the black moon would be at its peak, straddling the time frame between this year and the next. It's time, I told my brothers. Several emotions hit me at once. Sadness, anxiety, but the strongest? Determination. We had all made our decision, and it was time to fulfill our purpose. We were the only ones who could. Bellamy tugged Phoenix against him. This isn't the end. So why does it feel like it is? The demon softly whimpered and hid his face against Bell's neck. For once, don't be a hero. Let me teleport you away from this godforsaken battlefield. Away from Lucifer, that cursed black sword, and every goddamn person who wants to hurt you. We can go to that house on the beach where we spent our honeymoon. Fuck the world. Just stay with me. I can't. Bellamy patted the back of his dark auburn hair. But gods, I wish I could. A life with you is all I want. And blowjobs. Lots of blowjobs. Phoenix released a gravelly chuckle that rang more with sadness than anything else. Don't make me laugh. But I love your laugh. Come here. Castor pulled Keo closer and touched the horns jutting from his black hair. His fingertips then danced along the blue and green scales along Keo's cheek. Gods, you're so beautiful like this little dragon. Don't do this, Red. Keo swallowed hard. We said we weren't going to be star-crossed lovers with a tragic ending. We were going to make our own destiny, remember? So how the fuck am I supposed to let you walk away from me right now, huh? Castor's tender expression turned pained. I have no intention of joining the list of tragic heroes. You and me will get our happy ending. We just gotta hurt a little first. A little? Keo pressed their bodies together. This is a lot more than that. My heart's breaking. Hey, look at me. Casta tilted Keo's face up. We've been through a lot worse than this. Remember when that asshole ice dragon almost married you instead of me? I heard that. Warren mumbled, his arms around Damon. He lowered his face to my brother's hair, breathed him in. It was an impulse I knew well. A mate's scent soothed the soul like nothing else could. I can't let you go. You have to. Damon looked up at him. No. Warren cupped his cheek. I will wait right here until you return to me. And if I don't? His voice shook. You have the rest of your life to live. There is no life without you, Katya. My heart, my soul, both will cease to exist. Damon hadn't told Warren about the possibility of the spell breaking, but the ice dragon held on to hope anyway. Raiden and Titan held each other not far from us. My brother comforted his husband as Titan's large body shook with muffled cries. Seeing someone like Titan who rarely showed strong emotion, break down like that, yanked at my heartstrings. As Nico approached, Raiden pulled him in too. Be good, yeah? He told the boy. I'm always good. Nico's bottom lip trembled. Callius stood off to the side with a look of indifference. I felt his heart aching, though. What we were about to do would prevent him from joining Alassus in the afterlife. If the spell couldn't be reversed, the only way out for us would be for the sword to be destroyed, which would only happen if Aza was slain. But we would die with it. Galen had drawn Simon close and created a cocoon around them with his wings. Gray held on to Mason while Mason petted his wild blonde curls. So many goodbyes. Connor's theory about our wills being strong enough to break the spell was only that, a theory. 
This may be the last time they spoke to their mates. Don't think about it, I told myself. I couldn't afford to lose my nerve. I turned to Clara. She had just thrown another witch bomb into a group of enemy Nephilim. It's time for us to begin. Wait for my signal. We needed to weaken Lucifer's defenses first before dealing the final blow. The timing had to be just right. Oh no, she whimpered. Do we really have to do this? Yes. There's no changing your mind, is there? She exhaled, then did it again, trying to calm herself. She hated sentimental moments. Fine, but I'm not happy about this. In fact, I'm pissed at you, Alistair. I don't know if I should punch you or hug you. This isn't how I saw this going down. The good guys are supposed to win. We will, I told her, regardless of whether I was around to see it. Her green eyes moved to something over my shoulder before she squeezed my arm and turned to Serena. The female Nephilim embraced her as the tears she held back in my presence finally burst free. Winter apples. My eyes stung as I caught his scent on the cold air. I didn't want to face him. If I did, I might not be able to keep my emotions in check. Now's the time to strike Lucifer. We're going to synchronize like we did in Transylvania to weaken him before Clara casts the spell. Silence. Such a strange thing to notice while in the middle of a battle. The back of my neck tingled as Lazarus moved closer. His lips brushed my nape. My soul ached and my sternum squeezed. My brothers had said goodbye to their mates. It was time for me to do the same. It hurt much more than I expected. Being with you has been... What I mean is... I struggled to find the words that conveyed just how deeply I loved him. Because my feelings went so much deeper than love. He had been with me for thousands of years. Now, I had to leave him. Alistair. He pressed against my back and trailed his fingertips down my arm. Turn around and look at me. I can't. My voice cracked. One look into your eyes right now will break me into pieces. Breaking isn't always a bad thing, Lazarus said. Sometimes it's necessary in order to build yourself up stronger. But if you break and find you're unable to mend those pieces... His arms came around me. Lean on me. We'll shatter together. If I fall, you'll fall with me, I said. But where I'm going, you can't follow. Watch me. An inflated ego is my thing. You're supposed to be the level-headed one who brings me back down from the clouds. He chuckled low. A friend once told me nothing is impossible. I'd like to believe that's true. Otherwise, I won't be able to let you walk away from me. Finally, I faced him. Long, pale lashes surrounded his blue eyes, and specks of gold swirled from the irises. I memorized every detail, smooth skin, white hair, a slight rosiness to his cheeks, and soft pink lips. His features blurred as tears sprang to my eyes. You have my heart. And you have mine. Lazarus rested our foreheads together. You always have. Our love hasn't been easy, I said. It's been complicated, messy, and painful at times. But it's also perfectly imperfect and real. It's the realest thing I've ever felt. With pride, you strive for perfection, yet accept that we aren't perfect. That's what makes it beautiful. My soul vibrated, grew restless, as if it knew we were about to be torn apart. Tears rolled down my cheeks as I hugged him, wishing we had more time. I will find my way back to you. Because this, between you and me, it's the messy, all-consuming love I've always dreamed of. Lazarus grabbed my jaw in that familiar way of his. His intense stare made my insides quake. Keep your promise. Yes, sir. He rewarded me with a half-smile. Good boy. Fuck if that didn't make me melt. It made me break a little, too. With a small forward push of my head, I kissed him. It ended much too soon. 
As I pulled from his lips and turned my back to him, there was a high-pitched ringing in my ears. The lump in my throat constricted my airway. Every muscle in my body protested with each step I took away from him, screaming for me to return to his arms, to kiss him one last time. But I didn't. I couldn't. I love you, Lazarus told me telepathically. I knew he stared after me. I broke a little more. I love you too. Lucifer stood at the front of the roaring battle, barking orders to his subordinates. He told the witches to find Aza. When one answered that another summoning spell that soon was impossible, his eyes flashed brighter and the woman's head exploded, bloody chunks landing on the witches around her. My king, Belphegor touched his arm. We, you believe you can escape my wrath because we're fucking? Lucifer's hard tone caused the other male to flinch. Find my bastard of a son, or your head will be the next to paint the snow. Belphegor nodded once. Yes, my king. He released his large black wings and lifted into the air. Lucifer shouted more orders to the witches. His composure had cracked, revealing the nervous desperation underneath. As my brothers and I neared him, his cold eyes darted to me. You think you've won? I know I have. I stopped a few feet from him. You know it too. I'm the master of my own fate. Lucifer stood proudly, his chin tipped up. Neither you nor anyone else will change that. Look around you. I motioned to the dead bodies and then to the warriors still locked in combat. Is this the world you wanted? One with chaos and death? I only wanted freedom. At first... Lucifer dropped his gaze to Lightbringer, gliding a finger along the hilt. But then my ambition grew. I was the most powerful angel in the celestial realm, yet these weak-minded beasts called humans had more say over their lives than I did. It repulsed me. Why settle for freedom when I can rule? When I can force humankind to kneel to me? You'll never stop, will you? I asked, hoping he'd see reason, but knowing he wouldn't. You will burn the whole world down just to prove that you're better than they are. That's where you're wrong, my boy. He smirked. I'll burn the world down just because it's fun. Then we have no choice but to stand against you. I unsheathed Nightfall. I call this checkmate. The game is far from over. A wicked smile twisted his features. The only way this night ends is with the eight of you dead at my feet. Big words. Galen rolled his shoulders, his irises flickering to black and swallowing the whites of his eyes. Wrath had shared control with him while saying goodbye to Simon, but it consumed him once again. Let's see if you can back them up. Bring it on, Lucy, Casta said, gripping his golden dagger. We've kicked your ass once and can do it again. It's interesting. Lucifer gave a slight tilt of his head. When I was shown the vision of my death, I saw all of you motionless around me. Which means one thing. You can only beat me by sacrificing yourselves in the process. As he unsheathed Lightbringer, the blade hummed. So you see, win or lose, None of you will live to see morning. We'll do whatever's necessary to stop you, I told him. We'll pay any price. Heroes to the very end. Lucifer almost looked impressed by that. Unfortunately, that sacrifice will be in vain. His blue eyes fell to me. You were my son once. Not by blood, but I raised you as my own. For that reason alone, I will offer you one final chance to stop this nonsense and take your place by my side. Memories flitted through my head of Lucifer smiling over me as we ate our meals. I recalled him sitting by my bed the time I'd caught a cold as a boy before my Nephilim healing powers had kicked in. So many moments, all special in their own way. But they had been lies, just part of the manipulation. Enough talking. Galen's head twitched, and a ripple went through his muscles. The only sound I want to hear is you choking on your blood. 
He then bolted forward. Wrath had reached his limit and needed to expel his rage or he'd go mad with it. Lucifer threw him back using only his mind, but Galen jumped back to his feet, even more pissed and stronger than before. He lunged again. The dark witches swarmed around us, or tried to. Clara and Serena cut through them. The ones who weren't blown apart by Clara's witch bombs or decapitated by Serena then tucked tail and ran. It allowed us to focus solely on Lucifer. Casta ducked low and struck at him. Then Raiden joined them. Callius slashed at Lucifer as Raiden was thrown backward. His blade skated across Lucifer's fair skin, not leaving a scratch. This was how it began. How we tapped into the synchronized style of fighting that would allow us to defeat him. Damon added his blade to the mix, followed by Grey, who had absorbed more energy from a demon to ensure he'd be alert enough during the most important fight of our lives. Bellamy and I then leapt forward. None of us left a mark on Lucifer, but we would eventually, because I had seen it all play out. I had seen every detail of this moment. The end had reached us at last. It was poetic, really. My brothers and I would give everything in the place we'd called home for so many years. Our safe haven would be the location of our last stand. An absolute good or evil didn't exist. We were all capable of becoming monsters if provoked enough. Lucifer had taught me that. It was why I couldn't fully hate him, despite everything that had happened. It was why Michael sometimes spoke of Lucifer with a sorrowful ache in his eyes. Why Lazarus had created an eternal spring as his prison when we'd caged him. Lucifer had meant something to all of us once. Killing him would be, in many ways, killing those memories of him as well. As my brothers and I circled him, attacking one after the other, I didn't strike him with hatred in my heart. Was I angry? Yes. But I didn't allow that ire to consume me. Not anymore. Perhaps, even after thousands of years, I still had room to grow. As a warrior. As a man. Are you all right? I asked Lazarus. Don't worry about me. Focus on the fight with Lucifer. So bossy. Always. Hearing his voice, even telepathically, gave me a boost of strength. If we were anyone else, Lucifer would have defeated us easily. But the curse in our blood counteracted with his own abilities. His powers weren't as potent. Same for us and our sins against him. It was why I couldn't unleash pride's full potential on him and persuade him to do whatever I wanted. Keep going. I told my brothers. Allow your sins to guide you. We need to trigger the synchronization. Maybe it was partly due to the power of the black moon, but I felt stronger. Physically, but mentally too. That strength then flowed into pride. I sensed him reaching out to the other sins. Like they were his brothers too. His family. Our movements quickened. Galen attacked, then Raiden. Callius and Castor dove in together before Damon leapt high in the air and brought his fox sword down, the curved tip grazing Lucifer's throat but not breaking his skin. Grey kept his small body low as he sprung forward and quickly slashed before darting away. Bellamy wielded dual blades, slashing with one and blocking Lightbringer's attack with the other. His sword creaked as it locked with Lucifer's, as though the blade was on the verge of snapping. Motherfucker! He shoved against Lucifer before leaping back to put distance between them. Lightbringer then dug into Galen's bicep. My brother roared and went even more ballistic, his fists blurring as he punched Lucifer at an inhuman speed. Castor and Damon attacked from above, and Lucifer used his powers to throw them aside. Damon smacked into a tree and slid to the snow with a pained grunt. Damon! Warren yelled from behind us, but was held back by Lev. Damon got to his feet, keeping his eyes away from his mate. I felt how much that hurt him, way more than being slammed into the tree had. But if he looked at Warren, he'd become distracted. And here I believed pesky felines always landed on their feet, Lucifer said, head cocked in interest. Though I suppose you're more wolf than kitten, Dachian. Whatever you want to call me, I'm still prettier than you. Damon readied his sword as his green eyes darkened a shade. His voice had deepened too, a sign envy had taken him over. 
As my brothers and I began to sink, joining our minds and fighting as one force, something happened. Our strength increased, while Lucifer's diminished. His telekinesis became less effective, too. When he tried to send Gray flying away from him, he only managed to cause him to stumble back a few steps. We were weakening him, just as I knew we would. Strike him now, I yelled above the noise. Warriors battled behind us, angels against fallen angels, Nephilim, vampires, wolves, and demons clashing. More bodies piled up, the cold air doing little to mask the stench of death. Bellamy sliced with his twin blades, cutting both of Lucifer's sides at once. Two lines of blood beaded on Lucifer's skin. That first drawl of blood told me it was time. Clara! I shouted. She stood away from the cluster of battle where she'd set up an altar for the spell. Do it now! Do what? Lucifer spat. He had seen nightfall in his vision, but he didn't know the details of how we needed to use it. And ruin the surprise? I swung at him, and even though he tried to dodge, I caught him on his forearm, drawing a bit more blood. Just know, it'll be one hell of a finale. Casta stabbed him in the small of his back, the golden dagger digging into the hilt. Lucifer gasped before striking at him. Lightbringer cut across Caster's chest. Keo screamed from nearby. Caster! It's all good, little dragon. Caster placed a hand over his chest, and blood seeped through the cracks of his fingers. The injury wasn't imminently fatal, but the sword had cut deep. If he didn't get medical aid soon, he'd bleed out. Just a scratch. Raiden caught him as he slumped over. I've got you. Thanks, Ray. Castor gritted his teeth, tapping into every ounce of strength he had left to stay standing. We gotta keep fighting. Gray stabbed Lucifer in the stomach. Callius pierced his ribcage. Damon struck from the front, cutting across Lucifer's abdomen. The weapons broke his skin just like they'd done in Transylvania. But this time, he wouldn't heal and walk away from the fight. None of us would walk away from it. Clara's chanting reached my ears. She spoke the words that would bind us to nightfall. We had minutes left at most. I tightened my grip on the sword and clashed with Lucifer as my brothers each took turns stabbing him, pinning him in place. Alistair, Callius said with a rasp, swaying a bit. His eyes glazed over and he lost the grip on his sword. I feel strange. Something broke in my chest then. It's okay, brother. His dark eyes focused on me again and he faintly smiled. It's been an honor fighting by your side. And then he dropped to his knees, back arching. A dark, shimmering cloud lifted off his chest and flowed into nightfall. One of the clear stones on the hilt turned black. Callius' body fell to the snow, lifeless. Cal! Gray knelt beside him. What is this? Fear shone in Lucifer's eyes as he stared at the now black stone. This? With my heart squeezing painfully in my chest, I blocked another hit. Energy hummed along the blade, strengthened by my brother's soul. This is the final curtain. For all of us. I knew the order in which each of my brothers would fall, but that knowledge didn't take away the pain of it. Time seemed to slow as I stared at them, remembering the years we had spent together, as boys, then as men. Raiden cooking and smiling as we all sat together to eat. Gray cuddling up to each of us when he got sleepy. Caster's uninhibited mouth that got him into trouble too many times to count, but he never failed to make any situation entertaining. Bellamy and Damon's bantering. Galen's fierce protectiveness over us. And Callius' soft smiles in the rare instances melancholy gave him a reprieve from the crushing sadness. We had just gotten him back, only to lose him again but we'd all be lost that night. Galen snarled and slammed into Lucifer's side before his strength began to wane. He fought against it, confused at first. Is this it? He then asked me telepathically. Yes. Pain. Heartache. It was overwhelming as I saw my brother stumble. In Galen's last moments, one of his black eyes shifted back to light gray. He found Simon, who stood beside Clara at the altar. A low whimper left Galen before he slowly sank to the snow. Red mist then flowed from his chest and into nightfall, coloring one of the clear stones red. No, Simon cried. Galen! 
Baxter landed beside Simon and held him back. The human fought against his hold, tears pouring down his cheeks as he screamed Galen's name over and over. Stop this! Lucifer tried to teleport, but his body only flickered before solidifying again. He was too weak. I wish I could, I said, not recognizing my voice. No amount of time could have prepared me for that moment. I'd give anything to spare my brothers and their mates this pain. Pride whined from inside me. Was he mourning his brothers too? Shit. Castor rocked forward, losing a bit of color in his cheeks. He'd lost more blood too. It flowed down his torso. His green eyes darted around the battlefield, looking for Keo. I knew he'd spotted him when his bottom lip quivered. Castor! Keo fought against King Tatsuya, trying to approach. Please don't leave me! Don't cry, little... As Castor fell to his knees, a shimmering gold mist traveled from his body and into one of the stones. The following cry from his mate was gut-wrenching. I screamed and slashed at Lucifer, tears obscuring my vision. Three of my brother's souls had now been absorbed, strengthening Nightfall even more. It clashed with Lightbringer and held strong, forcing Lucifer backward. When Damon fell, Warren's agonized cry was heart-shattering. Katya! Gods, no! Release me, Lev! I order you to release me! No! I can't, Lev responded, voice shaking. That's an order I can't obey, Commander. He has to do this. No! Warren then transformed into a full-sized dragon, knocking back a large group of enemy warriors. And as he roared, he froze all of them solid before breaking them into pieces. Tears welled in his large reptilian eyes. All of you will sacrifice your lives, and for what? Lucifer blocked an attack before shoving against me. For filthy humans? For a better world, so others can live peaceful, simple lives. A life I might not ever get to have, but our actions that night would ensure others got that chance. Humankind has its faults, but it's worth saving. You're such a fool, Lucifer responded. You have all this power and do nothing with it. You're wrong. I ducked beneath his sword before rolling to the side to dodge another swing. This is what I'm doing with my power. What we're doing, my brothers and I. We're standing between you and the end of the world. Our swords clanked. If I thought for even a moment you could change, this night would have turned out differently. But you never will. If this were a bedtime story with a happily ever after, Lucifer would have seen the error of his ways and repented. He and I would have embraced each other as family instead of clashing as foes. But reality never played out like it did in fairy tales. Some people were beyond redemption. Clara's voice rose higher as she continued the spell. Lucifer ordered demons to target her, but Serena, Baxter, Nada, and King Tatsuya created a barrier around the altar and protected her. Al? Gray's voice filled my head. His small body slumped to the snow. I think it's got me. I'm scared. Don't be scared, little one, I told him, fighting the sharp, piercing ache in my sternum. I couldn't breathe. I'll be with you soon. His big brown eyes held my gaze before closing. They didn't open again. A light blue aura lifted from him before joining the other souls in the sword. Bellamy was next. As he lost his strength and sank to his knees, Phoenix's name formed on his lips. He grabbed the key around his neck before his head lolled forward. A royal blue mist flowed from him. Raiden looked at me with tears shining in his eyes. Looks like it's just me and you now. My words caught in my throat. We had seconds left, and I couldn't say a word to him. I'd never been good at goodbyes. A tear rolled down his cheek. See you again soon, brother. Raiden thrust his sword into Lucifer's spine before he too fell to the ground. As his soul was called from his body, the second to the last stone in the hilt turned orange. For the first time since meeting them as boys, I was alone. I couldn't feel them anymore. Couldn't sense our mind link. It was as though they died and left me behind. How peculiar... Blood dripped from between Lucifer's lips as he was pinned in place by seven swords, all protruding from different parts of his body. He wheezed and met my gaze, his eyelids weighing heavier. 
I've never felt so cold before. My skin itched like something was poking at me from the inside, searching for a way out. Lazarus. I swayed unsteadily on my feet, the toes of my boots sinking deeper into the snow. I couldn't tell him how I felt. I couldn't tell him that I was scared. I'm with you, he responded. I sensed him approaching. My heart thrummed at that, though the beats had slowed considerably. Mustering the last of my strength, I plunged Nightfall into Lucifer's chest. He jolted and spat blood. You did it, Lucifer said, breaths ragged as he stared at the blade. I did. However, pride took no joy from the victory, not when so much had been lost to achieve it. I wonder. Lucifer's voice was barely audible. Will I see my Azazel on the other? His eyes shut and his head drooped forward. The sword was still lodged into his chest. My brother's souls were preventing him from healing himself. He was so close to death. But one last soul was needed to deal the final blow. Unable to hold myself up anymore, I fell to my knees. Warm arms came around me from behind. And as I smelled winter apples, I emitted a small cry. I felt so weak and was only growing weaker. I turned my head to the side, meeting Lazarus's watery gaze. You're here. I am. I'm not leaving you. I tried to smile, but couldn't. Did I do good? Yes, Lazarus said as a tear slipped free. You did so good. I slumped against him as my eyes closed. I felt so weightless. And then I felt nothing at all. Chapter 24 Lazarus The last stone in Nightfall's hilt transitioned to purple. Alistair's soul. The eight stones glowed brighter before there was a booming clash of thunder. Lucifer was dead. Silence fell over the battlefield. Upper-level demons vanished. Many of the enemy Nephilim fled. The only ones from Lucifer's army who stayed were the remaining fallen angels. They stared at their fallen king in shock. But then they began to leave too. Pura slunk into the shadows, using them to escape one of his abilities. So be it. Let him flee like a coward. I didn't care anymore. I was too numb to care. Clara staggered toward the boys' bodies before losing her footing. Her chest heaved as she tried to breathe. She screamed instead. She gathered Gray in her arms and cried into his hair, rocking back and forth in the snow. Mason dropped down beside her. The former Marine normally kept his emotions at bay, but he couldn't hold in his pain in that moment. None of them could. Phoenix pulled Bellamy against him and released a broken yell, his eyes flashing red. The tree in front of him caught fire. Warren cradled Damon's body. He had reverted to his human form, but as he silently cried, the tears crystallized on his cheeks. His silver eyelashes shone like ice. King Tatsuya stood behind Kyo, hand resting on his head. Kyo held Castor, muffled cries leaving him as he hid his face in Castor's red hair. I told you not to leave me, Red. Why can't you just listen for once? Alistair was still in my arms. With a trembling hand, I brushed aside a strand of his pale blonde bangs. My chest was so tight. Something built inside me. A cry. A scream, a complete breakdown, I didn't know. But as it built, I pressed my face to my mate's cheek, his cold cheek. You promised me. I gently rocked him, as if that would somehow make his eyes open, somehow bring warmth back to his skin. By the gods, you better not break it. You better return to me. What do you mean? Mason asked. Clara had handed Gray over to him. Return how? 
The boys hadn't shared that detail with their mates, thinking it cruel to give them false hope. They can break the spell, Phoenix said. Can't they? Y'all better not be bullshitting me. Simon took off his glasses and wiped at his eyes with his coat sleeve before curling beside Galen. Because my heart can't take it. There's no guarantee it will work, Clara said with a sad shake of her head. Which is why they didn't tell you. But it could, Titan said, holding Raiden. Nico knelt beside them, his cheeks stained with tears. They can come back to us. Tell us what we need to do, Keo said. I'll do anything. Same. Mason said. I'll do anything. Kill anyone. Whatever. Phoenix nuzzled the top of Bellamy's golden hair. I just want him returned to me. That's the thing. Clara glanced at the boys. We can't do anything. They're the only ones who can reverse the spell. How will they do that from inside the sword? Titan asked. Sheer willpower, the witch answered. Their souls are connected to each of you. That will help call them out. How long will that take? Mason's distant voice matched his expression. He petted Gray's hair as he stared down at him. Minutes? Hours? Clara glanced up at the sky. But it needs to happen before the first light of dawn. The spell was cast beneath a black moon, so it must also be undone beneath one. Michael materialized beside me. Aza was with him. My friend stared at the boys, his hard expression cracking around the edges. Well, I'll be damned, Aza said, his crimson eyes sweeping across the scene before him. He then eyed Lucifer. Lightbringer had broken a pot upon his death. They killed him. Warren glared up at him. If you intend to gloat, I will rip out your heart. Asa put his hands up. Hey, I have no love for them, but this is a pretty shitty turn of events. I felt a connection beginning to form with pride right before... Well, this. Go away, Simon mumbled at him. Is that any way to speak to family? Asa responded. You're no family of mine. Simon rested a hand on Galen's neck. My family is gone. I gently laid Alistair down before pushing to my feet and going over to Lucifer. I pulled Nightfall from his chest and stared at the colorful stones. My vision blurred as I brushed my thumb over the purple one. That's where Alistair was. His body was just an empty vessel. A boom sounded from behind me. Uriel, Raphael, and Salafiel had arrived. Clouds had rolled in, and flurries began to fall from the dark sky, landing in their white and gold feathers. They actually did it, Uriel said shocked. They defeated the Morning Star. Yes. Nightfall was heavy, as all soul weapons were to those who weren't permitted to wield them. But my soul sensed his inside, trapped. And they gave everything for it. It was difficult to celebrate the end of the war when my heart had withered away. With Lucifer defeated, the world would again know peace. But at what cost? A selfish part of me felt the cost had been too high. A dark shape flew above us before Belphegor landed beside Lucifer. He stared in disbelief before crumpling to the ground and pulling Lucifer against him. You took my king. My light and then his brown-eyed gaze fell to Gray. That one hit him the hardest. Graydon, what have you done? A cry then tore from his throat. I never thought I'd see Belphegor so broken. As he clutched Lucifer and stared at his son's lifeless body, he was lost to grief. I related all too well. I was in love with Alistair, but he wasn't the only one I'd lost that night. I had lost all my boys. Your son helped correct your wrongdoings, Uriel told him. Snow caught in the strands of his brown hair. For that, he and the others are heroes who will be honored in the heavens. Including Bellamy? Phoenix asked. He made it with a filthy demon, after all. Uriel's gaze dropped to him. You fought bravely beside our army tonight, demon. 
Regardless of my feelings toward your kind, you have my gratitude for that. Shove that gratitude up your ass, Phoenix said with a snarl. It does nothing for me. I'd rather you find a way to bring him back to me. You promised if they defeated Lucifer, all would be forgiven. And so it is. Uriel's eyes flickered to gold, then back to their original green shade. But speak to me like that again, and I'll send you screaming into the fiery pit. Warren grabbed Phoenix's arm, shaking his head when their eyes met. Damon and Bellamy had shared a close connection, fitting that their mates would also share a bond. Please come back to me, I tried to say to Alistair, but our mind link had faded. My thoughts couldn't reach him, and gods it hurt. Belphegor lifted his head as Michael approached him. Just kill me already. I'm done fighting. I've lost everything. Death is too good for you, Michael said, yanking Belphegor to his feet. You will live with your pain a while longer. He nodded to Uriel and the others before using his teleportation ring to take him and Belphegor away, probably to the celestial prison where the fallen angel would await further sentencing. Where do you think you're going? Doggin said, grabbing Aza's wrist. Trying to sneak away? Not gonna happen. Aza flashed a sheepish grin. Can't blame a guy for trying. Uh-huh. Doggin yanked Aza's arms behind his back and slapped cuffs on him. Remember our deal, Aza said to me. I helped you defeat my father. I forget nothing, son of Lucifer. The council will review your sentence, taking that into consideration. I looked at Uriel. Right? The archangel nodded. It will be done. He then turned to Dargan. Take him back to the palace for now. Yes, sir. Dargan lifted into the air. Aza's complaints about being manhandled faded the farther they flew. Uriel's gaze then shifted to Penemule, who stood between Baxter and Clara. You survived the battle. I did. Penemule had been stabbed in the arm and slashed across his thigh, but he'd fought well. It was the first time he and Uriel had spoken since he'd defected. So many years I've spent evading you. I suppose it's time for me to face the Council's judgment at long last. Uriel's gaze narrowed, and there was a tick in his jaw. As tempting as it is to string you up and pass down a fitting punishment for your crimes against the realm, Michael tells me you've changed. He's a blundering fool most days, but I respect his judgment. And considering your help in the war against the Morning Star, I'm inclined to agree with him. So, for the time being, consider your wrongs pardoned. But no, if you step one toe out of line, I will take your head. Penemuel responded to him, but I lost interest. Sadness ate at my insides. My chest felt hollow. The ones responsible for our victory were no longer with us. It wasn't fair. The wind stirred at my back before Connor appeared. He frowned at nightfall. Their souls are screaming for release. You can hear their thoughts? I asked. In a manner of speaking, yes, Connor answered. I can read the minds of those around me. There are a few exceptions, but that's beside the point. He waved his hand around. Although they aren't in their bodies, their thoughts still reach me. Faintly, but they're there. More so, I'm sensing the feelings associated with their thoughts. Mostly, a deep longing for their mates. My connection to Alistair's mind had been broken, but if the vampire was still able to pick up something from him, from all of them then maybe we had a chance to reach them, to help them fight and return to us. Connor's stare lingered on the last stone in the hilt. Did he hear Alistair? Or perhaps he simply missed him. The vampire is on to something. Raphael stepped toward me, his white wings softly ruffling as they fanned behind him. His magenta eyes moved to nightfall. May I? I reluctantly handed it over. What will you do? Me? There's little I can do. Raphael examined the blade before touching each of the colored stones. But if the vampire can hear their thoughts, that tells me they're cognizant enough to probably hear us too. I have an idea that may help call their souls out. He looked at the boy's mates. 
Please bring their bodies over and lay them in front of me. Warren carried Damon over, followed by Phoenix with Bellamy. Mason placed Gray beside Bellamy before he and Titan helped Simon bring over Galen. Raiden, Callius, and Castor were then placed beside them. Once all the brothers were lying side by side, I laid Alistair at the end of the row. My chest tightened as I moved his bangs aside again. He was too still. Even in sleep, he had always registered my touch with a subtle smile or sleepy grumble. I'd give anything for one of those little grumbles now. Raphael placed Nightfall on the ground above their heads. He then walked over to each of their bodies, placed his hand on their chest, and projected healing energy into them. The wound on Castor's chest didn't fully close. Not even an archangel like Raphael, with his specialty in healing, could fully mend an injury caused by Lightbringer, but he replenished the lost blood and strengthened his body. Whether this will work, I don't know, but it's worth a try. Raphael rose from the ground and stepped out of the way. Each of you needs to approach the sword and speak to your mates. Speak to them? Mason asked. Yes, Raphael answered. Your souls are bound together, correct? There's great power in the bond between faded mates. If you call out to them, it may be the push they need to override the spell. That could work, Kana said. Sometimes a person's will can be stronger than any spell. Warren stepped toward the sword. Like when Aza drank my blood and placed me under hypnosis. He ordered me to kill Damon, but I eventually broke through the fog and returned to my senses, because nothing in this world could ever make me hurt him. He knelt in the snow and touched the green stone. Caught you? The color swirled, as if responding to his voice. A sad smile crossed the ice dragon's face. The war's finally over. We can return to our cottage. To our home. The green churned faster before growing brighter. I know you wish to start a family. I never got the chance to tell you I want that too. I want to see you become a father and teach our child about the forest and herbs. I can teach them swordplay, but only for fun, for they will never know a war like this one. We'll be better fathers than our own ever were. But right now, what I want most is to hold you in my arms again. There was a bright green flush before a shimmering mist flowed into Damon's body, and the stone where his soul had been, clear once more. War? Damon croaked as his eyelids fluttered open. Releasing a soft cry, Warren crushed him to his chest. I'm right here, Katya. Just like you said you'd be. Damon nuzzled his neck. My commander. Relief slammed into me so hard it took my breath. My entire body shook with it, and a ball of emotion lodged in my throat. I understood it then, why each of the boys had found their faded mates during the war. It was for this moment, so those mates would be able to save them from an eternity of nothingness. Yay! Raphael beamed with a smile and lightly clapped. It worked. The rest of you should try now. Zalafiel peered up at the sky. I sense the astrological energy beginning to shift. The moon's power won't last forever. Simon went next. He touched the red gem. Hey, big guy. It glowed a little. You and Wrath need to get out of this sword. It's cold out here. The red swirled. Simon smiled as his glasses fogged up. Return to me so you can warm me up. You wouldn't want me catching a cold, would you? Red mist flowed from the stone and back into Galen's body. When his eyes opened, one was light gray and the other was black. Simon crawled over to him and was instantly tugged down and enclosed in Galen's big arms. I fought the urge to rush over to Nightfall and speak to Alistair. My mate would be pissed if I released his soul before his brother's. So I ground the heels of my boots into the snow and waited, composed on the outside and incredibly impatient on the inside. However, seeing the boys awaken one by one brought me joy. After all the battles, stress, and sacrifices made, they deserved this. They deserved to be happy. Mason? Gray asked, struggling to open his eyes. Hey, Angel. Mason cupped his cheek. 
Let me see those big brown eyes. There you are. Did we win? Hell yeah, we did. Mason brought him closer, his body shaking with a relieved cry. It's over. Raiden's soul returned to his body next, and when he awoke, he was attacked by Nico, then pulled in for a hug by Titan. And the first words out of his mouth, Man, I'd kill for some pizza. Fuck, I love you, Titan said with a light laugh. Tears shone in his cyan eyes as he kissed the side of Raiden's black hat. Don't ever leave me again. We'll try not to. Keo touched the goldstone, telling Castor he was an idiot and that he better get his red-headed ass out of the sword or else he'd sell his Lycan Hypersport, an ultra-rare sports car that was the avatar of Greed's most prized possession. A shimmering gold cloud flowed into Castor's chest before he groaned and sluggishly sat up. Why you gotta hurt my feelings, little dragon? Keo pounced on him, his earlier composure crumbling now that his mate had returned. He cried against Castor's neck. Phoenix materialized beside Nightfall and brushed his fingers over the royal blue stone. His black tail lay motionless in the snow behind him. Everyone's looking at me. I hate it. But what I hate more is that you're a goddamn gemstone right now. I see your body, but I don't feel you, Bell. Your scent is gone. A tear landed on the stone. Please come back to me so I can kick your ass for leaving me in the first place. Bellamy's soul lifted from the stone and returned to his body. Before his eyes even opened, Phoenix leapt on top of him, tucking his face between Bellamy's neck and shoulder. His tail curled around Bellamy's leg. I hate you so much, Phoenix mumbled against his neck. Yeah, Bellamy rasped, running a hand up and down his spine. I know. Only two souls remained, one black and one purple. I ran out of patience. I couldn't hold back anymore. I walked over and knelt beside the sword, my vision blurring as the purple stone pulsed beneath my fingers. You made me a promise, Pride, I said. You promised you'd break this spell so we could bind our souls, so we could become whole. Brighter, the stone glowed. You wouldn't go back on your word, would you? A heavy sigh sounded from behind me. Uriel. I had momentarily forgotten that the Archangel still needed to discuss the issue of me accepting Alistair as a mate after being ordered to refuse him. They could decide to uphold their former ruling and forbid me once again. That didn't matter. Loving Alistair was worth possible damnation. If they decided to cast me out later on, so be it. I wasn't giving up on him, now or ever. But although the stone reacted to my voice, nothing happened. I kept talking to him, but got the same result. Why isn't it working? Raiden asked, his voice scratchy. Heaviness pressed down on my chest. I caressed the stone. I know you enjoy testing my patience, Alistair, but now's not the time. The purple stone continued to pulse, growing brighter, then dimming again. Fear bubbled up and churned in my chest. His soul isn't responding to me like the others did with their mates. Is it because we didn't complete the mating ritual? Connor appeared across from me, head tilting, as if he was listening. He hears you. A tear slipped free. Then why won't he return to me? Callius, Galen said, arms still around Simon. When we were inside the sword, we could speak to each other. Al must know he's still trapped. Raphael frowned. His mate is already dead, yes? Then you may not be able to retrieve his soul. Alistair must have realized this, and he refused to leave Callius behind. The bottom dropped out of my stomach. There must be something we can do. The life Alistair wanted was so close, one free of war, one where we could be happy. No one spoke for several moments. There's one thing we can try, Uriel said. Well, I can try. None of you are capable. I focused on him through watery eyes. You, of all people, would help? I struck a deal with the cursed sons, he responded with a slight snarl. Kill Lucifer and they would be granted eternal happiness. My own personal views aside, a debt is owed. 
and I despise being in anyone's debt. Salafiel smirked at him. Are you going to do what I think you are? If so, tonight's certainly the time to do it. Do what? I asked. Explaining it to you would burn through too much time, Uriel answered before unfurling his white and gold wings. I'll return shortly. In the meantime, keep trying to coax out Alistair's soul. We have a very short window for this to work. Chapter 25 Alistair It was a strange sensation to be aware of my surroundings, but unable to see, touch, or smell. I had sensed each of my brothers escape the stones and return to their mates. Knowing they'd finally get their happily ever afters was a relief. But not all of them would. Why are you still here? Callius asked. I couldn't see him, but I felt his presence. Once my soul had merged with nightfall, the telepathic link with my brothers had reformed. Yet, now their threads had been snipped, falling away as each of them left. Only one link remained. Because you are, I responded. I heard Lazarus beckoning to me from some place I couldn't see. Your mate calls to you. Go to him. God's how I wanted to. Even without a corporal form, the desire to be with Lazarus created a deep, gnawing ache. I felt it all over. Come with me. I cannot. I've tried. Just as I'd expected. Our love for Callius was powerful, but only the soul connection to his mate could give him the strength to break the spell. Then I'll stay beside you, I said. Even if it meant I'd never return to the one who owned my heart. Alistair, you were alone in the realm of the lost for so long, Callius. I refuse to allow that to happen again. From that distant place, I heard Lazarus's voice again. I wasn't sure how, but I knew he was crying. Could my heart still break if it no longer beat? Hell, I no longer even had a chest for it to beat in, but I felt Lazarus's pain. I missed him, which was a peculiar concept, seeing as to how I hovered in a non-physical realm of existence. No body... Only thoughts. Alistair? I'm here, I told him. A long pause followed. I feel myself slipping away. That must be what happened. A soul held on to awareness once separated from the body, but after a while, that consciousness began to fade. The longer we stayed trapped, the more we'd forget. How long until we forgot everything? Callius felt he was slipping away. As seconds passed, I did too. Or at least I thought it was seconds. It could have been hours or days. Everything started to fade. Darkness closed in. You promised me! Lazarus yelled from that distant place. I snapped back to awareness. Please, Al, Callius said. Whether I'm here or out there, my mate is gone. However, yours cries out for you now. Go to him. Do it for me. As much as I tried to fight it, because I hated the thought of my brother being alone again, the longing for Lazarus was too intense. I belonged with him. I love you, Cal. And I love you. Until we meet again, brother. The next thing I knew, I was staring up at a winter night sky. Something cold landed on my cheeks. Snow. It fell in large flakes, drifting, spiraling toward the ground below. Crisp air filled my lungs as I inhaled. Thank the gods. Lazarus gathered me in his arms. Gasping cries left him. You had me so worried, you stubborn, foolish boy. I kept my promise. I breathed in his sweet yet taut scent of apples. The cracks in my soul mended. Yes, you did. He combed his fingers through the back of my hair, pressing kisses to my temple, edge of my brow, nose, and finally, my lips. Connor appeared on my other side, resting his hand on my shoulder. It's good to see you again, old friend. You too, ancient one. He scoffed, but softness remained in his purple eyes. That word is forbidden. He squeezed my arm before withdrawing his hand. The next time you decide to be a hero, allow me to thump you upside the head instead. I have many acquaintances in this life, but very few I consider friends. 
You're someone dear to me that I cannot lose. I'll keep that in mind, I said, moved by his words. I felt exactly the same about him. The reunion was bittersweet. Nightfall lay in the snow a few feet away, all stones in the hilt clear, except for one. Callius. My throat squeezed. He can't find his way out. A shrill sound came from above us, like something whistling through the air and hurling toward the earth. In less than a second, that whistle turned into a thunderous boom as Uriel landed in the snow. Someone was with him. No fucking way, Casta said as the two of them approached. Is that? Yep, Raiden grinned. I don't know how, but that's totally him. Who? Nico shuffled up from the snow and squinted at them. Oh, damn, he's hot. The brown-haired male looked just as he did all those years ago, tall, bronzed skin, and with a muscled body shaped from long days of hard training beneath the Grecian sun. Alasis, I whispered in disbelief. Cal's mate. The Spartan wasn't phased by the dead bodies scattered across the clearing. He'd seen much worse in his lifetime. His focus solely rested on nightfall. He took a knee beside it and ran a hand along the shadows circling the dark blade. Kellius, he said with a tremble in his voice. He touched the black stone in the hilt. The battle has ended, my warrior. Come home to me. I blinked back tears. After thousands of years, they would finally be reunited. Black mist lifted from the stone before flowing into Callius's body. He didn't open his eyes, but his chin shook a bit. Our mind link had returned, and with that connection, his emotional state was opened to me. He was afraid. Afraid he'd open his eyes and realize it had all been a dream, that he hadn't heard his mate's voice. Alasis knelt beside him. Open your eyes, my warrior. Callius obeyed, and right as he looked at Alasis, a choking sob left his lips. He lunged upward and threw his arms around him. Are you really here? I am. Alasis lowered his face to Callius' shoulder, forehead crumpling. He was fighting hard to hold back tears. I never stopped waiting for you. Callius took his mate's face in his palms and kissed him, a whimper rumbling in his throat. As they embraced, that dark cloud that always hung over my brother's head cleared. Alasis was his light that chased away the storm. I could live a million years and never know a moment happier than this one, Callius said, before kissing him again. My heart, my soul, my everything, it all belongs to you, Alasis. And I will cherish all of it, Alasis responded, until the end of our days. How? I asked Uriel. I wanted to ask him why, too, but held it back. He'd shown an unexpected kindness to us. Better not push our luck. Each archangel oversees certain areas of the celestial realm, he explained. I preside over the souls in the afterlife. It's why my opinion holds more weight over who is allowed through the gates. Under normal circumstances, I would have the ability to retrieve a soul, but not restore a corporal body. However, tonight is special. Because of the black moon? He nodded. Not just any black moon, but one that hovers between two different years. The energy is much like that from All Hollows Eve that allowed Callius' body to be restored along with his soul. More powerful, even. My gaze returned to my brother. He looked so damn happy it made my heart leap into my throat. Alasis chose this? Yes, Uriel answered. I gave him the choice. He needed no time to decide. His answer was instantaneous. Anything to be reunited with his mate. Thank you, I told him. Disgust clouded his expression. I didn't do this to earn your thanks, Nephilim. A debt was owed. I paid it. Consider us even. Admit it, Yuri, Raphael said, sliding his arms around Uriel. You have a soft spot for these boys. You're just too proud to say it. I despise them a little less now than I did prior to the battle, yet I still find them repulsive. Uriel stepped away from the other archangel and looked at Lazarus. Much needs to be discussed, but I will give you time to recover from the battle. 
I expect you in the council's chambers in three days' time. I'll be there, Lazarus responded. See to it that you are. Uriel turned his back to us and shot up into the sky without another word. Raphael waved at us before flying after him. Salafiel politely nodded before leaving as well. With Lazarus's help, I stood up, swaying a little. I was still trying to process being back in my body. He allowed me to lean on him, though, just as he always did. My pillar of strength. Oliver stepped forward. What are your orders, Commander? Lazarus straightened up a bit, going into commander mode. Those who fell in battle deserve to be honored. He glanced at Connor, then at Bane, who had reverted to human form. All of them. Angels, dragons, vampires, and wolves. Gather the dead and build them burial pyres. Yes, sir. Oliver turned and was stopped by Daichi. The earth dragon had scrapes and a few cuts, but stood strong. I'll help you. The soft smile that bloomed on Oliver's face rang of his unspoken affection, and he wouldn't speak of it. Doing so would potentially tear apart a loving family, so he buried those feelings as best as he could. I'd appreciate that. The two then left together. Other angels joined them. Bane and his pack helped too. Pyres were built, and bodies were placed on top. As they were torched and the flames rose into the sky, I silently prayed that all would find peace in the afterlife, even those who'd fought against us. I stepped over to Lucifer, my throat suddenly tight as I crouched down. Carefully, I removed the swords that still protruded from his body and smoothed down his long black hair, wiped the blood from his mouth. With his eyes closed, he could have been sleeping, but I sensed no life from him. His skin was ice cold, just like the bed of snow he lay upon. Is it wrong for me to grieve him? I asked, my voice like broken glass. No. Lazarus knelt beside me. Despite his wickedness, we both loved him once. It's that version of him we grieve. Where do angels' souls go after death? I remembered Lucifer's last words. My father's name had been on his lips. Paradise in the celestial realm, he answered. Though fallen angels are sent to Sheol in the underworld, a realm for the dead. Is that where Lucifer went? I imagine so. I hated the burning in the backs of my eyes. I don't want to shed tears for him, Lazarus. My memories of him were built on lies. He never cared for me. I was a weapon to him. He used and manipulated me. So why do I feel so... A small cry left me before I stifled it. Lazarus rested his hand on the back of my head, patting it once. He then pulled me to him as another cry left me. Let it out, he murmured softly. You've been strong for so long. Grieving doesn't make you any less of a warrior. That made me cry harder. Once I had nothing more to give, I stayed against him, letting his scent soothe me, like it always did. I believe you're wrong about one thing, he said. Yeah? I wiped at my eyes and cleared my throat. And what might that be? His light blue eyes lingered on Lucifer. A part of him did love you. He had several opportunities to kill you during this war, but he spared you instead. Some might wager it was due to his hope you'd join his side and become the commander of his army like he'd seen in a vision. But I believe it's because all those moments that you grieve right now were real to him, too. I let his words sink in. Somehow they made me feel better. Can we build him a pyre? I sensed them then, my brothers. Galen and Callius dropped to one knee beside me and lifted Lucifer onto their shoulders. Castor squeezed my arm and offered me a thin smile. Damon, Bellamy, and Raiden were there too. Gray grabbed my hand. They then walked with me toward a pyre they'd already built. My vision blurred again. Stupid emotions. I couldn't get mine under control. After they set Lucifer on top, I positioned his hands on his stomach and draped a cloak over him. 
I took several deep breaths before nodding to Phoenix. He stepped forward and touched the pyre, setting it on fire. As the flames spread across the wood and reached the cloak, I watched him burn. None of my brothers left my side. We didn't speak, but we didn't need to. I felt their love. They were letting me grieve, letting me be vulnerable, holding me up. I wasn't sure how much time had passed before I finally turned from the pyre. In the distance, the sky appeared lighter. We had lived to see another day. Our friends, too. Serena held Clara as they paid respect to fallen Nephilim from our army. Baxter and Nader stood speaking with King Tatsuya and Prince Victor. Even with the fighting behind us, I suspected more than alliances had formed. Friendships had, too. This is where I bid you good morning, Connor said. Dawn is approaching. My coffin awaits. I clasped his forearm. Thank you for fighting beside me. Always, Connor smiled, flashing his fangs. Remember we have a tea date soon. Don't be late. I won't. I returned his smile. But I expect cranberry scones. Of course. I'd say you more than earned them even if crumpets are better. Connor winked at me before nodding to Lazarus and flitting away. There one moment and gone the next. What do we do now? I asked. You need sleep. Lazarus pressed his lips to my forehead. You can barely keep your eyes open. The last 24 hours were certainly catching up to me, and for the first time in so long, I felt like I'd finally be able to properly rest. The promise of better days waited on the horizon. The war was over. Lucifer's reign of terror had come to a close. For good this time. I looked at my brothers. Though tired, they all hailed their mates. Smiling, free from the burden of war. Where life would take us next, I wasn't sure. But I couldn't wait to find out. As dawn broke across the sky... I pressed against Lazarus's side. Let's go home. Chapter 26 Lazarus Sunlight spilled across the rose gold roof of the gazebo as I strolled through the palace gardens. Paste, really. The council was currently discussing my relationship with Alistair. I had been told to wait for their decision. I hated waiting. Expelling a breath, I stopped beside a water basin that had been carved from stone. Crystal clear water trickled through it, intended to add to the tranquility, but somehow missed the mark. My nerves were wound too tight. Stop your fretting, a deep voice came from my left. Michael walked toward me wearing a blue chitin. He shared my aversion to any clothing worn above the waist, but when there were council matters to attend to, he dressed the part. Your wings will not be darkened this day. Here. What is it? I asked, as I accepted the wrapped bundle from him. Many apple pies, he answered. Made with apples from the winter orchard. Raphael had them prepared especially for you. They're adorable, are they not? I unwrapped them, revealing three small pies with perfectly golden and flaky puff pastry filled with diced apples and covered in cinnamon. Mouth-watering spices tickled my nose. A mighty warrior such as yourself using the word adorable to describe them is adorable. Michael smiled. I like to find enjoyment even in the smallest things in life. There is always some new discovery to make. Something new to fall in love with. Food, music, smartphones. These things help soothe my mind when it tries to get the best of me. It seems you found enjoyment in my pies on your way over, I said eyeing the light dusting of crumbs at the corner of his lips. Consider it my payment for my impeccable delivery services. His expression turned a bit more serious. Two were opposed to your faded mate bond with Alistair. Oh, I can only wonder who one of them was. Uriel actually sided with you this time, Michael countered. I believe seeing the cursed sons sacrifice themselves changed his mindset, if only a little. He now sees that they aren't their fathers. It'll take more time for him to come around, but I have faith he will. Eventually. 
I kept my gaze on the pastry. So I'm no longer forbidden from loving Alistair? He lightly bumped my arm. Rid yourself of these nerves, my friend. All is well. You and Pride are free to move forward with the mating ceremony. Has the date been set? We were waiting for the council's decision before setting one. Then I suggest you return to him and discuss it. His smile returned. Arrangements must be made. Decorations, the menu, and of course, you need proper attire. As do I, if I'm going to be... What do the humans call it? Your best man? I faced him. Actually, if you'd be so inclined, I'd like you to officiate. Both the wedding and the ritual to bind our souls. My face heated. Was I overstepping by asking him? But only if you... His big hand landed on my shoulder. Say nothing more. I would be honored to. Thank you, my friend. I quite enjoy hearing you call me that. Michael glided his fingers through the top of the water in the basin. Not long ago, you still viewed me as your superior. I still do. Always will. I smiled at the bundle in my hand. Yet, if loving Alistair has taught me anything, it's that we must tell those we care about how we feel. Sooner rather than later. Even those of us with immortal lives can waste so many years by not doing so. Speaking of wasted years, Michael's chestnut eyes shifted back to me. I spoke to the council about Mephistopheles. And? Uriel was opposed to lifting his banishment. However, given how his information led us to victory, Uriel was outvoted. Michael snickered at that. Gods, the sneer on his face will make me laugh for days to come. So Mephis will be allowed to leave the realm of the lost. I wasn't quite sure how I felt about it. The fallen angel had helped us, but it had been for his own selfish reasons. Yet, his loneliness had been palpable. No one deserved his fate. And all those years ago, he had allowed me to stash Callius' soul in his realm, proving there was good still inside him. On a trial basis, Michael answered. One day a month, he will be permitted to leave the realm and go wherever he pleases. He must continue his duties as guardian of the realm in the meantime. If this goes well, he will be granted more freedoms. Eventually, I believe his banishment will be fully lifted. Trust must first be earned. Understandable. I bit into one of the pies. It tasted even better than it smelled. Spices burst on my tongue, and the perfect pastry flaked on my lips. Mmm, like paradise in my mouth. These must be served at the wedding. Michael laughed. I'll see to it that your wish is granted. I popped the rest of the pie into my mouth and silently chewed, mulling everything over in my head. Have you reached a decision about Belphegor? He'll remain in the celestial prison for the foreseeable future, he answered. He begs for death, which is precisely why the council decided to let him rot in a cell instead. What of Aza's sentence? Ah, Aza Morningstar. Michael softly sighed. Nightfall has been placed in the celestial vault and heavily warded, so he is without his soul weapon and unable to call it back to him. The council sees little reason to keep him imprisoned, considering he's powerless. My scalp pricked. You're setting him free. With monitoring, of course, Michael nodded. He played a huge role in our victory. Without his aid, we would have lost the war. I weighed the scales of justice and decided he's earned another chance. But one wrong move, and I will clip his head from his shoulders. Vepa and Pura are still out there, I said. What if they find him once he's free? He shook his head. Without his powers, Aza is no use to them. But Dargan and his scouts will keep an eye on the situation. The boys still have their sins, I then said. I thought defeating Lucifer might rid them of the curse. Michael pondered my words. Mephis theorized that their sins are soul weapons. And a soul weapon cannot be destroyed unless the soul it inhabits passes on, I said with a nod. The boys are still powerful, which means should another war arise they may be called upon to help. The thought caused a deep ache in my chest. 
Alistair wanted a simple, peaceful life, away from fighting. No, Michael responded. They've served the realms well. If there's another war, the Celestial Army will deal with it. You have my word. His word was all I needed to know it was true. I felt much lighter as I left the Celestial Realm. The Council's decision no longer hung over my head. I could breathe again. As I returned to the island, there were no warriors training in the fields. There was no sense of urgency. The tension and anticipation of war had been dispelled. The peaceful, light-hearted atmosphere was a welcomed change. Families strolled through the streets near the harbor, visiting cafes and shopping. A female Nephilim child was learning to fly for the first time. She squealed in delight as she hovered a foot off the grass, her tiny black wings flapping. I recognized her father as one of the warriors who'd fought beside us in Echo Bay. The end of the war had allowed for more beginnings. First flying lessons, first love, but it had also brought goodbyes. Prince Victor and his army had returned to the Ice Dragon Kingdom. King Tatsuya and his force had left earlier that day for their island in Japan near Ishigaki. Serena's warriors had traveled back to the Caribbean, but she had stayed behind with Clara for the time being. The two females were currently trying to decide where they'd call home. The witch longed for her mansion in Echo Bay, while the Nephilim commander had trouble leaving her warriors. A resolution would surface, though. Their bond was too strong for it not to. What was the council's ruling? Alistair asked telepathically. Our mind link had resurfaced not long after we'd left Echo Bay following the battle. That connection with him was important to me. Having temporarily lost it had been crushing. I'll tell you when I see you. Tell me now, he said. And before I could respond, he added, Yeah, yeah, you don't take orders from me. Shut it. I chuckled. Are you at Raiden's? Yes. He insisted on throwing a welcome home party for Alassus that is also an end-of-war celebration feast. So, in other words, I hope you're hungry. Another chuckle. It was strange. Laughing came so easily. The weight that had lifted from my shoulders had also seemed to lighten my heart. I hadn't known it was possible to feel so free. Laughter spilled out from the open windows of the white stone house as I walked up the porch steps. Another bout of booming laughter hit me as I stepped through the door. The brothers were telling Alas's stories from over the years. The Spartan was coping with the modern world much like Callius had. Curious about everything, but also uneasy about it as well. He sat on the couch, body tensed. When Callius slid an arm across his stomach and whispered in his ear, he softly smiled, that tension slightly easing. Uh-oh, Gray said once spotting me. He was lying across Simon's and Mason's laps on the other couch. Look at his face. Think it's good news or bad? I can't tell. He always looks grumpy. Alistair approached me with a tentative expression. So? What's the verdict? I pulled him into my arms and planted a kiss on his lips right in front of everyone. Bellamy catcalled. Castor told us to get a room. The spontaneous kiss took Alistair off guard. But seeing him had made my heart skip a beat. Relief, joy, and love had then flooded my core. So much I felt like I'd burst at the seams. You're smiling. Alistair said, brushing his thumb over the corner of my lips. Does this mean what I think it does? They decided in our favor. I rested my hand on his nape, loving the feathery soft tickle of his blonde hair as my fingers slid through it. Alistair didn't react at first. He only stared at me, his blue eyes unreadable. But then, he slammed his mouth to mine and kissed me so hard my toes curled in my boots. Hell yeah! Raiden came through the back door, holding a tray with grilled chicken and vegetable kebabs. So, this is a welcome back, Alassus. Yay, the war is over. Congrats on your engagement party. Damn, I need to make more food. Baby, we have enough food. Titan took the tray from him. Go sit and visit with your brothers. I'll finish up outside. Meat sizzled on the grill, the aroma coming through the open patio door. Pork chops and steaks rubbed in Titan's special seasoning that was a combination of salt, pepper, and Mediterranean spices. Nothing got past Raiden's impeccable sense of smell, though. He guessed every ingredient in it after one whiff. Clara and Serena arrived not long after I did. I brought lemon bars, 
Clara said, placing a container on the kitchen counter. She smelled different. Holy shit, girl. Bellamy picked her up and spun her around. Someone got marked. About time, Phoenix muttered before taking a drink of ambrosia-laced whiskey. His gaze lingered on Bellamy's backside. I feel you eye-fucking me, Nix. Bellamy smirked at him as he set Clara back down. So what? That key around your neck says I'm allowed to eye-fuck you whenever I want. Bellamy walked over to where Phoenix stood against the wall and rested his arms on either side of his head. He lowered his face to Phoenix's collar. And this collar says I can throw you over my shoulder and fuck you like there's no tomorrow. Oh, please do. Phoenix nipped at his jaw. Don't be gentle about it either. I want the whole island to hear me screaming. Damon curled his nose. Can you two just not? You have no room to talk, D. Bellamy said. You and Warren fucked so hard earlier it shook the walls of the villa. Warren smiled, said nothing. Back to the matter of that mark. Bellamy looked at Clara. How's it feel? I don't kiss and tell. Clara's bite mark rested above her collarbone. She had braided her hair to the side to cover it, but even if it was invisible, every supernatural being in her proximity would know it was there. But if you must know, I kinda, sorta, really love it a lot. Gray pounced on Clara. Does this mean y'all will bind your life forces too? I don't want you getting old or getting sick. I want you to stay with us forever. Ah, oh, my precious boy. Clara hugged him tight. Let's take this one step at a time. The boys truly loved the witch. She loved them too. Serena watched as Raiden, then Castor, swarmed Clara. They pestered her, and she swatted at them. Take care of her, Alistair said. A note of warning colored his voice, like a protective big brother. I will, Serena answered. With the war behind us, I intend to take time to focus only on her. She deserves the world, and I will stop at nothing to give it to her. Will you be staying in Echo Bay? he asked. Serena nodded. In my absence, I've entrusted my army to Lysandra her second in command. For as long as I can remember, I've lived and breathed the life of a warrior. Clara made me want more. I knew the feeling. Alistair's hand slid into mine. He knew the feeling too. Both of us had dedicated our lives to warfare. It was time we focused on each other. I can't wait to bind myself to you, he said softly, shifting those pretty blue eyes to me. Our minds must have been in the same place. You don't think you'll get cold feet? Keeping hold of his hand, I spun him in toward my body. I've heard I can be cold and bossy. Grumpy, too. He arched a pale brow. Oh, you're definitely those things. Add stubborn to the list while you're at it, but... He brought my knuckles to his cheek. You're also warm, affectionate, and loyal. Even when you closed yourself off from me, you watched over me. I will always watch over you. I know. Alistair swallowed hard. He touched my chest as a frown creased his brow. You will not be shirtless during our wedding. I will put you in a suit if it's the last thing I do. When I laughed, his answering smile set off tiny explosions in my chest, in my heart. I'll wear a suit under one condition. Go on, he said suspicious, amused too. Warmth radiated from his eyes. My hand slid to his jaw, and I leaned in, pressing my mouth to his ear. If you strip me out of it after. He groaned under his breath. I think that can be arranged, but we should practice first. Lots and lots of practice. We'll have to wait until after the welcome back end of war engagement feast. He breathed out a laugh. We'll take dessert to go. I gripped his waist. The only dessert I need is you. Unless apples are involved. Alistair locked his fingers behind my neck. I'm curious. About what? Where we'll live once we're fully mated. He glanced at his brothers. Damon and Warren will return to their cottage... Galen and Simon plan to buy a house in Echo Bay near the sea. 
Castor and Kia were invited to live at the Water Dragon Palace. Raiden and Titan have a home here. Callius and Alassus asked Baxter if they could stay here too. Gray and Mason will stay at Ravenwood with Clara, temporarily for now. Bellamy and Phoenix plan to travel the world together until they find a place to settle down. He looked back at me. What about us? I've considered this. I traced the edge of his mouth. And I'd love if you lived with me. His eyes widened. In the celestial realm? Is that even allowed? I nodded. Uriel has already lifted the ban on your souls entering the gates, so you living with me won't be breaking any laws, especially now that the Council has given their blessing over our union. But I understand if you're opposed to the idea. We can find somewhere in this realm if you'd prefer. I only want you to... I'm not used to you nervously rambling. It's pretty damn precious. Alistair held my face, and joy shone in his eyes. That joy hit me in the heart. My home is with you, wherever that may be. Mine was with him, too. String lights wrapped around the trunks of the trees in the courtyard outside Baxter's villa. The soft glow was inviting as guests trickled in and found their seats. Alistair had shot down the idea of a beach wedding. Castor and Raiden both had weddings on the beach, and he had snarled at possibly being the third of his brothers to do it. I smiled at the memory as I stood near the fountain. Anticipation swirled in my stomach as more guests arrived. Baxter played at being host, chatting everyone up, specifically the attractive males in attendance. Dargan and Oliver nodded to me as they took their seats. Nervous? Michael asked. He wore a navy blue suit that emphasized his broad shoulders and complemented his large frame. No tie. He had tried to wear one, but had ripped it off in less than two seconds. Not even a little. I rolled my shoulders. But this suit is too tight. It's not too tight, he said with a grin. It fits you perfectly. You're just being a whiner. Like you with your tie. That tie was out to kill me. Michael smoothed a hand down the front of his suit. I killed it first. The altar beside us held a silver goblet and a bottle of special wine that had been infused with binding magic. That magic would be activated once Michael gave the blessing. Alistair and I would then speak our vows and each take a drink. The second part of the ritual would occur privately after the reception, where we'd need to join our bodies to complete the binding. Inhale. Exhale. The ceremony will begin shortly, my friend. Michael said. Your eagerness is cute. Please don't use that word to describe me. Cute as a little lamb. I gave him an unamused stare. Connor approached me. He had arrived as soon as the sun set, one of Alistair's reasons for wanting an evening ceremony. His best friend could tolerate the sun, but only in limited doses. He's ready. And just wait until you see him. I did an excellent job dressing him. The sudden influx of flutters in my stomach made me wonder if I was nervous. Nice to see you again, Michael told him. You as well. Connor's gaze trailed his body. You clean up nice, but I must say, I prefer you without a shirt. Michael's eyes darkened as a slow smile touched his lips. The funny thing about clothes is, they can come off. How intriguing. The vampire's purple eyes glowed a little before he turned away and sat beside Baxter, who wasted no time at all before flirting with him, too. Something you wish to tell me about you and Connor? I asked Michael. There's nothing to tell. But, given his expression, I wondered if he wished there was. A mystery to be solved another day. Because the ceremony was starting. All the brothers had been with Alistair for the better part of the afternoon helping him get ready and probably pampering him a little too. But he deserved to be spoiled. He had helped plan and officiated each of their weddings, fitting they would show him such love and support for his own. He had wanted them and their mates to be part of the ceremony too. Each would walk down the aisle. A small music ensemble had been set up beside the flower beds. Evening primrose was in full bloom behind them as the first note of the cello rang out. Gray and Mason appeared first. Gray grinned from ear to ear as he was led down the aisle and to the front row. Next came Castor and Keo, then Raiden and Titan. 
The boys and their mates had coordinated their outfits. Each of the mates had a handkerchief in the chest pocket of their suit that matched the color of the boys' sins. Callius and Alassus walked out and took their seats before Damon and Warren. The ice dragon slowly twirled Damon as they reached their seats and pressed a kiss into his hair. As if to one-up them, when Bellamy and Phoenix reached the end of the aisle, Bellamy dipped the demon and kissed him. Damon rolled his eyes and muttered, Show off. Once they sat, Damon elbowed Bellamy in the ribs. They're delightful, aren't they? Michael asked. Such vibrant personalities. After all the brothers had taken their seats, the song changed, the melody slowing. My breath caught as I laid eyes on Alistair. He wore three-piece all-champagne tux that fit his slim frame to perfection. The shawl lapel and subtle floral design exuded elegance, which was only suitable for him. His silvery blonde hair had been trimmed on the sides, with the longer top swept back. Clara walked him down the aisle, and though it was subtle, I saw him squeeze her arm as all focus moved to him. He was nervous, too. And then our eyes met. I expected that day to be the happiest one of my life. What I didn't expect was to get so emotional. My throat squeezed and I teared up. As he walked toward me, neither of us looked away. You're so beautiful, I projected into his head. Don't make me cry, he responded. Walk faster. I need you in my arms. A smile bloomed across his handsome face. So impatient. Impatient? My heart thrummed faster. I've been waiting for you for thousands of years. As they reached us, Clara placed Alistair's hand on top of mine. The skin-to-skin -skin contact awoke more flutters in my stomach. Michael greeted everyone and welcomed them to the wedding, but his words soon faded. I was too captivated by the stunning male across from me. With pride, Alistair had rarely been in short supply of confidence, but as we stood in front of our friends and acquaintances, he trembled a bit. Are you sure this is what you want? I asked, using our special connection. More than anything, came Alistair's response. That's why I'm nervous. I'm terrified I'll wake up and learn this was only a dream, that Lucifer was never defeated, and you and I mean nothing to each other. You've always meant something to me. His blue eyes misted over. We had chosen our wedding bands together, simple white gold bands, but each had two round cut stones, a diamond and an amethyst, to represent both of us. We slid the rings on each other's fingers to conclude the marriage part of the ceremony. Now, it was time for the binding. Tonight, two souls will become one, Michael continued, grabbing the silver goblet and filling it with wine. Lazarus, a commander of angels whose loyalty and friendship I've been honored to have, and Alistair, a warrior Nephilim who helped save not only this realm, but all the realms. No one deserves happiness more than these two honorable males. They have given much to this world, and this evening they finally take something for themselves, each other. The spell to trigger the binding magic in the wine dated back to ancient Greece. It was more of a blessing than a spell. The words rolled off Michael's tongue, speaking of the splendor of fated mates and the power such a bond held. Separate, they live half-lives. Together, they become whole. My soul craved that unity with Alistair. The closer we drew to reaching it, the more eager I became. Ansi. Speak your vows in front of these witnesses, Michael said, presenting the goblet. And then... Drink to seal that oath. He smirked at Alistair. I presume pride will insist on going first. Castor snorted from the front row. Alistair shot his brother a glare before taking the wine. The dark liquid swirled, and though it was faint, magical energy hummed from the goblet. He focused on me, and my heart banged against my ribs. Excitement tangled with anticipation. I've deeply contemplated what I'd say to you tonight, Alistair started. A bold declaration of my love seems too theatrical, but a simple I love you will never be enough. Truth is, I hated you when we first met. That hate eventually turned to respect. Your training was tough, but made me strong. And your guiding hand since then 
has allowed me to lead my brothers and hold my head high. Without you, Laz, I wouldn't be the man I am today. You showed me what it was like to be truly loved and to love someone in return. In front of all of these witnesses, I swear to remain by your side as husbands, as mates, until the end of our days. He took a drink. Would it be improper to kiss him now? I asked, brushing my finger against his as I grabbed the goblet. A wave of chuckles rippled through the crowd. Vows first, then kissing, Michael said. You impatient angel. Alistair grinned. I know I'm a temptation like no other, but do try to restrain yourself until after you confess your undying love. Normally, this is where I'd say I don't take orders from you, pride. I grabbed his hand, holding the wine in my other. With our gazes locked, I then dropped to one knee in front of him. He sucked in a small breath. But tonight, I kneel before you and offer you everything I am. Our path has not been easy. Obstacles kept us apart for so many years. But I believe that only made the love we feel now stronger. I give you my life. I give you my heart. For it has never belonged to anyone but you. I vow to love and honor you for the rest of our days and to hold you up in moments where you need strength. Lean on me, and I will never let you fall. I bowed my head to him before lifting it again and taking a drink. Come here, Alistair said, dragging me to my feet. He closed the space between our bodies and grabbed me by the nape. With these vows made, you can now... Alistair didn't wait for Michael to finish before capturing my lips. Whimpers rumbled in his throat. The guests applauded, and hoots and hollows came from his brothers on the first row. The kiss broke as he smiled, and the tenderness of that smile caused me to pull him back in for another. I know what you two will be doing later, Bellamy said, waggling his eyebrows. Playing checkers? Raiden grinned as Titan snorted. Yeah, you're right. They'll play chess. That's more sophisticated and shit. Damn it, Raiden, Alistair mumbled briefly closing his eyes. Hey, you'll love me once you taste your cake, he said, standing from his chair and pulling Titan up with him. Guess the flavor. It's Earl Grey and lemon, Grey exclaimed. With notes of honey, Raiden added. So, am I your favorite brother right now? It's okay if you don't want to admit it out loud. You can just confirm telepathically. Alistair laughed. The haughty sound of it was so light and free from the restraint he normally carried. It caused his brothers to stare at him in stunned silence before breaking out into big smiles. I pulled him into my arms. I love your laugh. He rested his head on mine. Well, I'm happy. More than I ever thought I could be. You deserve it, Galen said, patting his shoulder before placing a hand on Simon's back and guiding him away. See you inside, Raiden told us before leaving with Titan. Nico ran up to them and started talking ninety to nothing. Titan put an arm around the boy's neck and tugged him in to ruffle his hair. Hey, stop! Nico wiggled around. Someone help! I'm being abused! My blood heated and a gnawing ache radiated through my chest. The binding magic was taking effect. I felt so close to Alistair, but even with my arms snug around him, I couldn't get him close enough. Only one thing would help that ache completing the ritual. I rested my mouth at his ear. Think anyone will notice if we skip our own wedding reception? Alistair chuckled. It was shaky. Let's at least grace them with our presence. We look too damn good. Very well. We'll make an appearance and then sneak away to the hut. Bungalow. He skimmed his lips along my jaw. And then I'll strip you out of this suit and ride you until you scream my name. Or until you scream mine. Challenge accepted, he said with a smile. Hand in hand, we walked down the aisle and toured the reception area. Decorative lanterns lit the path, the warm glow of them soothing. Not as soothing as his scent, though. Sweet cedar and a musk that was unique only to him. Moonlight brought out the silvery tint of his pale blonde hair, and when he smiled over at me, the edges of his eyes crinkled. A pang went through my heart and I held his hand a bit tighter. One day, we'd both look back on this moment 
and know it was the start of an amazing life together. Epilogue Alistair Four months later A steaming cup of tea made for an excellent start to any morning, but so did being woken from sleep by a ridiculously sexy angel kissing your neck. Good morning. I wrapped my arms around him as he settled between my legs, our cocks pressed together, his rock hard and mine certainly rising to the occasion. His warm skin smelled amazing as I pressed my face to his shoulder. Good morning. Lazarus dropped more kisses to my neck and rolled his hips forward. Any suggestions on how we should start the day? I can think of a few things. I ran my fingers over the slits in his shoulder blades. He softly groaned as I eased them inside. Life in the celestial realm had been awkward at first. Since my brothers and I defeated Lucifer, we were seen as heroes among the angels. Not all of them knew how to behave around me. However, there had been no animosity like I'd expected, and after a few weeks, that awkwardness had lessened. Uriel avoided me like the plague, but in the rare instances we came across each other, he merely snarled and walked away. As for living with Lazarus, well, that morning was a good example. Our days had been filled with making love and deepening our connection, learning more about each other. He had built me a library and helped me stock it with copies of all the books I'd lost in the fire. Some evenings, he would sit with me as I read, and sometimes he'd ask me to read aloud to him while he held me. It was those moments that felt the most intimate, special. He still commanded a force of angels. However, now that we were no longer at war, he had more time to spend at home. What time are we meeting your brothers? He asked. Three o'clock? Mmm. Lazarus gave my cock a slow pull. Plenty of time for me to worship every inch of you then. I cracked a smile and arched into his palm. I like the sound of that. Every Sunday, my brothers and our mates came together to visit and eat dinner. Sometimes it took place at Raiden and Titan's house. Other times we went to Clara's. The location didn't matter as long as we were all together. We might have had our own lives now, but we always made time for each other. Lazarus kissed down my chest, swirled his tongue across my navel, and took my cock into his mouth. He took his time prepping me and smiled around my cock as I wiggled my hips, seeking more than the two fingers he was giving me. Soon, though, he ended my torture and crawled back up my body. He took me gently at first. Our lips softly met as he started a slow rhythm with his hips. He linked our fingers, and the feel of his wedding band set off fireworks in my chest. Four months married to him, and I still had trouble believing it. That he was mine that after everything we'd been through, we had ended up there, together and happy. I love you, he said, lips parting as he stared down at me. I love you too. I moved my hand along his collarbone and touched the bottom of the scar on his shoulder. He lowered his face and kissed my scar that matched his. More than anything in all the realms. Lazarus slid his arms beneath me and rolled to his back, placing me on top. Ride me. Giving me orders? I braced a hand on his chest and took him deeper inside me. No, he said, his eyelids at half-mast. His fingertips dug into my hips. I'm giving you control. What will you do with it? And then I showed him. Everyone sat around the table as rain tapped against the window panes of Ravenwood Mansion. Winter was making way for spring, but in Echo Bay, if it wasn't snowing, it was raining. I didn't mind. It certainly didn't dampen the mood as we dug into the chili and sweet cornbread Raiden had cooked. How are things up in the celestial realm? Galen asked me. Get into any fights? Oh yeah, Casta said. Like popping Uriel in the mouth? If so, please recount it in detail. No, there have been no fights. Lazarus smirked. Unless you count the times he tried to boss me around, and I reminded him of who's in charge. I scoffed. Says the one who was at my mercy this morning. Or have you forgotten? Aww. Bellamy draped his arm across the back of Phoenix's chair. Still in the honeymoon phase, I see. Sex every morning, afternoon, and night. 
Gray crinkled his nose. Gross. Clara snapped a finger at him. Hey, you have no room to talk, little mister. You've attacked your husband on every surface of this house. Gotta mark my territory, Gray said with a grin. Mark it somewhere else. Mason coughed into his fist. The poor guy's cheeks were bright red. Stop embarrassing your mate, I told Gray. He responded by sticking out his tongue at me. Some things never changed, but I didn't want them to. The war had taken so much from all of us. I was glad to see it hadn't taken his playful spirit. I looked at Callius. He sat close to Alassus, softly smiling as he fed his mate a piece of cornbread. I never thought I'd see a day where he smiled so much, where he was so happy. The two of them had moved into the bungalow Lazarus had stayed in on the island. Baxter called me every so often and had said Alassus started training with the bladesmith, making weapons instead of using them. Callius now worked at the coffee shop. An interesting thought of my warrior of a brother making lattes, but he enjoyed it. It helped calm his mind, much like cooking did for Raiden. So? Damon cleared his throat and shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Warren, I have news. Warren instantly broke out into a smile and took Damon's hand on top of the table. We're pregnant, Damon said, blushing a little. Our surrogate told us the news yesterday morning, Warren said, his smile the biggest I'd ever seen. Katya and I will be parents to a baby girl or boy. I care not the gender. I only wish the baby to be healthy and strong. Damon looked at his mate, and a wave of elation came from him. His happiness was palpable. Congrats! Gray leapt up and pounced on Damon, then did the same to Warren. Can I name the baby? Pete for a boy, Petra if it's a girl. Warren nodded. I like the name Petra. No, Damon said, because I know why he chose that name. Mason balked out a laugh. Get your cute ass back over here, Angel. They're not naming their child after Dino Pete. Gray pouted at him. By Bellamy's small smile, it was clear he'd already known. Damon had probably called him right after he and Warren received the good news. I'm so goddamn happy for you, Dee. You're gonna be a great dad. And I get to be the awesome uncle who spoils them rotten. Phoenix rested his head on Bellamy's shoulder. You holding a baby might be the thing that kills my black heart. I'll officially be one of the good guys. The sweetness will be too much. One day I knew they'd start a family too. For now, they were enjoying traveling the world. Sorry I'm late, Penamuel said, rushing through the archway and into the dining room. His brown hair needed to be combed and his glasses were askew. I barely made my deadline. I submitted it and came running. He and Clara had become close in the time they'd lived together before we'd gone to the island. So she had invited him back to live with her. No prob, Raiden said, before hopping up and making him a bowl of chili. He placed a large piece of cornbread on top. Thank you, Penemuel nodded to him before diving in. Lazarus watched him. Be nice, I said telepathically. Lazarus liked the fallen angel more now than he had months ago, but I wouldn't call them friends. Yet, anyway. Perhaps with time, that would change. I am being nice. His eyes shifted to me. I'm just not going to tell him about the sauce on his cheek. I rested my hand on his thigh, and he placed his on top, sliding our fingers together. Something interesting came into the shop today, Simon said after dabbing at his mouth. Oh no, Casta groaned. If you say it's some antique ring that gives off a scary aura, place that fucker back where you found it and throw the box in the sea. Galen chuckled. It's not a ring, Simon said, pushing his glasses back up his nose. It's a violin. Boring. Gray brought his legs up in his chair and leaned against Mason. Well, I'm interested, I said. Thought you would be, Simon smiled. It's older, but with some TLC, I think it could be beautiful. It's yours if you want it. The gesture touched me. With the wall and everything that followed, getting married, moving to another realm and settling into a life outside of the one I'd always known, I had forgotten my love for the instrument. Thank you, Simon. For dessert, Titan brought out a platter of peanut butter cookies as well as apple turnovers. Damon brewed coffee and Callius helped him fill mugs and hand them out. 
Castor brought out a deck of cards for a game of poker. My heart felt so full as I watched my brothers. They were smiling, laughing. Most importantly, they were all together, safe, healthy. Lazarus leaned over and ghosted his lips over my ear. Are you happy? I faced him and gently squeezed his hand. Yes, very much so. Good. His eyes softened. So am I. Surrounded by those I loved, enjoying a peaceful, simple life, it was all I'd ever wanted. The storm had cleared. The war was over. But this amazing life was only beginning. This has been Alistair, Sons of the Fallen, Book 7, written by Jacqueline Osborne. Performed by Nick J. Russo. Copyright 2022-2023 by Jacqueline Osborne. Production copyright by Jacqueline Osborne. Thanks for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.